All right, welcome to uh, Tampa City Council. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order. If we could have roll call, please. Okay. Carlson. Here. Hertek. Clindenin. Here. Henderson. Present. Vieira. Miranda. Here. Maniscalco. Here. We have a fiscal quorum. All right, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to extend my condolences to the family of Sandy Marshall, who uh, worked for many years here in our clerk's office, uh, on the passing of her husband, William Clifford Marshall, who passed away a few months ago, but on Monday, June 12, 2023, from 11 a.m. to 12 at Hillsborough Memorial Funeral Home on West Brandon Boulevard, they're going to have be uh, they're going to be having a memorial service from 12 to 1 p.m. followed by a committal service up in Bushnell at the Florida National Cemetery. So I want to extend my condolences to Sandy, who was with us for many many years, and uh, also acknowledge our code enforcement department because we have Code Enforcement Officers Week, which is June 5th through the 9th, and we want to uh, extend our appreciation for all the work that they do throughout the community. I know many of you are familiar with them. And, uh, and how responsive they are and what they do uh, day in and day out. So wanted to bring those few items up. All right, uh, we have a very busy agenda tonight. I'd like a motion to uh, open all the public hearings so from move. 1 to 15. We have a motion from Councilman Miranda, second from Councilmember Henderson. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, any opposed? Um, I believe we only have one continuance request on the agenda, uh, but we're going to take item number one uh, first, which is a uh, presentation briefly by um, by city staff. Huh? No, 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 that's only the one. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. And I believe you have a PowerPoint, correct? I do. All right. Just wait for the PowerPoint to come up. All right, go ahead. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, Council, or good evening, Council, at this point. Um, in an effort for transparency, we continue to come before you as we talk about our federal and state dollars. Um, and so we're in the middle of our action plan where we start to plan out what we are going to do for the upcoming year for fiscal 24 with all of our federal funds. As we move to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the purpose of our action plan, what our funding year looks like for FY20, um, FY24, I'm sorry, the priorities that we have. Uh, we're also in our analysis to impediments uh, for fair housing, and then talk about what the public input process will be. So our annual action plan, it is required for us to submit this um, every year to the federal government just to talk about what we plan to do with our funds. Last year we came before you with our five-year plan, which is kind of the overall umbrella, and then every year we come back before you and say what we're going to do for the upcoming year. So this year we had activities such as our CDBG, which is our Community Development Block Grant, our home our HIV uh, population, which is housing opportunities for persons with AIDS and HIV, as well as our ESG, which is our Emergency Solutions Grant, which is very specific to those who are homeless. So just going a little bit deeper into the different funding sources, uh, our CDBG, which is um, all of these are entitlement grants that we receive. Our CDBG allows us to really uh, increase suitable living environment as well as any public services. Um, economic opportunities, and those are specific for those who are low and moderate income households. This is what we utilize to help to fund our housing counseling agencies, various public uh, facility projects, as well as any public services in the community. Um, our ESG, which is our emergency solutions grant, that is specific, again, for those who are homeless. Uh, the city only gets about $275,000 annually to cover uh, specific uh, homeless activities. So we'll go through a little bit why we then um, leverage other federal and local and state funds to try to help uh, with the homeless issue. This year we were awarded ESG rush funds, um, which was rapid unsheltered survivor housing funds. Uh, we received CARES funds in 2021 um, for homeless services. We were able to fully expend the 3.8 million and as a, as a result, we were then considered for this ESG rush funds. 
Uh, it was $800,000 that we received. Um, it's very similar to ESG. This one does allow us to pay up to 24 months of rental assistance for individuals, whereas uh, the other one does go up to about six months. Um, agencies have a little bit of leniency with the ESG rush as there's no match requirement for this as other homeless programs. We do require a dollar to dollar match. Um, the city of Tempe is quite unique uh, in receiving the housing opportunity for persons with AIDS and HIV funding. We oversee it for four surrounding counties, Hillsborough, Pasco, um, Hernando, and Pinellas. And so we get about a, a bit over $5 million, about $5.4 million to then distribute funds for support services and housing specific for those who have HIV and AIDS. Um, for anybody who's infected or affected by it, meaning that their child could be the infected person and the family still qualify. And then the last one that we'll touch on is our home investment partnership. Um, I mentioned that we get about $275,000 uh, that are specific for homelessness. Under our home funds, we get about $3 million, so we've allocated annually about $600,000 every year um, to do voucher assistance for those who are homeless. So we always go through a survey process and really look at what the priority needs are. We know that we're in a housing crisis, and so as such, we want to make sure that we're looking at what we're doing with the funds and being good stewards of the funds. Um, so we know that home funding can be used for acquisition, for improvements, um, relocation, and so we've definitely added some of that language into the um, action plan. So whereas before, you will, we might only put out for one specific program, we still add other eligible activities in the case that something could come up. Uh, supportive housing programs where we not only want to make sure that we put someone in housing, but add in transportation such as bus passes, having food, um, vouchers, and so just making sure that we do have some support services, as well as public service assistance, and those are programs that we end up funding. Currently we fund, um, an example would be seniors in service for their senior companionship program, and so we're able to help to give a stipend to um, keep some of those programs going. So this is what our allocation looks like this year for both federal and state. Um, whereas the action plan is all federal, we like to put the state fund in there just so you can see what we're leveraging. Uh, CDBG is about 3.1, home is 1.9, Hopwa being about 5.2 million, ESG 279, and our ship allocation is 4.6. Um, we, this is an increase from what we got last year. Hopwa and SHIP uh, were an increase of a little bit over $1.5 million. HUD has put out a new rule um, for fair housing just to make sure that as we're doing all these programs, we're looking at what fair housing looks like, addressing policies, practices, and programs, and any activities that would restrict fair housing and access into the community. When we go out and we do our audit and monitoring of these agencies, one of the things that we like to look for are fair housing posters, making sure that they have um, the information. We're also, uh, our Office of Human Rights is going out to the different subrecipients to make sure that not only do the clients know what their fair housing rights are, but also agencies should know what it is that um, they are doing and not violating so that people can have access to fair housing. So we provide, we continue to provide discussion in classes and in any outreach we can for those affected um, protected classes that we serve. So this is a calendar before you. Um, we released our RFA earlier this year, April 3rd. Um, we had an increase in applications that we received. We received a total of 33 applications this year. We did technical assistance workshop so that we can be out. We understand that we're under the cone of silence, but we do the two technical assistance workshop to allow um, the different subrecipients to ask questions. If they don't understand what a regulation means or what we're looking for, that's the time where we go out, we say uh, and explain what the program is, what the guidelines are, and what the expectations would be. Um, we did allow them to also submit questions in writing. And once they submitted those questions in writing, we uh, responded to everybody who <coughs> attended the RFA. We also posted those questions on the website in case someone did not show up to the technical assistance workshop. We then had proposals, review, and recommendation where we had sub subject matter experts come in and review the applications. And we are here before you today for the first public hearing. Um, we will come back on June 22nd um, with the second public hearing to open up the comment, the public comment period for 30 days, where we'll then identify the specific agencies and at what amount they'll be funded.
This is just, uh, while well, I understand it's hard to see this, but this is just a brief um, of what it looked like on our website. We had the information open on our website. We accepted applications on a software, neighborly software, where appli um, applicants actually got an additional uh, one week to submit applications when we realized we had an influx in applications. We wanted to uh, give everyone a fair time. The citizen participation, um, we after, once the public comment period opens for the 30 days, we do public meetings. We go out in the community and do surveys to allow different citizens to kind of give us some feedback as what they're looking for. We're looking at low and moderate income persons. We're looking at minorities, non-English speaking persons, persons with disability and public housing residents. And so we uh, work with some of our nonprofits and our subrecipients and making sure that they can get this survey out. This helps us to build our programs for the upcoming year and what we look at for the action plan as we continue to build new programs. The feedback then goes into our action plan. Um, this also allows us to put it on our website and be fully transparent with the funds that we receive. Um, they are told what the eligible activities are, but we certainly want to make sure that the priorities are being met as we move forward in, in that. On the public survey, the priorities we identify, we break it down into providing housing, creating um, suitable living environments, creating economic opportunities. Um, and we have the survey both in English and in Spanish so that individuals can um, respond. If someone asks us to translate, we also have services that we would then translate it into a different language. And I'm open for any questions. Any questions or comments? I see none. Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on item number one? I see no one, and we don't have anybody registered. Do we need a motion to uh, close yeah. this public hearing? So move. All right. Motion from Councilman Moran. Second. Second from Councilman Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. If you are going to speak on items 2 through 15, uh, please stand up, raise your right hand, and the clerk will swear you in. Mr. Hussein, would you like to go through the agenda to see if there's any uh, continuances, discrepancies, anything? Go yes, ahead, sir. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. There is uh, one item uh, having a request for continuance. That's case number three, case REZ 22 108. That's for 2309 South Cameron Avenue. Uh, they're requesting continuous to July 20th, 2023. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions? If not, uh, go ahead. If we have the applicant uh, who wishes to address item number three. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Steve Michelini representing the Young family. Uh, with me is Mr. Mike McNabb, and uh, he'll speak for the Homeowner Association, but we're responding to their request for a continuance, and I believe that July 20th, is an acceptable date. We respectfully request that continuance. Thank you very much. Mr. McNabb? Uh, Michael McNabb. I'm the, uh, we're here representing Palmasia West Neighborhood Association. I've been speaking to Mr. Michelini, and he has a, a possible proposal on this property, which we uh, would like to run past our board. So we're in favor of the continuance, and I, I thank you for that consideration. All right, we have a request for continuance. Is there anybody in the public, anybody else that wishes to speak on item number three? I see no one, and we don't have anyone registered. May I have a motion to continue item number three so to July 20th, 2023 at 5.01 p.m.? Yes, Mr. Shelby. And uh, for, for the sake of fulfilling the, our obligations, we also now have to state the location. We will be at 315 as Kennedy Boulevard, Tampa, Florida, third floor, Tampa City Hall, old Tampa City Hall. Thank you, sir. There you go. Yes, sir. Are, you, are there any rules that we're supposed to warn people about about possible future continuances and whether that's possible <coughs> excuse me what do you mean if you could explain Did, didn't we have a limit on the number of continuances and mm. and so it is if that's true do we do we warn people when they continue the first well, time? A question about this um, I, for the mm. clerk I see it's a continued public hearing but do you, are you familiar? This with applicant that? knows what the rules are. I'm just. I know, I, I'm just, I just but I'm just curious to know to, to note if the agenda notes 
normally when it's a continued public hearing, it states when it's continued from. I don't necessarily see that on the agenda. Madam Clerk, are you familiar with this? I don't know what the continued from. Mr. Chairman, you can inquire of Mr. Michelini how many times this has been continued. Is this the first continuance request? It was continued once before for medical reasons. Okay. Um, and then when we stipulated the discussion for that, um, the original request, and again, we were prepared to go forward. However, we, in the middle of our discussions with the homeowner association, we had some just dialogue that I think was very positive on both sides, and we were exploring those opportunities which we could not fulfill before tonight. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, number three. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, actually it does say it, and uh, I apologize, and uh, thank you for bringing it to my attention, but it does say on your agenda um, for future reference of City Council, when it says continued public hearing, if you see the words that are subsequent to that, it tells you from one particular date and another particular date, in, if it's a, a multiple times, and with number three, this is a continued public hearing from April 13th of 2023. Right. Thank you. Do I have a motion to continue this to July 20th, 2023? Motion from Councilman Vieira, second from Councilmember Clendenin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Council. Thank you Thank very you. much. All right, we'll go back to item number two. <coughs> Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Agenda item number two, case REZ 22-65. <coughs> There's a request for rezone at the location 2304. Wait, Mr. Hussein, just a moment. Yes, Councilman. Um, yes, and I was actually out for another reason, but I was going to recuse myself from um, item number three. So I just want to say that I did, I mean, I left, I was gone, but I need to make sure that's in the record. And I, uh, I um, submitted a form to um, Mr. Shelby. Well, thank you. So then you were absent at vote. I was absent at the vote. And Madam Clerk, if you can refresh my recollection, did you relay that she was absent at vote for that continuance? Was, yes. Thank you. No then, then there is no need for you to okay. do that unless you. Uh, no, I just really wanted to make sure that I made that clear for the record. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, sir. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Agenda item number two, case REZ 22-65. There's a request for a rezoning at the location 2304 North Highland Avenue. Request a rezone from RM24 to PD residential single family attached. I'll now pass along to our planning commission. Phelan, Planning Commission staff. Um, this is REZ 2265. The subject site is located within the Central Tampa Planning District, the Tampa Heights Urban Village, and the Tampa Heights neighborhood. The closest transit stop is located within a quarter mile east on North Tampa Street. Robert C. Gardner Park is the closest recreational facility located directly east of the subject site, and the site is not within an evacuation zone. The scenario of the subject site, the site is here. Uh, this is the park mentioned earlier. And in the surrounding area, it's a mix of single family detached and attached and multifamily uses that surround the subject site. And right here is a technical school. The subject site is here is represented by the residential 35 designation, which allows for development of up to 35 units per acre. And the subject site is surrounded by the residential 35 district. And this is the, the park, which is represented by the ROS future land use. The proposed zoning is the third request in the immediate vicinity since 2001, since 2021. The parcel immediately adjacent to the south right here through REZ 2135, and the parcel immediately adjacent to the west of the subject site, which is here, through REZ 2227. The average density of this portion of North Highland Avenue on residentially zoned parcels south of West Francis Avenue, east of North Ola Avenue, and north of West Park Avenue is 6.23 dwelling units per acre. 
If approved, the subject site will have an overall density of 19 dwelling units per acre, which is consistent with the density anticipated under the Residential 35 Future Land Use Designation. The request supports many policies in the comprehensive plan as it relates to housing the city's population. The comprehensive plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized under land to ensure an adequate supply of housing is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future populations. The request is also consistent with the compact city form strategy, which encourages infill development with, within proximity to transit and employment services and directs the greatest share of growth to the urban villages. The comprehensive plan also encourages single family attached developments to be designed to include orientation of the front door to a neighborhood sidewalk or street. The proposed single family detached dwelling unit, number one, as indicated on the site plan, has direct access to North Highland Avenue. The single family attached dwelling units, two through four as indicated on the site plan, can access the front doors via sidewalk connection from North Highland Avenue. And finally, the vehicular access to units two through four is provided from an alley to the west, which is encouraged by the comprehensive plan. The proposed PD would allow for development that is comparable and compatible with the development pattern anticipated under the Residential 35 Future Land Use Designation. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? Nope. Yes, ma'am. Planning Commission. Yes, sir. Uh, as Andrew was saying, development coordination, I'll first go ahead and show the aerial view of the property. <coughs> as you see the property here outlined in red. Now, Council, this uh, address may look familiar. Uh, this application actually was presented before you on February 9th, 2023, earlier this year. Uh, the applicant needed to make additional changes to the site plan as requested by staff. Uh, and the applicant made these uh, changes, uh, and they were for natural resources, and this removed two waivers, a use-to-use buffer waiver and also a green space waiver. As I go to the aerial here, you'll see the property. To the north, south, and east, you'll have zoned RM24. These uh, consist of residential single-family attached and detached, and also you have Highland Park here, zoned RM24 to the east. To the west, you'll have a lot that's vacant at this time, zoned PD. To the, uh, to the north here, I'll zoom out just a little bit. To the north here, as you see where the location is, uh, you'll have North Highland running north and south. You'll have West Columbus and West Euclid Avenue uh, to the north. To the east, you'll have North Tampa Street and also Highland Park. And to the south, you'll have Armature Works. Um, and also a Blake High School to the south of that. I'll now show you the site plan provided by the applicant. The applicant is proposing this rezone to allow for the development of residential single-family detached and attached uses. The property uh, is located on North Highland Avenue. Subject, uh, subject site <coughs> contains a lot area of 9,255 square feet or 0.21 acres. The applicant is proposing four units here, three that are residential single-family attached, one, two, three, and one that is residential single-family detached, and that's unit one here. As you see, uh, the applicant has two uh, methods of access to the site. Uh, for units uh, two through four, two, three, and four, you have access from the alleyway to the north. And for access to unit one, you have that from North Highland Avenue right here. The maximum building height is 40 feet here. A total of nine parking spaces are required and the applicant is providing 14 parking spaces. I will now show the elevations provided by the applicant. For the residential single family detached, you have the east elevation, the south elevation, the west elevation, 
and the north elevation. For the residential single family attached, you'll have the north elevation, the south elevation, and the east and west elevation from the side. As I went out to the site, took pictures, I'll show you what I saw. This is the site as is with that residential single family home on it. To the north, you'll have uh, apartments as well as offices. To the east, you have Highland Park. To the south, we'll have a residential single family detached home. I'll show the site plan one more time. The applicant is requesting four waivers here, um, one for reduction in aisle width from 24 feet to 18 feet, uh, one for reduction from 350 square feet per unit of green space to 243. Uh, the third is to reduce the required eight foot VUA buffer to five feet to the west along the alley. And the fourth is to request to allow front doors for units two, three, and four to face a side yard property lines. Development coordination and compliance staff has reviewed the application and finds the request to be inconsistent with the land development code. And this is due to the um, findings from transportation and natural resources. Should it be the pleasure of city council to approve the application, the applicant must provide revisions to the revision sheet between first and second reading. I'm here for any questions. Any questions? Councilman Clendon. So what is the distance between the unit and the alley where the cars will enter? 18 feet, is that right? Um, 18 feet, yes, sir. And the width of the garages? Um, Can you scooch that up? 19. 19, 20, 30. 19. What's that third unit two? What does uh, it show what that is? 19 here. Um, Unit two doesn't show that one. Nineteen or twenty-three. One's nineteen. One's twenty-three. Tell you width of unit right. two. Oh, that's right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Okay, I see it. Nineteen feet. Is that this, is that standard width of a garage, and that's the opening of the garage door? Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan Scott, uh, Culpability. The uh, the width of the garage looks like they're going to do nineteen feet. The Standard width of like a garage door is like 16 feet typically. That's the, the power so bar basically. The, so that coming in from that alley, is that enough to navigate in and out of there with 18 feet to spare and not hang over into the alley if you were parked in the driveway? I mean, we found it inconsistent. It is a, a tricky turn. We'll let the applicant justify that request. You know, it's the spaces that are in the garage, they meet the back up. It's just really if there's a visitor in the, in the, in the parking space, Right there, he has a kind of a tight back out. Now, if you have like one car, they're showing like two cars parked there. It's trickier. I mean, if there's just one car parked there, he can swing out a little bit more. Yeah, so that's what I was. Yeah, that's that was my concern. I'm yeah, I did, they, these did urban you... environments kind of get like that, and it is uh, is uh, it is it is tight. You're correct. Okay. Thank you. Anybody Thank you. else? Next, yes. Thank you very much, sir. Thank All you. right, the applicant. Good evening, Council. Steve Michelini. I, I have been sworn. Um, this is a redevelopment project, and uh, it's it's uh, associated with the other two properties. 
uh, not by ownership, but by compatibility. And they, uh, they are all in the redevelopment stage. What we were trying to do with this particular project was to, uh, let me get the site plan up here. Was to provide a replacement visible a replacement home for the for the homeowner and that's unit one which would be single family residential and it would maintain the same access off of Highland that it currently has and in trying to utilize the alleys um, we were providing the access off of the alleys for the other units the two spaces that you were seeing there councilman uh, those are guest parking spaces, and we far exceed the requirement. Um, they are really there for just for demonstration purposes, um, but they can be reduced, I mean, to one in terms of the depiction on the site plan. I think the, you know, the important thing is that this land use designation is R35, and uh, which would allow seven units, and we're proposing four. It also utilizes the, uh, the ability for access for the alley for the other units that are back here. The, um, as I said, the, the, each of the surrounding property owners on the uh, south side, the north side, and to the west are all supporting this project. And we've heard nothing from anyone regarding objections regarding that. You have to, uh, to look at the Tampa Heights area as a, as a unique development area. It has a lot of different uh, solutions to, to, to providing housing. And um, we're providing, as I said, we're providing 14 spaces when nine are required. So, I mean, for depiction purposes, it's easy to remove uh, one of those so it's, it just shows one unit or one, one parking space. Um, as I said, the staff had pointed out that it abuts an office complex on the north and then other townhouse projects that are and single family with townhouses here and here. So it's not it's not a brand new concept for this for this area. With respect to uh, the land use code, we are we are far below that. You'd have to, according to the code, acknowledge that the proposed uh, uses is compatible with the surrounding area, and the staff report indicates that we are compatible allow for the integration of different land uses and densities. By combining a single family unit with a townhouse unit, we're, we're blending those types of uses and capacities. <clears throat> Acknowledge the changing needs and technologies. Um, we are doing that through, again, a unique combination of single family and townhouses. Encourage the flexibility uh, of different developments. This is a unique design and it uh, incorporates, as I said, uh, both the, the townhouse and the single family components. The other houses on the, the, the front on Highland um, are also single family and they have the same type of access that you see here. We're, as I said, we're providing 14 spaces uh, when we're required to have nine. We can easily depict one, one less along the alley. One of the issues that we face frequently, and you're going to hear this theme repeated, is that when you're asked to access off of the alleys and the alleys are not <coughs> wide enough and that they can't meet the technical standards from transportation, uh, we are constrained by trying to, to accommodate that. <coughs> they uh, promote desirable living and working conditions. This area is very easily accessible by both uh, normal transit as well as the uh, vehicular personal vehicles. <clears throat> Promote the architectural features and elements. This is consistent with everything around there. <coughs> We're not introducing something new. Promote the retention of existing building and stock. What we're trying to do is to replace uh, a 1940s home that is, the owner has outgrown the usefulness of that particular home and redevelop the site with a new property. We're also required to go through the request for waivers and why. 
the design and the proposed development is unique and therefore we need those waivers. Um, I think we've already suggested to you that by combining single family with townhouse <coughs> projects, there are unique conditions that require the waivers. We've tried to incorporate as much as we could in order to, to meet those waivers, uh, to meet the, the standards of the requirements. However, um, two buildings uh, that close and in proximity and utilizing the alleys, they constrain our ability to do that. The waiver is in harmony and the general intent and purposes of the chapter. Um, I think the chapter and the discussions and the policies that are stated in the city code as well as a comprehensive plan lead us toward providing more housing and more opportunities for housing. And we're trying to accomplish that in this case. Um, allowing the waivers will substantial justice will be done and considering the, both the public benefits intended and secured by this chapter. Uh, we are addressing that and I believe that we have as I said, we already have other projects in the immediate vicinity that have very similar depictions and very similar utilizations that you find here. Um, we have done uh, the best that we could do. We've responded to the staff comments. We've made adjustments and we have made uh, the changes to the site plan that were requested by staff. And we've tried to comply with all of the requirements of code. Um, the remaining waivers simply are necessary because of the dimensions that are provided by the lot and its proximity to the two alleys. If you look, you'll see we have uh, one alley that's a little bit narrower than the other um, and the 18 feet of a platted alley to the north is going to be the primary access. There are other townhouse projects that already access this alley further to the east, I'm sorry, to the west. I believe that we have met uh, the intent of the code. We have tried to make a, a, a project compatible with, with the needs of the city and the needs of the property owner. We respectfully request your approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Nope. I see no one. Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on item number two? Please come up and state your name. I believe you were all here and sworn in, so you'll have three minutes to speak. And then we have uh, four people registered online. Go ahead, sir. Please state your name. Yes, good afternoon, Council. My name is Slate Counts. I live at 324 West Park Avenue in Tampa Heights. Um, I sent a letter about four or five days outlining some of the reasons why I oppose this plan design. Um, I'm not going to read the letter for you today and go through all of those points. Um, suffice to say that I don't believe that the code was met. Um, I believe the property is coded for five to seven units, and you're being asked to approve three units and a detached home um, facing Highlands. If you've ever driven around Garland, Gardner Park, it's actually not called Highlands Park, it's called Gardner Park, um, then you'll notice how congested it is around the Sorales Group and the property beside it. I feel like this sets bad precedent in my neighborhood for other developers who want to ignore code and ask for waivers. I believe when this, pro when this uh, proposal came to you before, they were requesting six waivers. They've worked on their design and are now asking for four waivers. If the design met code, we wouldn't be here tonight. And I ask you to uh, not approve this request for waivers for this rezoning. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. All right, next speaker, please state your name. Good afternoon. Uh, Camila Soto, uh, 105 West Francis, and I have not been sworn. If you have not been sworn, please stand up, raise your right hand, and we'll swear you in. I saw some people coming in. If you wish to speak, please stand up. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Yes, sir. Good evening again, again council members. Uh, Camilo Soto, uh, I am an urban planner and an attorney by trade and vocation, here to speak as a concerned resident with respect to this proposed project. 
What Mr. McElhinney is describing as a unique opportunity um, is anything but. Um, if anything, looking at that site plan, you will see uh, a really, really a Frankenstein monstrosity. Um, around the single family detached uh, dwelling, um, there's a fence around it. The remainder of the property is taken up by the three attached dwellings. There is nothing in Tampa Heights that looks similar at all to this. What Mr. McElhinney described as an office unit to the north, Sorellis Group, which is actually a mixed use office and residential development. To the south, obviously, to the, to the south is the single family residential. To the west of this is a, a vacant uh, parcel that has no development. And to the east would be Robert Gardner Park. Um, none of the things that he's asking for, he is entitled to, or the applicant is entitled to. That's why he's here. And I do want to urge the council that this application was here uh, in February and asked to a con for a continuance as a result of neighborhood opposition. Instead of six waivers, uh, like the previous speaker indicated, he's got four. Uh, but he has still not spoken to one of the, the big stakeholders in the area, which is the Civic Association, in an effort to try and um, modify or win over the Civic Association's approval. Um, at the end of the day, uh, this is not something that he is entitled to by right. There is competent and substantial evidence in the record. The staff report indicates that based on um, natural resources and transportation, um, the application does not pass the, uh, is not supported by the land development code. Additionally, what he also indicates is unique, um, is unique because he's chosen to design it this way. Um, Again, if they decrease the square footage of the townhomes, they are able to get that 24-foot uh, driveway uh, as the code requires. Um, they are able to also get the um, vegetation and the tree planting as is required by the code. Again, this applicant is choosing to develop in this way. I want to urge the commission, the council, pardon me, to remember your thinking on another project that you all evaluated on uh, May 11th. And the analogy that was made by another speaker there is they're attempting to put 10 pounds of sand in a five pound bag. <laughs> Council was concerned with the amount of waivers that that project was requesting. And the only thing that I ask you all is to be intellectually consistent and decline approval of this application. There is competent and substantial evidence in the record to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please state your name. I am uh, William Dobbins. I live at 513 East Hugh Street. Um, I'm here as a board member of the Tampa Heights Civic Association. I'd just like to read our letter opposing. So the Tampa Heights Civic Association opposes the proposed rezoning of this property instead of proposing five apartments uh, condos or two townhomes with ADUs that would elegantly fit in a walkable layout on the site. The property owner is trying to shoehorn a single family detached home in the front and three townhomes facing the alley. The project does not meet city code and sets bad precedent for Tampa Heights. Prior to the continuance, the project required six waivers from code, yet the applicant has only been willing to make changes to reduce that to four waivers. The root problem that makes this project so far out of code in Tampa Heights' character is their insistence on the unit type choice. Putting a detached single family home and townhouses here doesn't work. They could in fact uh, get greater density with a different product choice. Council should not, oppose, should not approve a PD whose inconsistency with code is created by elective design choices and an insistence on a particular type of housing product. The Civic Association has tried for several months to have productive conversations with the applicant and consultants. They refuse to make any changes based on the neighborhood suggestions. Furthermore, they asked City Council to grant them continuance in February, uh, which the Civic Association was in support of. Based upon the request to work further with the community, they have not met with us since that time, and the board continues to oppose the rezoning. We oppose it on the following grounds. One, each of the requested waivers, and especially all of them together, are not justified and could be avoided with different design decisions. Two, this project does not meet the purpose of PD per section 27156 of city code. 
the PD should not be granted because the project does not encourage the land's maximal development potential. In fact, it is less dense than needed for Tampa's housing shortage. It does not take advantage of its unique access to alleyways on two sides, which would allow for a denser, more walkable, multifamily project that preserves green space. A PD can be used to place single family detached and single family attached homes on the same property, but only if that property can accommodate it reasonably with ENCODE. This design on this property does not accomplish that. Three, staff has repeatedly found the project inconsistent with city code. Despite having several additional months after the continuance, the project design was not substantially changed and the original six requested waivers were only reduced to four. Transportation, green space, and building access objections still remain among staff and the community. And four, in order for waiver to be granted under 27139, it must meet the criteria of 27136. This project does not maximize the preservation of green space nor encourage compatibility in overall site design and scale, both internal and external to the project site. Thank you very much. We respectfully ask for you uh, to oppose this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else in the room wishing to speak? If not, we go to three registered speakers. If we have them on, we have Chris, Jeremy, and Ray. Okay, if we can bring them on and uh, swear them in as they speak. <clears throat> Jeremy. They're coming in. If you could unmute yourself and raise your right hand, we're going to swear you in. Okay. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Good evening, City Council. My name is Jeremy Korch. I live at 208 East Park Avenue. Thank you for uh, hearing me this evening. Um, I think the rest of the residents uh, of Tampa Heights that have previously spoken, um, I am, you know, support all of the comments that they have made. Um, I do not support the proposed layout of this project with townhouses entirely access to the alley. Um, as has been repeatedly said, this does not meet city code. And while the city residents of Tampa Heights do support building density, it should be done to code and in a way that enhances the neighborhood instead of cramming Dickensian style alley houses into our neighborhood. Uh, if this is approved, it will open the door for further incompatible development within Tampa Heights. Council should not approve a PD where the property owner purchased a parcel knowing what could legally be built there and instead chooses to submit non-conforming plans at the expense of a neighborhood's aesthetic, assuming that you will rubber stamp those choices. And so for those reasons and the reasons elaborated in the Tampa Heights Civic Association's opposition, I respectfully request that the council deny this rezoning application. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. All right, next speaker. Chair, I have Mr. Ray Campbell on the line, but he needs to enable his video. All right, Mr. Campbell, if you could please turn your camera on. We need to see your face. I see you, sir. Uh, please raise your right hand. We're going to swear you in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, thank Go you. You may lower ahead. your hand. Go ahead. Please state your name. Yes, my name is Ray Campbell. I own property at 2210 North Highland Avenue. Uh, also past president of the uh, Tampa Height Civic Association. You know, I, I, I remember approaching the, uh, the property owner. I knocked on his door. And simply, and this was about, oh, maybe a year ago or so, perhaps not that long. And I remember simply asking him, um, would you help the Civic Association oppose another rezoning application? And you know what he told me? He said, no. 
I don't think so because I'm proposing a similar project in the future. I said, okay, thank you very much. Now, what this tells me is that he doesn't care about the neighborhood. He only cares about uh, his own well-being and what will benefit him. He doesn't care about the neighborhood. All that said, I respect the request that you oppose the rezoning of this application. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we should have a Chris Curry. Chair Chris Curry is not logged on at this time. All right. If there's no other public comment, that concludes public comment. Mr. Michelini, do you have a rebuttal? Um, Council, uh, it, it's, you know, I, I stand up here and, and we try to work with neighborhood associations frequently. We've been to this neighborhood association uh, before and presented this project. And on May the 3rd, I sent an email to then the president of the association requesting an opportunity to come and discuss exactly what these other gentlemen had suggested, which was to review the application to go through and, um, and see what we could adjust in order to meet their, their suggested uh, changes. So on May the 24th, we got a response back that said we don't need to meet. Um, so I, I don't know where to go with that, but you know, when we, we notified neighborhood associations about projects and instead of coming to us, I haven't seen the letter that, that the gentleman read into the record of opposition, but I, I think that there is certainly a moral obligation for them to share that um, so that we can address those issues in advance instead of airing them out in front of city council. Um, some of these waivers, we, we, we can't change. I mean, we cannot change the dimension of the alley. And we, we, um, we tried to make and provide as much green space as possible. We ended up with a deficiency there, uh, less than 100, about 100 square feet. But when you apply 350 square feet per unit anywhere in the city for a townhouse, you have difficulty meeting that requirement. Um, when you talk about the reducing the, the vehicular use buffer from eight feet to five feet, that's on the alley side, on the west side of the building. Who is that buffer serving? It, it, it's not serving some other adjacent property owner. It, it, it's in the code. It's required, but we have to seek a waiver for that. So when we come before you and we ask for consideration of accepting the waivers, it's not, you know, the things that we can meet, we meet. And the things that we can't meet, we simply can't. And talking about compatibility, this is, this is the property immediately to the south of the requested rezoning. And I would say that that's very similar to what's being proposed. Um, it has a driveway that this is right on Highland, immediately south of this property. This is at the corner of Massachusetts and Columbus. Two car garages, all of them facing the front. This is at Ola and Francis. Those are two car garages. I, I can't distinguish the design characteristics between what we're proposing and what would already exist in the neighborhood. And when they come up and they say it's not compatible, I would say that it is, it is compatible with the newer construction. Um, some of these properties you're not able to do as much as you would like. Uh, we reduced the number of units in order to stay below the Res 35 that was allowed. You know, the Planning Commission uh, it looks at these in terms of a broader scope and not the technical individual aspects. Um, the inconsistency we found from transportation is because the alley simply isn't wide enough. Um, so I don't know what we do about that. And that's why we come to you and ask you for some latitude. When we talk about the number of units, um, you could have seven units there. Well, with a bonus provision, you could have seven. 
you could have six. We're asking for one single family house and three townhouses. This is very similar to other projects that have been approved in the past. Um, we feel that it's consistent. We feel that we've met the spirit of the code. Uh, I went through the waiver criteria with you regarding what, you know, what we have to meet with respect to uh, being approved for, for the waivers. It, and it says, is the design unique and therefore needs the waivers? I would venture to say that it's unique. The waivers allowed to, would just interfere with anyone else. The, the France adjacent property owners are all supporting this. Um, I'm not sure exactly where these other addresses are from the people that spoke, but I've been told that they were over a block away. Allowing the waiver will result in substantial justice. Yes, until we look comprehensively at some of these codes um, and how they affect development, you're, you're not going to be able to address all of them individually. But we respectfully request your approval. Thank you very much. I'm available for any questions you any, might have. Any questions from council members? Is there a motion to close? Second. Motion to close from council member Hertek, Senator Council Member Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Um, council member Miranda, would you mind reading item number two? I'm sorry, yes, ma'am. Um, uh, I just want to have a couple of uh, comments and then I want to um, do a a pass, if that's okay. I'll make a motion. Yeah, maybe? to make yeah. the motion of. Um, uh, I respect that um, uh, that Mr. McElhinney showed some um, projects that are going on. The the big difference is they didn't have to come here because they didn't need waivers. They did. So, I'm sorry, but they, we're we're closed for this. So, um, those projects didn't need waivers. Um, and I tend to agree with the community that they don't fit. So I'm going to make a motion to deny. Um, I move to deny REZ 22-65 for the property located at 2304 North Highland Avenue due to the failure of the applicant to meet its burden of proof to provide competent and substantial evidence that the development as conditioned and shown on the site plan is consistent with the comprehensive plan and city code and the applicant's failure to meet its burden of proof with respect to the requested rate waivers. I also adopt the finding and reasoning of the city staff report. Um, while the proposed rezoning may be allowed for consideration under the RS-35 designation and the planning staff concluded the proposed density is consistent with the development pattern anticipated under this land use category, I find that the proposed rezoning coupled with the requested waivers result in a pattern of development that is not compatible with the surrounding area. Um, I, uh, as noted in the staff report, this, if this, um, let's see, I'm sorry. Um, as noted in the city staff report, uh, the, the failure to comply with section 27-139, subsection 4, um, as noted in the city staff report, if this application um, was approved, all existing structures are to be removed, which prevents, prevent, presents the developer with an opportunity to design the project so it comply, can comply with all natural resources requirements without the need for landscape waivers or any any other type of buffer waivers. So um, that's that's my motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Councilmember Clendenin, any discussion? Yeah, I'd like, I would like to discuss. Uh, Do you want to jump first? Councilman Clendenin, you want to say something, and then Councilman Vieira. Yeah. Um, Honestly, I think a lot of what we heard from the neighborhood is, 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 is spot on, and we could have used some of that testimony and justifications for denial. We are trying to put too much on too little. It is the, it is the sugar analogy. Um, you're building the, the reason why you haven't to have waivers for green space is because you're building too much on this piece of property, trying to retain the single family home along with the three townhomes. Um, you know, you could redevelop and redesign this. To, to provide more uh, ample space to be able to have egress into the drives and be able to have the green space. Um, and, and the good thing, you know, I know you guys love PDs, but at least, you know, the PDs, you get to come and we, we deal with them one at a time. So that's, you know, with this PD, we, ha we have this bite of the apple and regardless if, if somewhere, somewhere down the line, some council had approved a bad project, doesn't mean we have to continue to approve them. So um, 
I, I find it inconsistent with the, the development pattern of the neighborhood. I find it inconsistent with the types of goals we're looking at. I love the fact that they're trying to activate the alley. I, I fully support that, but they need to do it in a, in a better and smarter way and also provide the green space for the people that are there. Thank you. Councilman Vieira. Thank you very much. And I just want to explain my vote. I, um, you know, a lot of times on these kind of cases, I always talk about a stool. Right, and I always say if you want to have a, um, a denial or, or go the other way, you need to have legs on a stool to support it. I don't see that in this particular case. Uh, I always like to be consistent. That's something that's very important. I've had other things that come before me um, where there are no waivers, there is no deviation from planning commission, et cetera. On this one, I see the opposite, so I just don't see that stool uh, being supported. So I always just like to explain my vote, so I would uh, go with the motion. All right, we have a, anybody else, anybody else? We have a motion from Council Member Hertek, second from Council Member Clendenin. Let's do a roll call vote. Carlson? Yes. Hertek? Yes. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Maniscalco? No. All right, Mo thank you very much. Motion. Thank you, Council. Wait, excuse me. Clerk, motion to deny passes with Maniscalco voting no. All right. And again, Item. again, council, just a reminder, um, as I, as I do, um, uh, after there's a denial, just remember, please, there's a 30 day appeal period and allow for time after that. So if you have, uh, anybody who wishes to discuss this, please remind them that, uh, you've been advised against that during the appeal period. Thank you. All right. Item number four, go ahead, Mr. Hussein. Hussein Hussein development coordination agenda. Item number four case REZ. 22-126. This is for the location 4509 West North A Street. Proposed rezoning from RS50, residential single family 50, to RM18, residential multifamily 18. I'll now pass it along to our planning commission. Emily Phelan, Planning Commission staff. This is REZ 22-126. The subject site is located within the West Shore Planning District and the West Shore Palms neighborhood. The closest transit stop is, is located southwest at North Trash Street and West Kennedy Boulevard. Charles B. William Park is the closest recreational facility located 0.4 miles northeast of the subject site. And the site is located within evacuation zone A and the coastal high hazard area. Uh, the subject site is located here, aligned in purple. Um, as you can see from the aerial, um, it has a mostly residential characterization of single family detached, attached, and multifamily uses that surround the site both to the, the west, the east, and the north, and then along Kennedy Boulevard are the commercial uses. The subject site is here, outlined in purple, represented by the residential 20 designation, and to the north, south, east, and west of the subject site is the residential 20 designation as well. And then along Kennedy Boulevard is the UMU 60 designation. This portion of West North A Street between North Hesperity Street and North Trash Street has an existing average density of 9.08 units per acre, and that's based on 18 sites excluding the subject site. This is well below the maximum of 20 units per acre. Planning Commission staff has determined the rezoning is comparable and compatible to the development pattern along this portion of West North A Street. The rezoning will allow a better utilization of the land that is consistent with the density anticipated under the R20 designation. This designation encourages multifamily uses to provide a higher density where greater residential development is desired. The proposed rezoning is compatible with the underlying future land use designation and will not alter the character or development pattern of the surrounding neighborhood. The request supports many policies in the comprehensive plan as it relates to housing the city's population. The comprehensive plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure an adequate supply of housing is available to meet the needs of Tampa's growing population, both present and future. And the proposed RM18 zoning would allow for development that is comparable and compatible with the character of the surrounding uses and is consistent with the development pattern anticipated under the R20 designation. And this concludes my presentation. Any questions? All right, 
right, thank you very much, Mr. Hussein. Zain Hussein, first of all, I'll show the aerial view of the property. As you see, the property right here outlined in red. To the south, you'll have West Kennedy Boulevard. To the north, you'll have West Fig Street, West Gray Street. <coughs> to, the, um, to the west, you'll have North Trash Street. And to the east, you'll have North Hesperides Street. Uh, the site is surrounded to the north and also to the east by residential single family detached. To the west, you'll have uh, a PD, which is uh, townhomes. And to the south, you'll have retail along West Kennedy Boulevard. The subject site is approximately 0.17 acres in size. Um, you have uh, no waivers here being uh, Euclidean and no site plan required. As I went out to the site, I will show you what I saw. Now as you see the subject site as is. Uh, well, another showing of the site with public notice sign in front. To the south, you'll see uh, retail, David's Bridal there to the south on, along West Kennedy. To the east, You'll have residential single family detached along the east. And to the west, you'll have those townhomes. There's zone PD. Show the aerial view one more time. Development Review and Compliance staff has reviewed the application and finds the overall request to be consistent with the Land Development Code. I'm here for any questions. <coughs> the city finds it incon uh, inconsistent? Consistent. Consistent. Okay, Correct. I'm sorry. I Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the gentleman? Nope. All right. Applicant. Good evening, Council. Steve Michelini. I have been sworn. Um, this project is a request for Euclidean zoning, um, going to uh, requesting from RS-50 to RM-18. And as the staff has pointed out, the, uh, the area is undergoing redevelopment. There are a number of townhouses and apartments in the area. This area is um, just south of the interstate. And um, it, it comprises a mixed use of different different types of housing and development. There are no waivers that are allowed. Uh, this is a straight Euclidean zoning, and the staff, both the staff of the city and the planning commission, uh, found this to be consistent. It's consistent with a number of land use classifications. That's not me. Um, it supports the low and medium density residential dwellings that are being proposed. Uh, a maximum of four units could be developed on this site. And again, it will have to meet all the city codes. The surrounding area is characterized by a mid, uh, mix of single, uh, single family detached, single family attached, and commercial, as well as multifamily uses. It's consistent with the goals and objectives and policies of the Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Uh, it's also in your report. I would. Instead of reading, reading all of these, I'd request that that be received and filed and be made part of the record. Um, but it, it is consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the Tampa Comprehensive Plan, the land development regulations, the overall residential development <coughs> and redevelopment regulations, multifamily residential areas, low and medium density multifamily, um, and coastal. It meets the coastal high hazard. There's no net increase in development in that area. The staff analysis clearly states that it, this is uh, compatible and consistent uh, with the development pattern that's occurring there. I'd be happy to 
answer any questions you might have. Um, we respectfully request your approval. Any questions for the applicant? No? All right. Do we have Yes, ma'am. I move that we make the motion to approve this. No, no, no. That's we have same? public comment. Oh, we have public comment, comment on this? Yeah. Oh, I didn't. All right. Anybody else? No? All right. Is there anybody on the, uh, from the public that wishes to speak on item number four? Item number four. Nope. And we have nobody registered to speak. May I have a motion to close? We'll motion to close. We have a motion like from Councilmember Miranda, second from Councilmember Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Councilmember Miranda, would you yeah. mind reading item number four? Yes. I like moving a little faster. <laughs> Sorry. Item number four, file REZ 22-126. Ordinance being presented for first reading consideration. Ordinance rezoning property in general vicinity of 4509 West North A Street in the city of Tampa, Florida. More particularly, scribing section one from colonial classification RS50 residential single family to RM18 residential multifamily, providing an effective day. We have a motion from Councilmember Miranda, second from Councilmember Vieira. Uh, roll call. Okay. Hertek? Yes. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Meniscalco? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on July 13th, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. At Tampa City Hall, Old City Hall, third floor of Old City Hall in Tampa, Florida. Amen. <laughs> Thank United you. States, United States. Okay. Thank you, Council. Thank you very much. All right, item number five. Zane Hussein, item number five, <laughs> case REZ 23 04 for the location 8008 Inner Bay Boulevard, proposed rezoning from RS 50 to PD, plan development, residential, single family attached. I'll pass along to our planning commission. Thank you very much. Uh, Emily Phelan, Planning Commission staff. The subject site is located within the South Tampa Planning District in the Port Tampa City neighborhood. The closest transit stop is within 200 feet east of Inner Bay Boulevard at South Manhattan Avenue. Port Tampa Park is the closest recreational facility located 0.3 miles northwest of the subject site. And the site is located within evacuation zone A and the coastal high hazard area. The subject site is here outlined in purple. And um, the surrounding area is predominantly single family detached units with a few multifamily and single family attached units. Directly to the north of the subject site are single family attached units and single family detached units are to the south, east and west of the subject site. Can I continue? What happened? They're talking in the background. This is the correct property, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the adopted future land use map. The subject site is located here, and it does have a split future land use designation between the residential 20, which is the brown color, and the residential 10, which is the orange color. And you can see that the residential 20 is located to the north and south and uh, east of the subject site, and the residential 10 is located to the west. Single family attached units can be considered in the residential 20 designation and limited to the periphery of established single family neighborhoods in the R10 designation. Planning Commission staff finds single family attached uses appropriate on the portions of the site designated R10. The request will help maintain the stability of the surrounding area while expanding opportunities for housing choices in the Port Tampa City neighborhood. Planning Commission staff reviewed the application and determined that the request would have minimal adverse impacts to the surrounding area. The request proposes a total of 11 single family attached units. One unit is proposed within the residential 10 designation at an overall density of 6.6 .6 units per acre, and 10 units are proposed within the residential 20 designation at an overall density of 17.24 units per acre. Both of those are consistent with the densities anticipated under both the residential 10 and the residential 20 future land use designations. 
Entrances to all proposed units are oriented towards a sidewalk that connects to a proposed public sidewalk along Inner Bay, meeting the intent of the comprehensive plan policies. The request also supports many policies in the comprehensive plan as it relates to housing the city's population. The comprehensive plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure an adequate amount of housing supply is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future populations. The request would provide additional housing opportunities in the Port Tampa City neighborhood. The proposed PD would allow for a development that is comparable and compatible with the character of the surrounding uses and is consistent with the development pattern anticipated under the residential 10 and the residential 20 future land use designations. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? No. Mr. Hussein. Hussein Hussein, Development Coordination. I'll first go ahead and share the aerial view of the property. As you see the property right here outlined in red. To the uh, west, east, and south, you'll have residential single family. To the north, you'll have a PD, which is uh, townhomes to the north, as the uh, applicant is uh, proposing residential single family attached. Uh, this is along Inner Bay Boulevard. To the north, you have West Prescott Street. Uh, to the east, you have South Manhattan Avenue. And to the west, you'll have a um, South Trask Street, playing north and south there. I'll go, go ahead and show the site plan provided by the applicant. The proposed rezoning is to allow for 11 residential single family attached units on site. There are two buildings here, one and two. Uh, one is proposing six residential single family attached, and the other is proposing five residential single family attached. As you see, the access coming here from Inner Bay Boulevard to the north. The subject site contains a lot area of 32,500 square feet, or approximately. 0.75 acres in size. Uh, the site is currently vacant at this time. Parking. Uh, there's a requirement to have 25 parking spaces and the applicant is providing 26 parking spaces. Each, uh, each unit will have a two-car garage, as I will show you in elevations to come. Uh, the proposed height is 40 feet in height. I will now show you the Elevations provided by the applicant. As you see the, uh, the elevation to the west here. The elevation to the east. The elevation to the south and the elevation to the north. I will now show you the pictures I took on site. As I went up to the site, you'll see vacant land where the site is located. To the north, you'll have townhomes, zone PD. Along the stretch of the north, Vinner Bay, you'll have the townhomes continuing. To the west, residential single family and to the east 
still have residential single family. I'll show you the site plan one more time. The applicant is requesting three waivers, two waivers for natural resources. The first is for the use-to-use uh, -use landscape buffer. The second waiver is for the VUA green space. And the third waiver is to allow the front doors to face internal to the street, as you see uh, on the site plan. Development review and compliance staff has reviewed the ap application and finds the request to be inconsistent with the land development code. So it's a change from the, site, from the staff report, inconsistent to the land development code. And this is because of the natural resources findings uh, that uh, came up to being inconsistent. Should it be the pleasure of the applicant, or I'm sorry, should it be the pleasure of city council to approve the application, the applicant must provide revisions to the revision sheet between first and second reading. I'm here for any questions. Any questions, Councilwoman Hurtag. Thank you. Um, can you put the first picture that you had uh, when you went out to the site? Of course. That tree on the right, on the site plan, it looks like it's going away. Is that correct? No, two pages. Aaron, natural resources. You stop here, don't. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. Aaron, Mayor Development yeah. Coordination. Um, this is a this is a laurel oak, and I believe. Let me take a look at my notes. I believe it's a forty some odd. Forty four, according 40, to the site yeah, plan. Yeah, forty five inch laurel oak. Because of the species, and it does have a co-dominant trunk, which is not with included bark, long-term, I wouldn't propose preserving a lot of laurel oaks on site. Both of the trees actually are grand, um, and they are laurel oaks. But, and this is the other one I'll, sh I'll show you as well. Another tree with, you know, co-dominance here. Um, these trees are probably more than halfway through their lifespan. So I was in support with other removal, actually. Well, I was just curious, because looking at the site plan, the first one I talked about, looks like it's um, in what would be a stormwater pond. Yeah. So is there any harm in leaving the tree in a stormwater pond? I'm just curious. I mean, well, they typically would have to regrade the area. Okay. They have to dig down. OK. It's, you're going to be impacting a lot of the roots okay. if you're going to try to preserve it. Thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Thank you very much, Councilman Clendenin. So the, the, the building that's a north-south orientation with the what, 246 units, how does it, what, the property that's next to it to the east, how does that interface with that single family home? Uh, the, uh, the front doors as they face internal to the site, uh, the single family home, I'll show you the site plan one more time. And what's the setback there? As you see the site, uh, the front doors will face internal here, and the structure to the east will be facing uh, Inner Bay Boulevard. What, what's the setback from this property, from like the, where they're getting the property line for uh, the building? The, set so I couldn't uh, the see setback it. to the north will be 10 feet, and to the east will be 7 feet. 7 feet, okay. Correct. Okay. Anybody else? No? Okay. The applicant? Uh, Steve Michelini, I've been sworn uh, representing the owner. I, we, we have uh, we met with the homeowner association and we have revised the plan so some of those, uh, some of the waivers that are being requested uh, go away. Let me show you the new site plan. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, but if there's a change in the site plan, I've already confirmed with the staff that we can make the changes between first and second Okay, yeah, thank yeah, you. I, I, I went to that extent prior to coming here this evening. I wanted to make sure that we weren't going to request a continuance and then have to go back again. I was trying to avoid that. Um, anyway, we met with the Neighborhood Association. Um, 
and we've reduced the number of units requested from uh, 11 to 10, and we've increased the, um, the setback on the east side to 12 feet. And uh, pursuant to your question, Councilman, uh, if, if we, we can save that one tree with an island, but we'd have to do that at permitting and figure out how to, how, how to put a protective barrier around that. Um, the green space waiver goes away because we are now providing more green space. Six of the units face Interbay Boulevard, so we don't need the waiver on, um, on all of them. We need the waiver on four out of the ten. We, uh, we talked at length with the Neighborhood Association about stormwater retention and, and stormwater uh, being able to provide it sufficient stormwater. And I think that you all know this already, but I'll state it for the record that there is no waiver for stormwater. You must meet the code. It has to, you have to accept any stormwater that comes in from off-site. And in addition to that, you... Um, you must treat all of the stormwater on site. I, I did talk to transportation uh, about an upcoming improvement at Manhattan and uh, Interbay, and they're telling me that that is fully funded and will be coming forth in the 23-24 fiscal year. That, that project will also improve the area stormwater uh, treatment, including redesigning the ditches that occur on, on Interbay Boulevard and the inlets. Um, and I also tried to explain that the, the post condition of development here will be at least 100% better than the existing conditions. We were not allowed to flood or to impact any off-site properties. And uh, I, I was a little surprised that the reports that I was reading found that both the Planning Commission and city staff had found it consistent. But um, be that as it may, we have now changed that to the point where it should be, uh, it should be consistent at, at, at second reading, if we can get to the second reading. This is the site. This is the tree in the back that, uh, that you were talking about, one of them, but this is not the tree in the front. This is the properties directly across the street, which are the apartment buildings. This is the diagonal view from the site. This is a industrial uh, warehouse. These are the stormwater ditches. This is on the north side of Manhattan at Interbay. And um, this whole section, this whole intersection is gonna be reworked. This is another view looking northward toward the apartment buildings to the north side of the property. Um, I did drive around the neighborhood following our meeting, and I noted that the properties, the residential properties on the uh, east side that, that abut this particular property, um, they do have gutters and downspouts, but most of those downspouts are not connected to the underdrain system that they were intended and designed to, to treat stormwater. So um, we have also committed to the Neighborhood Association that we'd be continuing to work with the city on the stormwater treatment, not just for our site, but that if there's a, a stormwater <coughs> um, pipe or an inlet that needs to be relocated to adjust for their properties, that we would do that. So in the terms of the waivers, waivers one and two go away. Uh, the only waiver left is the front door for the four units and um, the buffer waiver. And I was going to show you on the site plan, the reason why we have to have the buffer <coughs> waiver is, is, because, is because of the hammerhead that was required by the fire department. And these, these are the minimum dimensions. Uh, we committed at the Neighborhood Association to try to talk to the fire marshal about modifying that dimension. Um, the neighbors had mentioned that we should try to flip the driveway and the fire marshal would not approve that. So the buffer waiver that you're seeing in there is here um, on this side on the west uh, and it's for the driveway, not for the building. With respect to compatibility, uh, 
let me go through this. The, the, the stormwater retention pond, let me get back to that for a second, is proposed to be a dry pond, so it'll be green and not a wet pond. There was some discussion with the neighbors about uh, mosquitoes and, and that kind of thing, so it's not designed to be holding water that would generate large numbers of mosquitoes or other create other environmental problems. Um, we have exceeded the, requ the requirement for parking, and typically what happens is that, you know, in other discussions that you've had before the council, there is insufficient parking, so we've provided additional visitor parking um, on the west side abutting the retention pond. With respect to 27136, the purpose, uh, the promote the efficient and sustainable use of lands, <clears throat> we as a PD, we're requesting that, that um, you find that consistent, as I said, immediately adjacent to us on the north, there are apartment buildings. Diagonally across the street is a warehouse and, and uh, commercial property, commercial slash industrial. Uh, within 200 feet is a fire station <coughs> on the same side of the street. Uh, and it allows for the integration of different land uses and densities. All of the densities that occur here are in the residential 20 district. Provide a procedure which would, <coughs> I'm sorry, acknowledge the changing needs uh, of the area. This is a low intensive development with 10 units and we are far below the allowable density. Encourage flexible and development which reduces transportation needs. We are at the corner, are uh, within 50 feet of the corner of Manhattan and Interbay, uh, and there's readily available other, other means of transportation. Promote and encourage development uh, where appropriate and the character is compatible with the surrounding areas. This is compatible. Uh, I don't think anyone has ever said that it wasn't compatible. Uh, what we talked about were the technical standards which we can't waive. <clears throat> promote the and more desirable living and working conditions. As I said, the, the, the townhouse apartment complex immediately to the north is, I don't know how many units are there, but it, but it is a very large project. With only 10 units to the south, this is minimal. Promote the architectural features, and this will be compatible with the area. Promote the retention and reuse of existing buildings. This, the site is vacant. <clears throat> Design that... Um, Proposed development is unique and therefore in need of waivers. The only reason we have the buffer waiver is because the fire marshal requires the driveway to be in the dimension that it's in. We have all of the other units um, facing inner bay, which is part of the requirement, and only four out of the ten require the waiver. The waiver is in harmony and serve the general purpose and intent of the chapter, and I believe that we have gone to extraordinary lengths to make sure that that happened. And to that point, I said, when following our meeting uh, with the neighbors, we tried to meet all of the different requests that they made with us. Uh, we were able to meet some of them, but not all of them. Allowing the waiver of substantial justice will be done and considering the both public benefits. The stormwater conditions in this area will be greatly improved with this project. It will stop any off-site drainage occurring, and it also will accept any off-site drainage coming onto the site and we'll have a very large retention pond that is a dry pond that will accept all of that runoff. So we are improving the conditions that are there already. Uh, as I said, I wasn't aware that we had an inconsistency from the natural resources. I read all of these different plans and they were all found us to be consistent. But, but the, when we went through with this, uh, we made some changes to the site plan and I believe that we now uh, could be found consistent between first and second reading. And uh, our commitment is that in the event that council wishes us to save the one tree, we can build an island around that in the retention area to preserve it. Uh, but again, that will have to be worked out at the permitting stage with city staff. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Can I ask some qu questions of staff based on what was just said, uh, the, the natural resources person? Sorry to interrupt. The, the tree that he was just talking about, if they build an island around it, do you think that tree could survive? And if it, if it did, how many more years do you think is on it? Um, Aaron Mayor Development Coordination. This is the tree again. I would say, I mean, laurel oaks require a lot of space if you're going to retain them. 
grand trees require at least a 20 foot protective radius and for laurel oaks i would even advise <coughs> more than that <coughs> so i mean you're gonna have to contour the pond <coughs> around that tree you know we're gonna cut roots at the edges um so if it survived how many more years do you think it has left I mean, 20 years, maybe. 20, okay. And can I ask Zane a question? Zane, we just saw pictures of the north and west of this property. Do you have a picture of what's to the east? Uh, let's see. I have one. I do. To the east, you have a residential single family detached home. And are there any, um, it, does that, property have any historic designation or anything like that? Or are there any historic protections in this neighborhood? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Do you have any idea what any what year that house is from or anything? Any historical significance? No, Thank you. Anybody else? No? Yes? And uh, council, may I remind you, so if the applicant provides a site plan between first and second reading, there will still be one waiver remaining. Now, uh, I'm not sure natural resources has to do their full analysis, but I know that one waiver, the use to use buffer, uh, will still remain. Thank you. you know. that's, the, that's the hammerhead for the fire department turnaround. And the doors. And the doors, that's correct, for four of the ten units. For, for internal, yes, control of the site. Okay, and video? That's my phone. Follow up. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Does that conclude your presentation? I, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have, but as I said, we were working diligently to try to resolve all of the different issues, and the only ones we ended up with were technical issues that we didn't have the ability to change. I'll be happy to answer any more questions that you might have. And any questions? If not, we'll go to public comment. Mr. Chairman, we have a speaker waiver form from Ms. Bennett. If you're here, uh, please acknowledge your presence. Sandy Sanchez. Sandy Sanchez. Pardon me, where are you, Ms. Sanchez? Oh, she's right there. She's Thank there. you. Uh, Michael McNabb. Here. Thank you. Uh, Jerome Adcock. Here. Thank you. Jo Joanne McNabb. Thank you. <coughs> Fran Tate. Fran, oh, hi. Ms. Tate? She's right there. Are. Okay, thank you. Uh, Adrian Laramiel, did I say that correctly? <coughs> thank you, and Allison Day. Thank you, seven additional people, seven minutes for a total of 10. And Ms. Bennett has some things that I'll pass out in just a minute, as soon as I can get it. Do you have a flash drive? A flash card? A flash drive, a video, anything? I already gave it to them, and so hopefully he'll hear my voice when I tell him it's time to play Are you it. narrating over the video? I am not. Okay. He's going to pass out these papers, and then we'll begin. Okay. Just give me a minute. I can just pass them out this way. Yeah, you want to hand out these? Do you have a copy? Thank you so much. I don't have comments for the chart. It's two sheets.
I have a second. I have the others, the growth so plans. I have one. Yeah. And for members of the public, just so you know, just to move these meetings along, um, uh, if you're going to have anything that you'd like in the record, you certainly do need one for the clerk, and we'd ask one be provided, uh, it, 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 ideally 10 copies, um, ladies and gentlemen, so it can be passed out appropriately. And also, if you could have them collated in advance and ready to go, it'll speed things up, and I appreciate your assistance in uh, facilitating that. And I'll, uh, we'll make additional copies if needed, Council. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bennett. Tim. You ready? Go ahead. I'm just, I didn't know if they were going to pull up a presentation, but go ahead. Hi, my name is Carol Ann Bennett. I am a lifelong resident of South Tampa. Even though the comp plan says South Tampa should have the least amount of growth in the city, it has been drowning in growth. And it may lead to actual drowning in storm surge. City Council recognized this problem and eliminated FAR in South Tampa and New Tampa. During that process, city and county staff made reports to Council about how the city has grown and how the comp plan says the city should be growing. Here are some excerpts from the presentation you'll play my first video, please. The comprehensive plan establishes unique visions for the New Tampa Planning District and the South Tampa Planning District. Uh, those excerpts are shown on your screen. And these are based upon uh, what the plan refers to as limited growth opportunities in these areas. And the research that we performed, um, you can see this slide displays the residential growth that has occurred in the city over the past 10 years. The uh, most recent 10 years of growth is broken into five-year increments. The 2010 residential units are shown in gray. And the growth that occurred from 2010 to 2015, that increase is shown in dark blue. And the growth that occurred uh, from 2015 to 2020 is shown in red. The two districts that have seen the highest residential growth in that period are the New Tampa Planning District and the South Tampa Planning District. This trend is not in line with uh, the comprehensive plan's vision for growth, uh, which is supposed to be limited in these two districts. Looking at the new Tampa trend, it appears that the rate of growth, uh, residential growth is decreasing uh, since the growth from 2010 to 2015 was significantly more than the growth from 2015 to 2020. So the, the, the red uh, is smaller than the blue. We see the growth is actually decreasing. Whereas in the South Tampa district, the opposite is true. The, the red, the growth in the last five years, is more than the growth that occurred in the five years prior. So let me just emphasize what he said. The two districts that have seen the highest residential growth are New Tampa and South Tampa. This trend is not in line with the Tampa Comprehensive Plan's vision for growth, which is supposed to be limited in these two districts. The growth in New Tampa is decreasing, whereas in South Tampa, the opposite is true. The rate of growth is increasing. The growth in the last five years is more than the growth in five years prior. The rate of growth is increasing. Now, this is David Hay of the Planning Commission. If you'll pay, play my second video, please. Based on the district characteristics, the comprehensive plan have viewed these uh, two districts as providing, quote, limited growth opportunities, unquote. There are also references in the comp plan calling these two areas, quote, areas of stability, unquote. This, uh, the comp plan really envisions the three core districts, Central, West Shore, and University, as having the most growth opportunities uh, within the city of Tampa. The majority of transit and employment in the city of Tampa are found within the Central, West Shore, and University planning districts. So let me just emphasize that. The comprehensive plan has these two districts providing limited growth opportunities. The comp plan also calls, the, calls these two areas areas of stability. The comp plan really envisions the three core districts, Central, West Shore, and University, as having the most growth opportunities within the city of Tampa. 
So city council saw the problem of high growth in the wrong parts of the city and they tried to help by eliminating FAR in those areas. What more can city council do? You can deny bad projects like this one. Growth can and will occur in South Tampa. People own property that is zoned for houses or duplexes, townhouses or eight story apartment buildings. Those people have the absolute right to pull permits and develop that property and they will and the citizens understand and accept this. But what citizens don't want to happen and what city council cannot allow to happen is what you see before you today. Instead of smart growth, instead of pulling permits and developing the actual rights that they have, they want more, 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 more. Some people always want more. They have the right to build one house, but they want to build two. They have the right to build a duplex, but they want a triplex. They have the right to build an eight-story apartment building, but they want a 29-story tower. <laughs> they buy a property knowing exactly what is allowed, and then they scream bloody murder if they don't get more, more, more. South Tampa has been exceeding the comp plan's growth rate since 2010. 2010. And you heard Stephen Benson. It's not slowing down. It's speeding up. South Tampa has done more than its fair share of providing housing for this city. We are full. You can fix this by allowing only smart growth, growth where the city says it has been, is beneficial. Gene Duncan, the head of, of this Tampa's transportation department, told city council that in terms of transportation, the city needs growth here, 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 and here. We don't see anything yet. Yeah, please activate the, um, yeah, there we go. Gene Duncan said that the city needs, in terms of transportation, the city needs growth here, 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 and here. Those areas, not here. I can pull the video whenever you want it. The Tampa Bay Times said if Hurricane Ian had hit Tampa the way it was supposed to, the devastation would have been much, much worse than Fort Myers because Tampa's coastal high hazard area is built up so much more than theirs. The paper had a graphic that showed a Category 2 hurricane would put the South Tampa Peninsula underwater. Hurricane Ian was a Category 4. And even if no one dies, and you know they will, but even if no one dies, the Times said the dollar amount of the property damage is going to be much higher than the Fort Myers damage. <laughs> Who is going to pay for it? Even if the insurance companies pay, and if you watch the news, you know they aren't paying in Fort Myers. But even if they pay, you know that they are going to get back every single penny. They will raise rates and do whatever they must. They are a for-profit business and the profit comes from us. I think the group Urban Tampa Bay said it best, quote, it doesn't make much sense to allow new development in locations which are at high risk of inundation during flood events. Every property developed in such locations is another property the rest of us will be subsidizing into perpetuity with our insurance and disaster relief payments. Thank you. That's it? That's it. All right. There's plenty of time left. All right. I know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next speaker. Council, my name is Philip Nelson. I live at 6963 South Manhattan with my wife. We are the property shown here. Just to the south and east of the proposed site. There was talk earlier about the development causing minimal aggravation. Any additional drop of water on my site will not be a minimal aggravation. I understand the water pond retention, but unless I'm promised that that will stop all water, this will greatly affect my residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. One last thing. This is what was torn down, another 100-year-old house. The house to the east is likewise about a 100-year-old house. Let's not replace this with 10 townhomes. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Um, my name is Kelly Vandeville. I live in the property directly to the east, 8004 Inter Bay. Um, this is going to impact my property very much, my family. Um, we already have flooding problems down in South Tampa. 
and I don't understand what he was talking about, about my gutters causing a problem because we're trying to pull the water away to the street where there supposedly is the drainage, but it still backs up three to five feet of water is always sitting over on the Manhattan slush and Inner Bay side. So this is gonna directly impact me as a resident and that pond is not gonna be a dry pond. It's gonna be full all during the rainy season. It's, it's not gonna be dry. I don't, it's gonna overflow probably. But I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, please say your name. Hello, my name is Kimberly Zielinski. I live at 4407 West Chisholm, which is the property directly behind. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. She's right here. Yes, yes. we can see it. So I brought some uh, photos so that you could see how the flooding has been over the years on my property already when there was only a single family house directly behind me. So yes, I'm concerned about the flooding. I am concerned about the, what this is going to do to the privacy. I am concerned about what it's just going to do to the neighborhood. We already get water in the streets such that it's almost impossible to drive. So I'm concerned about what the additional water and the additional people is going to do. Thank are you these, for your time. Are these old Polaroids? Yep. Huh. You know what a Polaroid is. I know what a Polaroid is. <laughs> <laughs> this is my backyard, and this is just a regular flooding. A regular I flooding. Sure. <laughs> these were taken in 2003, some of them? Some of them were in and 2000. And the flooding continues at that same level? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Gerald Hamilton, 8012 Interbay, just to the west of that property. I grew up in a house on my property that was built by the family that built the house and went down. Somebody was asking questions. The Baker's house was built in 1911 by Joseph Toffoletti. Next door to that where Kelly lives was a brother and a sister Toffoletti that lived in that house. And across the street from me, adjacent to the townhomes, was Ronaldo Toffoletti. Those three brothers opened a store in the bank building down in Port Tampa, which is a library. That's history. The house that I grew up in, I've been on that property 75 years. I, in the Air Force for 20 years, came back, tore the old house down, and built a new house. In 93, city code made me dig swales to keep the water on my property. The house... Ma'am? The city made me dig swales to drain water on my property, to my property, and keep it on my property, which is still that way. To the west of me was a single ranch style house built in the 50s. It was tore down. There's three two-story homes there. They drained to the street, presumably. The contractor said they would that built those. The one nearest to me drains to their driveway, which drains to the side of their driveway, which fills my driveway up every time it rains. So their drainage system did not work for that. Uh, I'm a single story house. These were a garage with two stories above it. Privacy goes bye bye. Bad enough with two stories. And we're trying to preserve a neighborhood there and that neighborhood feel is going bye bye really quick. I'm sure many of you live in a neighborhood you'd like to see stay the same. And we're not staying the same down there. Port Tampa was a city to you guys annexed us. Thank you. I wasn't born. What? I mean, yeah. Do what? Not us guys. Wow. Maybe Charlie. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening, council members. My name is Philip Snyder. I have been sworn in. Uh, I live across the street from the Zelenskys down at 4408 West Chisholm Street, and you saw the water retention in their yard. Well, not all that water stays in their yard. A lot of that. I live slightly lower than they do. My, the elevation on my property, I think, is eight feet above sea level. But their water comes down from their property, which if this development is done, that water is going to come into their property. It's going to be pushed into my property. I'm on a septic system. We're on a septic system. I'm speaking for my wife and myself. We're on a septic system. The additional water is going to have an adverse impact 
on the ability of my septic system to work properly. So in the summertime with the rains, our, the street, the, the Zelenskys and we share is just flooded. Every, every afternoon, just, just a river running down our street. More water coming from that development is going to just increase that. Um, the other thing I'm concerned about is, well, besides the development in South Tampa, it's just, it's gotten crazy. There's, there's a huge apartment complex going in down on Inner Bay, down toward Del Mabry. It's just gigantic. I can't believe it's been put, being put in there. But, but the concern with this development, I think Mr. Michelini said it was 50 feet off of the intersection of South Manhattan and Inner Bay. As we, as the wife and I come home, we come west on Inner Bay, and we have to turn left on the South Manhattan. As it is now, we have to sit there and wait for 15 to 20 cars pass us going toward Del Mabry for us to be able to turn. Sometimes we don't make the light. This development is going to have these homeowners 50 feet from that intersection wanting to turn left into that uh, development. People are going to be backing up. I don't know if any of you live down there, but we get a lot of base traffic down there, of course. And there's a, a ton of traffic. And those people are wanting to get to work, and they're wanting to get home. So there's the potential for that intersection to be backed up both directions, with someone wanting to turn left and go north on Manhattan, as well as someone wanting to turn left into this community. It, it's a mess now. This is just going to add to it. So we, my wife and I, ask that you deny the request for this development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Bob Whitmore, and I'm the executive director of City Tree, and I do not want to come back as a laurel oak because uh, I'm already over 50% of my lifespan has been spent, and uh, I still feel like I've got a few good years in me. But I'm not, I'm not really here to talk. And Mr. Michelinini, thank you for offering to build an island for our one of two trees on that plot. Um, it is, this is just a bigger story than this single incident. What is happening, and you guys know it, I'm just gonna lay it out there because I'm sure you guys all know it, is developers, builders are coming in and they are tearing down <laughs> a lot less nice than a 1911 um, beautiful house. They are tearing down, things are selling as teardowns. Okay, it's a teardown, so just tear it down. They're not even trying to sell it to a couple of kids trying to start up. They're not even trying to say, okay, you know, if I buy this and I live here and I raise my kids here, I can turn this around and when they get older, I can go off and maybe buy something else because prices have gone up and, and that's, that's great. But what is happening is these houses are being leveled and projects like this, or the one I'm gonna to speak to later, are being thrown into these spots, million and a half, $800,000, don't talk about the fact that we need affordable housing. Don't even try to tell me that this is a, some sort of a affordable housing gift from these developers to go ahead and throw these down in South Tampa. These are $800,000 condos that people are going to move into that have the money, and it's going to completely change the nature and character of those neighborhoods. Amen. You're looking at neighbors. Would you want to live again, would you want to live across from a giant retention pond, a commercial retention pond that you might see on the side of a strip mall. Who wants that in their neighborhood? How are we going to rebuild our neighborhoods when we're putting giant reten concrete retention ponds to take away a lot of the water that the trees would have taken away anyway, and now you're building impervient concrete that can't suck up the water, so we gotta build something bigger to like let it drain off. I really, really hope that you guys, I, I, I say this and I, you know, I respect you guys and thank you so much for your service and things that you do. And, you know, unfortunately, you're the guys that get yelled at. But and this, girls. this, and I'm so you're, you know, yes, and the men and the women that get yelled at. But these are the kind of projects that need to be stood in, in the front of. You know, we as a community and as, as the city need you guys to say no. We're going to have neighborhoods in that neighborhood. We're going to have single houses in that neighborhood. We're going to have places where people can build, buy a house, live there, and then turn it over and let their kids go to college and whatever. So please reject this um, for a lot of great reasons, but also for uh, some higher level reasons. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. I have a misdemeanor little form. And if you can get out those little sheets of the ink writing that Caroline gave you, I'd appreciate it. Ms. Pointer has, it looks like six names. Um, Richard Zelias. Did I say it correctly? Close enough. Zelinsky. That's okay. There's an eye at the end. Mary Nelson. Thank you. Uh, Rol Rolinda Snyder. Thank you. Allison Hewitt. Thank you. Joy Du. Thank you. And uh, Robin Lockett. Oh, I do see a seventh name. Donna Date Smith. Seven uh, names. Uh, total of 10 minutes, please. Good evening, Council. My name is Stephanie Pointer, and I want to tell you a little history. I want to do a little history lesson today. And um, for the record, um, this, pointer, this property right here belongs to the Pointers. Okay. Um, so let's start out with that nice little pink piece of paper I gave you. Every single unit going or from Manhattan going towards Inner Bay is at least 50 feet. I highlighted the, the density. All of these are single family homes. Yes, there are townhouses to the north, but I'll talk about those in just a minute. So I want you to understand that this does not follow the pattern of development. 11 townhouses does not follow the pattern of development. Now, you guys approved um, a couple years ago a $500,000 study of the coastal high hazard area in south of Gandy. This is the old house, and of course you can see it was up on blocks. It was not sitting on the ground on a foundation. So this is the <coughs> BFE, that's the base floor elevation, where they have to start building living space. So they have to build this up 11 feet before we get started. And I forgot the picture of my friend Kelly's house because you'll see that it's going to push all the water off under her house. Um, I'd like to make sure that everybody understands that this property is in the coastal high hazard area. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. And my friends back here have already shown you today that they have water on their properties. As a matter of fact, this is from the tree report in Acela. I didn't take this picture. I took it off the tree report in Acela. Now, mind you, the tree report was dated 9-9 of 22. There was no rain for six days preceding that, but yet there was standing water on the property when they came and did the tree report. Now, let's talk for just a minute. We've gotten all the way to 2004. Yes, yes, okay, 2001 is when the CHHA was developed. So I just want you guys to remember that. Now, let's talk about those townhouses. I want you to see, when you look at those townhouses, look how far apart they are from the abutting homes. That's not 15 feet, that's a bunch of land. You know what, I didn't measure. You know why, because I don't go on other people's property. But you see, that's not five feet, that's not 15 feet, that's not 25 feet. There's enough room for another house there. <laughs> Same thing on Manhattan. Look how far apart they are. This, that townhouse development respected their neighbors. I'm sorry, but this proposal does not respect our neighbors. And I think you can see that already. Look how many of our neighbors came here tonight and were very uncomfortable with getting up here and screaming and hollering like I do. Because I'm going to remind you again that the CHHA, it says direct future population concentrations get away from the coastal high hazard, no net increase in overall residential density. But we have to go back to this little map right here because somebody will say, oh, but they could and they should because this map was made in 1978 when I was seven years old. Is this map still relevant? No, it absolutely is not. And we've got to change this. We have got to take this into account. This coastal high hazard area is not taking this density into account. How can you, you I don't care how many ways you put it, because what will happen in land use and the planning department, they're very, very smart people, but they're trained to tell you this is not an increase in density. But I'm sorry, one house, 11 houses, that's an increase. I think we can all do that math. That's like first grade math. That's not even third grade math. I want to talk for just a second about how confused I am. Now, I pulled these reports 
for the first time this was supposed to come before council. And this right here is exactly why this whole let's do a continuance just because we need to do a continuance thing is crap. Okay, so the city staff had a report that said it was consistent in April. Now it's inconsistent. I don't get it. I just don't understand. Wait a minute, wait a minute, this gets better. The planning commission now or then said it was inconsistent, but now it's consistent. I'm confused and I'm not a land use person. So I, I, and I don't even have to make these decisions. And I would like to point out, Carol Ann was up here talking about hurricanes. Okay, all this purple area for a cat too, it's underwater. We have enough, we're full. Um, I wanna make sure I hit everything. This was not vacant land. We have, I, I have heard more than one person come up here. I think Mr. Michelini did, and I think Mr. Hussein did. Talked about using vacant land. I'm sorry, but at my house, at my house, this is not vacant land. This is not vacant land, that's a home. And when those people who lived there for 40 years sold that home, there was a stipulation in that contract that they would not tear the house down. And then guess what? They flipped it and tore it, and, some, and whoever owns it now tore it down. We aren't protecting our history. And then you want to tell me that we have less permeable space on the property now? Look at the site plans. It says, oh, you had this much impermeable, and now we have this much impermeable. But this house sat up off the ground, so water could run underneath it to the dirt and soak into the ground. I'd also like to point out to you that those laurel oaks that we've been talking about here and there, they suck up like a sponge thousands and thousands of gallons of water every time it rains. So what do you think is going to happen to this property that we've already shown floods when it rains when you take out those two big sponges and you throw them in the trash because that's what's going to happen to them. Okay, so we, you know, we have a lot of issues here. First of all, he wants to make it 40 feet high. Now, he told me last week he, he, he's going to reduce it to 35. I'm sorry, but he didn't meet with the neighborhood until, a, um, until May 30th, so about a week ago. Now, don't tell, don't, don't tell me that you conferred with me when you, me, the American people, the land use department, and everybody else in this room knows full good and well that you can't make those kind of changes between first and second reading. And, he, and, and everybody who came up here tonight from the city and from the planning commission told us that there are 11 units. But Mr. Michelini said there's only 10. Oh, no. Sorry. I, I, you can't. What? I'm confused. I need help here. Because this makes no sense. Yes, they might want to build two houses. They might want to build four houses. When the neighbors, all these folks, please raise your hand if you're here for this tonight. Please raise your hand because these are the people who abut this property, not people who live in a different neighborhood. These are the people who will be impacted every single day by this really crappy plan. And that's not fair to them. Most of these people have owned those houses for many, many, many years since I was a child. And they deserve to not have their personal properties destroyed by this. And um, Mr. Hamilton told us that his property floods because of the houses next to him. But I know for a fact the three domain homes on the other side of them, the south side of that property floods all the time anyway. So there's some serious standing water issues. And I'm sure I forgot something. Um, septic system. Oh, yes. There's 150 left of them in the city. I have one. Uh, we've got three of them total. They're septic systems. So what's going to happen when this water invades our septic system? Because you guys all know that I picked up the phone and called whoever it was that's in charge and said, hey, how can we get our septic tank put in? And he's like, there's not any down there, and we're not going to do it. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. Fine with me. What they don't know is the owner of this property put in all the houses on Manhattan. He built them himself, and he put, septic, he put the sewer lines in himself. So there is sewer lines next to our properties. So if anybody has any questions, I, I, I don't, why are we standing here talking about waivers? Why are we gonna put these, these condos right on top of somebody's house? 
Why does Kelly have to worry about all that water coming off? And remember, this is the, this is the base floor elevation. So it's going to be higher than her front porch because her, her house is almost equal size. And the equal, you know, it's just the same age. They showed you a picture of it. Um, so it's going to come up. Those are going to start that much higher than her front porch. Think about that. I'm here if you have any questions, as Sandy would say. Thank you very much. Y'all have a good evening. You too. Anybody else? We have nobody registered to speak, so seeing no one, we'll go to rebuttal. Mr. Michelini. Uh, good evening, Council. There, there is nothing in the code that allows any property to dump water onto any other adjacent property. Every single code that there is and the, and the technical standards require you, excuse me. Mr. Chairman, please. He was quiet the whole time, so yes, sir. We, we went through this extensively uh, with the Neighborhood Association when we met with them. And let me tell you how it, how it happened. We saw these posts that were going around about what a terrible project it was. We provide neighborhood notice, and the notices are supposed to encourage people, if they have issues, to contact the petitioner. That didn't happen. I reached out to Stephanie Pointer by email and said, hey, I see that you're posting all these things, and it would be good for us to discuss the project with you. She is correct. We committed to reduce the height to 35 feet, and I forgot to mention that. That's part of the, uh, what, what shows on our revised plan. But we cannot flood anybody else's property. It is not allowed. You have to accept any stormwater that comes off of anybody else's property, and you have to retain any property, any of the stormwater runoff that you generate from your property. Um, I would object uh, in principle to the videos that were shown. That's not substantial and competent evidence, and it was not sworn testimony. Um, we have to elevate the properties to meet FEMA. I can't change that. Um, but I can deal with the on-site drainage issue which is mandatorily required to be dealt with by the property that's being requested for the petition. Um, we outlined several things. Uh, we increased, I think I showed this to you, we increased the buffer to the property on the south. And that was based upon our discussion with the Neighborhood Association. We increased the buffer on the east and that was based upon our meeting and discussion with the Neighborhood Association. We eliminated one of the units. They asked us to eliminate more, but we eliminated one, and that was based upon our meeting. The retention pond is designed to be, or will be designed to be, a dry pond. I can't change the dimensions of this driveway. This driveway determined where we had to put the buildings, uh, and that was a fire marshal requirement due to life safety code. Um, these, all of these units face inner bay. The corner unit faces inner bay. The three interior, um, the four interior units do not, and that requires a waiver. Um, the land use code determines the density and the de development that's allowed there. We're below what's allowed. Um, I, you know, I was a little surprised that I had an inconsistent finding as well at the last minute because all the reports I had showed consistent. But then we made changes and we we're proposing changes that will be made between first and second reading that I think will address all of the tree and landscape um, issues. Um, we have worked diligently to try to make a plan that makes sense. We are directly across the street from townhouses. We are diagonally across the street from an industrial warehouse. And we're trying to protect the adjacent single family houses. Uh, I'm sorry that they flood, but I, as I mentioned, I've spoken with transportation in 23, 24 fiscal year. That intersection is gonna be re reworked and all the stormwater re 
uh, is going to be readdressed, and I don't know exactly what they're going to do, but but they're going to be re, uh, redesign and re-engineer that whole intersection. I think that we've we've come a long way on this plan. On this plan, there was no uh, subterfuge or trickery regarding a continuance. It was, uh, as you know, it was done because of of other external reasons, but. We went back, we redesigned the plan. I confirmed with the city staff, and you can ask them after I finish, uh, that we can make these changes between first and second reading if it's a pleasure of council to approve it, and we are respectfully requesting your approval. Um, it is a compatible project. Um, it is sensitive to the neighborhood, and it addresses a lot of the stormwater and drainage concerns that already exist, and that's why I said, the post condition on this property will be better than the existing condition right now. Thank you very much. I request your approval. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Any questions for staff? Any motions to close? Motion to close from Councilman Vieira. Second from Councilman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The hearing is closed. Councilman Vieira, I believe it's at you, sir. Okay, yeah, wait. Wait, can I do it? Uh, I'd like to move the motion if you don't mind. Go ahead. So I move to deny um, REZ 2304 for property located at 8008 Interbay Boulevard from RS50 to PD, single, uh, residential single family attached. I, yeah, due to the failure of the applicant to meet its burden of proof to provide competent and substantial evidence, that the development as conditioned and shown on the site plan is consistent with the comprehensive plan and city code and the applicant's failure to meet the burden of proof with respect to the requested waivers. Um, I want to say, state for one thing, that um, the videos, that I, I, your point is well taken and they absolutely did not enter into my decision making in this re uh, request. And I. I, see, I find that the, uh, the proposed development as shown on the site plan does not promote or encourage development that is appropriate in this location, character, and compatibility with the surrounding residential uses. As noted in the city's staff report, the site is vacant and presents the developer with an opportunity to design the project so that it's complied with natural resource requirements without the needs of waivers and the use of buffer requirements. The applicant did not provide evidence that the proposed design is unique in order to justify the waivers. The applicant did not provide evidence that the requested waivers will not substantially interfere with or injure the rights of others whose property would be affected by the waivers. Second. We have a second. A motion from Councilmember Clendenin, a second from Councilmember Hertag. Do you have a discussion? Um, I was just wondering if I could add Go ahead. to if it's yes, a, absolutely. I have a friendly if amendment. Friendly amendment. Yes. Um, if I can, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, Council, when you do make your Findings, uh, please do cite to the section of the code, um, whether it's the I'll waivers and it's 27139, yeah. Yeah. or whether it's the uh, plan development uh, criteria 27136. And if you have any findings of fact Sorry, that. that support your position based on the competent substantial evidence that you heard, uh, it would be my recommendation for the purposes of clarity. And again, you can supplement somebody else's motion for the purposes of doing that. Uh, that would add to the record. Thank you. Um, so I'll, in part of, as part of my amendment, I will add the Land Development Code section 27-136 that was cited earlier and uh, section 27-139 subsection 4. Um, but I am also adding to that um, uh, failure to comply with applicable goals, objectives, and policies in the comprehensive plan um, such that while the proposed rezoning may be allowed for consideration under the residential 10 and 20 designations and the Planning Commission staff concluded the proposed overall density is consistent with the development pattern, pattern anticipated under these land use categories, I find that the proposed rezoning coupled with requested waivers results in an intensity of development that is not compatible with the surrounding area, which includes single family development to the south, east, and west to the, of the site. We have a motion from Councilmember Clendenin, uh, a second from Councilmember Hertak with additional information on the motion. Uh, we'll get a roll call vote. Clendenin? Yes. Vieira? No. Henderson? No. Miranda? No. Carlson? Yes. Hertak? Meniscocco. Yes. 
Motion to deny, pass. With Thank you, Council. Henderson, Vieira, Miranda, voting no. Do we need a five minute break, anybody? Yes. All right. We're in recess for five minutes.
Carlson? Here. Hertak? Here. Plindenden? Here. Henderson? Present. Biera? Miranda? Here. Meniscalco? Here. We have a physical quorum. Mr. Chairman, may I be recognized, please? Yes. Thank you. Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Uh, just so uh, the public is also aware, and that council uh, is aware or reminded of uh, the question that Council Member Carlson raised with regard to continuances earlier in the meeting. And I do want to reference the, um, the rule uh, in brief um, that the council, city council, may deem an application or petition withdrawn if a matter is probably, properly set to be heard and, and a continuance is requested after having been continued on two previous occasions. So that is within the discretion of City Council, depending on the circumstances, certainly. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, I just think it, at, at the, after we continue it, uh, what, a second time, I think we should read that so that the public and the applicant know. We have some sophisticated applicants, and we have some that are just homeowners that are applying. And I think it's, it's good to just be consistent and have us remind applicants every time that they might not get a third they probably won't get a third shot. If that's council's pleasure, um, by consensus, <laughs> I can just make a note of that and make sure that um, when I review the agenda, I see. And it's usually brought to my attention in one form or another by, um, by staff when it is a third continuance. But I will make that point on a second continuance if that's council's pleasure. Mr. Chairman? All right. Thank very good. Thank you very much. Councilman Vieira is back with us. All right, item number six. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Agenda item number six, case SU2 22 07. This is a request for a special use two for a school at the location 9612 North 26th Street. I'll now pass it on to our Planning Commission. Emily Phelan, Planning Commission staff. The subject site is located within the University District and the North Tampa Overlook neighborhood. The closest transit stop is located within 0.2 miles west of the subject site at North 22nd Street and East 97th Avenue. David E. West Park is the closest recreational facility located one mile northwest of the subject site and the site is located within evacuation zone E. This is an aerial of the subject site, which is here represented with the outline of purple. Um, the surrounding development pattern is some light commercial with a transition to residential uses one block north and one block east of the subject site. And it is within proximity to Henderson Boulevard uh, to the east, which is a major commercial corridor. The subject site is here and it's represented by the residential 10 designation. As you can see from the map, residential 10 surrounds the area. Uh, daycares can be considered within the residential 10 future land use designation through a special use to approval. The request proposes to retain an existing daycare and proposes a school of 5,747 square feet. The proposed development is below the maximum 0.35 FAR allowed under the residential 10 designation. Planning Commission staff reviewed the request and found the proposed school to be compatible and comparable to the surrounding area. The site is appropriately buffered and sensitive to the adjacent residential uses to the west. The proposed development is providing a sidewalk connection along North, 22nd, North 26th Street and East 97th Avenue, consistent with the comprehensive plan. In conclusion, the proposed special use request is comparable and compatible with the existing development pattern and consistent with the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive <coughs> plan promotes the co-location of community facilities that support the neighborhood. The expansion of the school as with the site as, as well as the daycare will continue to support and provide daycare services and school services to the North Tampa Overlook neighborhood. And this concludes my presentation. Any questions? No. Thank you, Mr. Hussein. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. I'll go ahead and first share the aerial view of the property. As you see the property right here outlined in red, 
Uh, to the north, you'll have East 97th Avenue. To the uh, east, you'll have North uh, 26th Street. To the uh, west, you'll have North 22nd Street. And to the south, you'll have East O'Kara Road. The property is located uh, in RS60 Zoning District. To the north, south, east, and west, uh, all of the properties are uh, RS60 Zoning. To the west, east, south, are residential single family homes. And to the north, you have a um, uh, place of religious assembly, a church. I'll now show the site plan provided by the applicant. The proposed special use is for a school. Currently on site is uh, a daycare, which was approved through SU217-07. Uh, the site currently uh, has a total square footage uh, and acreage, I'm sorry, acreage of 1.5 acres. The existing building, as you see, you have an existing building on site, is 3,290 square feet, and there also is a shed to the south of the daycare here, which is 326 square feet. Uh, at the school, uh, sorry, at the daycare currently, there are 13 employees and 50 uh, students. The proposed SU2 is for six classroom buildings for a total of 5,040 square feet. As you see the six, one, two, three, one, two, three. Six um, buildings here. The office will be also 381 square feet. Vehicular access comes from the east, East 97th Avenue. From the north, East, o, uh, east O'Carro. I'm sorry, East O'Carro to the south. <laughs> East 97th to the north, and north 26th to the east. Vehicle access. Uh, the applicant is proposing to request 25 parking spaces, and the code, I'm sorry, uh, the proposed request requires 25 parking spaces, and a total of 24 parking spaces are being provided. The maximum building height will be 10 feet. I will now show the elevations provided by the applicant. As you see the existing elevation to the east, south, north, and west. And you see the proposed elevations from one side, other side. front elevation and the rear elevation of the six proposed buildings. As I went out to the site and took pictures, I'll show you what I saw. You are right here on the uh, looking at the front of the current daycare. Another picture of the site. To the rear of the site, you'll see uh, grass where the kids can play. To the north, you'll have residential and also a church as I'll show you the front of the church and the sign of the church To the south, you'll have residential. I'm here at the intersection at East O'Carra. Okay. 
and to the east of the site, you'll also have residential. I will show the site plan one more time. The applicant has been approved for three waivers as of SU2 17-07, and there are being now two new waivers being requested, and that's to allow access to a local street, East O'Kara, in lieu of direct access to an arterial, arterial or collector street. And then the second waiver requesting is for allowing the reduction in parking spaces from 25 parking spaces to 24, which is a 4% reduction. Development Review and Compliance staff has reviewed the application and finds the request to be inconsistent with the Land Development Code. See transportation for the findings uh, of this inconsistency. Should it be the pleasure of City Council to approve the application, the applicant must provide revisions to the revision sheet between first and second reading. I'm here for any questions. Any questions? Thank you very much. Applicant? Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Gerald McCants. I'm the architect and agent for the client, and the client is right here. Uh, he's the owner. He's been sworn in Pastor as well. Pastor Randall. Right. The church across the street is actually right. my church. Yeah, and I'll get to that. Yep. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, the council for hearing and for city staff for working with us to work on developing this, uh, a plan as close as we can get to be consistent with all the uh, regulation requirements. <clears throat> now, the, the church, uh, Life in Christ Ministries, uh, runs and operates the daycare on the property, and they are proposing to build the six modular classrooms on the vacant portion of the site. I'll just briefly kind of go through the site, and I also have, I, I created some, <clears throat> some renders on, I can distribute them or hand them out to the Yeah, well, on the uh, Elmo as well. Okay. We got, oh, here it is, okay. <clears throat> so this kind of gives a little clear interpretation without the various site notes and uh, planning uh, review comments that we were coordinating to give a better picture of, of what the intent of the development will be. So the applicant is proposing to build the six modular classrooms that will have a total uh, student enrollment of 108 students. We have worked through to uh, provide as much parking as we can, so we were just asking for that one parking with waiver reduction to allow for the, there's existing nine spaces currently along the northern boundary of the uh, daycare. So in, in keeping with this uh, traffic flow, we are proposing to add the additional parking in similar fashion. Uh, we, we were requested to put an island on here just to, for the uh, proposed uh, throughway, we had worked with uh, with uh, the fire marshal to for fire access to provide uh, adequate, uh, you know, uh, traffic for the fire truck to turn and and circle through the campus from the south to the north, vice versa. We also have two additional parking spaces that are existing. We are also trying to. Uh, uh, Provide these parking will be, will be uh, pervious surface areas. So the in accordance with regulation and code, the, the dry valves will be asphalt pavement. But then we will propose some uh, semi-permeable surfaces, gravel or turf block to uh, construct the uh, additional parking spaces. We also will have a sidewalk that will communicate with the existing sidewalks along the perimeter of the site, and it will communicate upward through the site and then also connect with the existing daycare. 
we worked with our civil engineer to uh, provide adequate retention. So we have here these kind of darker areas on the site relate to the uh, retention areas that would be proposed, that would be in uh, the vacant areas. And the civil engineer has also provided kind of a, a, an example of what those soils will look like after they are completed. So they won't be uh, a catchment for rainfall. That will be more of a retention. It will be more of a detention type of pond where rainfall will capture and then percolate into the groundwater. We'll also propose adding some additional trees along the perimeter to help uh, prevent any type of erosion. I have an existing picture of where those modules will be located. See the existing daycare church is, is oriented to the east. And then this will be the through street that will provide for the fire access. And then the, the modules will sit oriented to the east and west of that drive out. We, are, we also are going to uh, prevent any type of queuing or uh, any type of conflict with using the, the local road to the north and south by providing enough queuing to cycle through the site that will have less of an impact on the surrounding neighborhood. We are, uh, there are, there's existing outdoor child play areas that's already fenced, which is shown here, the delineated. And then that'll actually help uh, to uh, provide enough play area for the additional students. And also within the, the dry area of the uh, retention areas as well, for extra play area. And as the client stated, the Parcel to the north is owned by the church. So they own this parcel here, this kind of L-shaped parcel to the north. And then also to the south is there's some residential and also uh, city municipal uh, rainwater catchment facility to the south. And there's residential that abutted to the uh, east and west. We did, as staff had relayed, we had worked with staff to create the appropriate buffering for residential and then allow for a uh, continuation of, of the site by connecting to uh, existing walk walkway surfaces. So here is, again, the orientation here. Again, you can see the proposed area where the modules will be located and the extension of the parking will go along the northern boundary with the fire access to, to communicate between the both local roads, north and south. So that concludes my presentation. Thank any you. questions for the applicant? No? Thank you very much. Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this item? This is item number six. I don't have anybody registered. Yes, sir. Please approach the electorate and state your name. Bob Whitmore, <clears throat> Executive Director of City Tree. I would just like to quickly thank the applicant for creating such an environmentally responsible addition to the city of Tampa. It shows a real respect for the environment and the surrounding neighborhoods. And I'm sure your students will love playing under the shades of all those <laughs> trees that you took great pains in preserving. Thank you very much. Anybody else? All right. You got the Bob Whitmore seal of approval. <laughs> All right. Very good. Anybody on council? Any rebuttal, sir? No, no. I yield my time back to the council. Right. Thank you. May I have a motion to close? So moved. We have a motion to close from Councilman Miranda. Do we have a second? Second. Same for Councilman Carlson. All in favor? Aye. 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 What is the pleasure of council? I'll read it. Yes, sir. Councilman Vieira, number yes, six. Sir. I move an ordinance being presented for first reading consideration ordinance approving a special use permit SU2, approving school in RS60 residential single family zoning district in the general vicinity 
of 9612 North 26th Street in the City of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in Section 1 hereof, providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion from Councilmember Vieira and a second from Councilmember Henderson. Roll call. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Hertek? Yes. Clendenin? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on July 13, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. Located at Old City Hall, 315 East Kennedy Boulevard. Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> 336 Earth. Earth. Zero Tampa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Organized July 15, 1887. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, it on Item number seven. Yes, good afternoon, Chairman, <laughs> Council, LaShawn Dock Development Coordination, and Council. Item number seven is REZ 22113. This is for the property located at 2302 East Hillsboro Avenue. The applicant is represented by Cami Corbett. The request is to rezone the property from CI Commercial Intensive to PD Plan Development to allow for the uses of residential multifamily personal services, retail sales, specialty goods, and business professional office. So with that, I'll turn it over to Emily, and I'll come back and get my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Emily Phelan, Planning Commission staff. The subject site is located within the Central Tampa Planning District, East Tampa Urban Village, and the Seminole Heights East neighborhood. The closest transit stop is directly in front of the site along East Hillsboro Avenue and North 22nd Street. Clarence Fort Freedom Trail is the closest recreational facility located about a half a mile southeast of the subject site, and the site is not located within an evacuation zone. The site takes up most of the aerial. But um, the surrounding area contains a mixture of uses, light and heavy uh, commercial uses can be found along here, along East Hillsboro Avenue. Multifamily can be found here, and light industrial uses are also found along Hillsboro Avenue. And this is part of the Grace Point site to the north. Um, this is a map of the future, the adopted future land use. The subject site is represented by the red, which is community commercial 35. And to the north is public, semi-public, which is part of the Grace Point site. And to the northwest is R10, which is, has residential single family on there. Um, the community commercial future land use designation allows for a variety of uses, including residential and commercial uses. Development in this category can either utilize um, density or floor area ratio to determine maximum development potential. The applicant is proposing residential and non-residential uses at an FAR of 0 0.71, which is consistent with the intensity anticipated under the CC35 future land use designation. The subject site is located within a mixed use and transit emphasis corridor. The proposed development is providing pedestrian entrances along North 22nd Street and Hillsboro Avenue. The development proposes two buildings with entrances for ground floor units oriented towards North 22nd Street and one building oriented towards Hillsboro Avenue. The proposed dwelling units will provide infill housing opportunities along the North 22nd Street and East Hillsboro Avenue corridors near services, transit, and employment consistent with the compact city form strategy. The request supports many policies in the comprehensive plan as it relates to housing the city's population. The comprehensive plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure an adequate housing supply is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future populations. And the comprehensive plan also directs the greatest share of growth to the urban villages. The proposed plan development would allow for development that is comparable and compatible with the character of the surrounding uses and is consistent with the development pattern anticipated under the CC35 designation. And this concludes my presentation. Councilwoman yes. What did you say the FAR was? 0 0.71. 0 0.71. And what could be allowable on that site? With 
a buy right density is a 1.0 FAR, and the applicant could seek a bonus, which would bring the FAR up to a 2.0. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very questions? much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, Council LaShawn, Doc Development Coordination. And um, Council, this item um, is before you. This is a PD request. Um, the applicant is proposing to develop six um, residential multifamily structures on site, um, and also that would contain a total of 354 units, and these are all 100% affordable units, which will be provided. The maximum building height proposed in those residential structures is 45 feet, and there is one commercial structure proposed along the south, um, which I'll show you on the site plan shortly. That building contains 10,000 square feet, and it is proposed at a maximum height of 30 feet. The building setbacks are proposed um, along the north at 62 feet, to the south at 15 feet, um, to the east 25 feet, and to the west 48 feet. So the site is located in the East Tampa overlay and must comply with section 27-240, which is the East Tampa overlay district design guidelines um, at the time of permitting. Unless a waiver is requested, and you'll notice on the site plan there is one waiver to this standard requested, and that is relating to the front doors and the orientation of those front doors on the site um, on some of the units for the residential, um, and that's because of the internal um, function of the site. Um, so what I'd like to do is just talk for a moment about the site itself. So um, this is the site plan that's submitted, and just to orient you, this is 22nd Street. This is Hillsborough Avenue. So you have a couple of commercial parcels that are located here that exist. Um, but this is the southern boundary. This is the location of the commercial um, on site. You have your six residential buildings. You have these two buildings, and then you have the four additional buildings on site. Access to the site is from 22nd Street with this drive, which bifurcates this portion of the site. And then you have um, an entrance you have access located here on Hillsboro also. So also um, internal to the site, you'll see that there are pedestrian walkways which are provided, um, crosswalks are provided, and that all um, assist with internal function of the site and um, pedestrian access. Sidewalks are proposed on the um, boundary of the site along the west on 22nd Street and also on the south on um, Hillsboro Avenue. And these pedestrian connections, they connect to those adjoining sidewalks um, on site. And also there are amenities provided. You'll see the clubhouse is located here on site. This is the pool. Um, also provided is a dog park, which will be located here on site. And then there's the commercial. So there are elevations which are submitted with the request. So this is an elevation I'll show you of the, um, this is this building, type one and type four buildings, which are identified on the site plan. Um, I'll show you that. The elevations are similar for each building, so I won't show each and every elevation, but the top is the south elevation. And then this is the east elevation. This is the north elevation. And then the west is the bottom. So this is the clubhouse, which is proposed. The top is the west elevation. This is the north elevation, the south elevation of the clubhouse, and then this is the east elevation. And then the last set, this is the commercial structure proposed. So the south elevation is the top. This is the east elevation and the west elevation. And then this is the north. So the south elevation is the elevation towards Hillsboro. And then I have an aerial map, let me show, of the zoning for the area. So this is the property on this map that's identified, outlined in red. This is 22nd Street to orient you on this map to the west. This is Hillsboro Avenue, which is located to the south. And you can see that there's CI zoning and commercial zoning, which runs along Hillsboro Avenue. And then you have um, 22nd Street is the eastern boundary for the Seminole Heights district. So you'll see the um, SHRS zoning, which is the Seminole Heights residential single family to the northwest. Seminole Heights CI is to the west. 
and then you have your zoning of your um, PD and commercial to the north and northeast. And then you have your residential multifamily here. So I'll show you some surrounding the site and of the site itself. So this is the southern boundary of the site. This is Hillsboro Avenue, which is to the um, left in this picture. This is another view of the site. Of course, the site right now is vacant currently, so. That's another view of the site, and this is if you're looking towards the um, east. So now these are the surrounding uses, which are on, this is on Hillsboro. This is south of the site, the commercial strip center. This is another view to the south on Hillsboro also. This is a view of Irwin Tech, which is um, to the west. This is a view looking north on 22nd Street. So the site is um, to the right in this picture. And the Irwin Tech is to the left. This is north of the site, Grace Point. This is a view. And this is east. This is Meridian Point um, Apartments that's located to the east. The development review um, staff reviewed the request and finds the request consistent. Um, there are site plan modifications to be made um, between first and second reading. So the applicant does agree to those site plan modifications. And um, a revision sheet um, will be provided to you. The revision sheet, which is included in the staff report, has been revised. Um, and the applicant will explain the um, additional modifications that they've agreed to make between first and second reading. So I'm going to hand out the revised revision sheet, if you can include that in the reading, please. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. All right, do we have an applicant? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Cami Court with the law firm of Hill Ward and Henderson, 101 East Kennedy Boulevard, Suite 3700, representing the applicant. And I do have a PowerPoint presentation, so if I could get that pulled up, and if someone could tell me how do I advance these slides. All right. <laughs> it's up, so it's up. we'll okay. tell you how to advance. This one? This one. All right. There we go. Uh, LaShawn already covered the back, uh, the back, some of the background. Uh, I represent the Richmond Group, uh, which is a national developer uh, that has a good reputation both in market rate housing and affordable housing. They have a lot of Thank units you. here in Tampa Bay. Um, and they purchased this site to provide a 100% affordable housing site uh, for the city and for Richmond's profile, uh, portfolio. It used to be the Funland Movie Theater, and it's currently vacant. Uh, it's, we are asking for the 354 units and 10,000 square feet of commercial. We anticipate about six to 7,000 feet of that commercial will become Richmond's corporate office, corporate management office that is currently on Rocky Point. This is not a management office, property management office. This is their overall corporate property management office. Okay. There we go. Um, when I want to talk about the affordability commitment, and you can see that on the screen, we are using the state's definitions. We are not making up definitions. We are using the tried and true uh, definitions that are based on income, family size, and rents, maximum rents. And so one of the revisions you'll see on the revision sheet is a much more robust condition on the zoning plan, which very clearly clarifies that 100% of the units will be reserved to up to 120% of uh, the area median income. The reality is, is that 60% will be rented to 80% to 120% of the median income, and 40% will be rented to households between 50% and 80%. And just for example, those are ranges from, for one person household, 50% of the median income is 30,450, and the 120 is 73,080 dollars. And the corresponding rents would range for one bedroom from $815 to $1,957. Back to the site plan, LaShawn already went through this. We are providing significant uh, residential amenities uh, and bicycle racks and again, the 10,000 square feet of commercial and the 354 <coughs> units. I want to talk about community engagement. We filed this site plan in the late July of 2022. In August, we began one-on-one -on -one meetings with multiple stakeholder groups and community leaders. And all of those 
community groups that you are see listed on the screen were consulted with in August of 2022, either by myself or another representative of our team. We continued those meetings in September of 2022. We met with Nathan Hagen from UMB Tampa Bay. We went to the East Tampa CRA Land Use Committee. Uh, we had a community leaders meeting at Grace Point with all of those organizations. And again, we are in Southeast Seminole Heights. That's our neighborhood organization. Um, and we, that's where we're located, but we, these organizations are all in the area. So we felt important to meet with them. And we got fairly significant you don't think we don't think we're in, it's not in Southeast. I mean, that's East Tampa. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's East Seminole Heights. Sorry, I misspoke. Um, and, but we're not in Old Seminole Heights. We're, we're, we, we, all of these neighborhood organizations are in the area. And we reached out to them and spoke with them and met with them and got some fairly significant feedback on our original proposal that wasn't very positive, quite frankly. They were concerned about the density and the intensity. Um, they, we were proposing at the time six-story bu buildings with 456 units, and the design, they were not happy with the design. We had some additional community engagement after we revised the site plan, and we met, we had a community meeting at Irwin Technical College, and then we had, we did outreach to Hart to talk about a re the feasibility of a bus pull-off, um, and they indicated to us that that was not feasible. Uh, in January of 2023, we met with the Tampa Police Department to discuss any potential security measures that we could make to ensure that the property remained secure. And then just in May, just May 25th, I attended another meeting at Grace Point with the community leaders. And we talked about the site plan. They had some questions still. And at that, at that point in time, I was told that at that point, no one was objecting to the rezoning itself. They still had some questions. I offered to come back and meet. Um, so I was a little bit surprised and taken off guard in the quasi box today when there were letters of objection in the file because we have been in an ongoing dialogue with these people, with everyone, um, and trying to address their concerns. Have we been able to do everything they want us to do or accommodate that? No, we have not. What were their concerns? Sure. Their concerns? What were their concerns? So I'll go through the revisions that we did based on the original concerns and then we'll talk about the rest of the concerns. So again, the revisions we made to the site plan, we went from six stories to three stories, the 456 to 354, went from 1.5 FAR, what would have required a bonus, down to 0.71. We activated that 26, 22nd Street frontage. Uh, we maintained an internal boulevard. Uh, we have safer inter, uh, interconnections with the sidewalks and the crosswalks, as indicated. We customized the perimeter screening. We have uh, eight foot masonry wall abutting Grace Point, which is something that they specifically requested, and that requires a waiver. Uh, and then we have six foot decorative fencing along 22nd Street. We added transit options to deal with bike racks and secure bike storage. Bus shelter, we proposed a bus shelter on Hillsborough, and we made overall design urban in nature. And just to visually see, so you can see, this is the difference in the site plan. On the left, there was the original, and on the right is the final. These were the original renderings that were filed with the rezoning. You can see the buildings are much taller in scale. Uh, there's not really an urban development pattern. It's just kind of multifamily buildings. This is the revised site plan rendering, so it's very different. It has uh, much more architectural features to it, better design. These were the original buildings that were proposed, the building facades, and these are the revised. And so you can see we've made significant uh, modifications to this site plan to try to address the concerns, the zoning related concerns. And I want to make sure, make clear, this is a rezoning case and we're looking at this for compliance with the land development code and the comprehensive plan. And so these are the things that we did to address the zoning plan. Um, one thing, I guess I'll switch now and pivot to your question, which is what is one of the things that we were not able to accommodate? And I'll ask Michael Yates, our transportation expert, to come up and talk about one of those. Uh, good evening, Michael Yates with Palm Traffic, and I have been sworn. Um, just, I'll go real quick on the access for the site. Uh, we have one access to Hillsborough Avenue. Uh, we met with DOT. That will be limited to right in, right out. It is adjacent to the commercial here. Uh, Meridian Point is over here to the east. And then we have the one full access to Hillsborough Avenue. Uh, or to 22nd Street uh, on the west side here. 
And so the one issue that uh, we have not been able to address and accommodate is they had asked us, could we do access to Meridian Point and use the signal at Meridian Point? And there are, we did look at it, we looked at it in great detail trying to figure out, is it possible? Yeah, gotta get above the closed caption. Oh, there we go. Is that better? Yeah. Um, so one of the issues that we had is, this is our site right here, this is Meridian Point to the west. Um, this is the only point of access. This is to the signal, which is right here. This is where our right in, right out is proposed. Um, so the issues we had is that this is basically a single lane exit. Um, these are commercial out parcels that are under separate ownership from the uh, multifamily project. And this is their drainage pond to the west. This is where their drainage is. So the current one lane exit accommodates about 125 cars during the peak hour. Works acceptable level of service, no issues. However, if we had to use that as our exit point, that number would drop, would jump to about 275 cars during the peak hour, which is too much traffic for a one lane approach. So you would have to add a second lane approach. And so to, the only way to do that is you can't expand to the east because of the existing commercial that's already there. The only way would be to expand to the west, and that would encroach into the pond that is already there, and that would impact the drainage for these parcels. The second issue is that the commercial parcels have an access to this frontage road, and so that is located only about 100, car, 100 feet from the stop bar on 22nd. So that could only accommodate four cars to queue before you would block their access. And if you get someone that tries pulling out when this queue is here, then the queue could come out to Hillsborough and impact the operation at Hillsborough. Uh, the next issue was that they would have to come up here and then come through the traffic circle and come in this way. Well, this traffic circle really wasn't designed to accommodate vehicular cars serving more than the clubhouse use. The residents today come to the right. This is actually combed off. Um, but so the only use that this would send all the traffic through that traffic circle. It's a pretty small traffic circle. It's about 75 feet in total diameter. It's pretty tight. Uh, there's brick pavers in there. So there would be some operational issues with that. And then also you would not be able to have the parking along the entryway here. And then there is an, an existing building here that would need to be removed. So for all those reasons, it would be nearly impossible to have that as our primary connection point. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions and I'll turn it back over to Cammie. Any questions? Why don't you do parking waivers? Okay. Um, so we... We did have a parking waiver as well for the residential. Yeah, let me. So based on the code and the number of units, uh, it would require 623 parking spaces. Um, we looked at ITE trip generation or parking generation fifth edition. I uh, just came out within the last year. They actually have an affordable housing parking rate uh, in there. And so based on that, the demand would be 378 parking spaces is what ITE would estimate would be the parking needed to serve the residential project. Uh, we are requesting uh, 473. That is what we are providing on our site plan. So far exceeding what ITE says by about 100 spaces. So we, are, we believe we are providing sufficient parking to accommodate the project. And I'll turn it back over to Cam. Remind me how so many units are in the... 354. All affordable. All affordable. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. And I was just going to go, if we go back to the PowerPoint, I just want to go over the waiver so everyone's clear what those are. So you just heard about the parking waiver and the reduction and why we're doing it. 
Um, we are asking to allow for four 12 by 30 loading spaces where that we're required for um, the four loading spaces, but we don't need a semi-trailer lo loading space. We don't oh, need that. Oh, we can't see it on our screen. Oh, sorry. It's, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so th the loading spaces that we have, we don't have need for a semi-trailer -tra loading space. It's just not needed here. Um, as uh, LaShawn mentioned, the building front orientation internal to the site, we do, we're meeting the intent of that code by it's uh, facing, really the only face that we have, the front face that we have is along 22nd Street, and we are facing those buildings towards the street. It's the internal buildings that are not facing the street, all of them. Uh, are really our front yard is kind of technically along the Amscot and this car business, right? We don't really have a front yard. The 22nd is really our front yard. So we are meeting, I think we are meeting the intent of that code to have the residential oriented towards the street. Um, and then we do have a reduction to open the green space uh, from 350 square per a unit. And so it's basically a 21.3% reduction. Um, but we are providing significant uh, open space. Um, but that was something that we had to do when we went from, when you have six story buildings, you have open space based on 30% of the entire site. When you go below six stories, then it becomes a per unit basis and it's, it's somewhat excessive in my opinion. Um, and so we are uh, asking for a reduction. And then lastly, our waiver is to have, instead of not, not having a wall or having a six foot uh, screening, we are providing um, an eight foot wall. And that is, was again at the along, only along the northern boundary because that was at the request of Grace Point, who is our northern neighbor. And that is what they requested and we provided that to them. Um, do you want to place into the, the record? We do have a letter of support from DDA Development, uh, the owner of the two affordable projects that are directly to the north, indicating that they're very enthusiastic about this plan and also saying, uh, speaking to the quality of Richmond's development over the 30 years of his experience in the development community. Just wanted to offer that into the record. Uh, as as LaShawn said, um, we have been found consistent by staff uh, both planning commission staff and uh, land development co coordination and all of the substantial <coughs> evidence, competent evidence in the record um, supports a, a, re a, a approval of the rezoning. So thanks, I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. Any questions? Nope. All right, we'll go to public comment. Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this item? I see a few individuals. Yes, sir, you have three minutes. Please state your name. Bob Whitmore, <clears throat> Executive Director of City Tree. I really liked the first design so much better. You know, you build up, and when you build up, you can get a lot more trees in, into the property. I am very concerned with the 20% reduction in green space. I saw Live Oaks as a bullet point on the list of things that was in discussion with the people that were surrounding the, um, the area. It was either skipped unintentionally or that was part of the 20% of green space that sort of just sort of went away. So I was hoping the applicant could speak to um, what they're doing to preserve the trees on the property. The aerial view um, shows a lot of trees down in the corners and on the perimeters. Every tree counts, so I'm hoping that the applicant can just address what they're doing to save the existing trees and maybe mitigating with trees that aren't ornamental. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Allison Hewitt, 49 and 432nd Street, East Tampa resident. I want to say that um, we uh, welcome smart, uh, effective, and great development in East Tampa. We also appreciate the team for meeting with us with Richmond um, and making the changes to the original proposal. Um, we do have uh, some, still have some concerns. The two major concerns that I'd like to uh, bring up is uh, property maintenance is one. Um, this will be a large development right on a major corridor. And so our group has asked for um, the maintenance uh, reports for the other locations um, because we have some uh, community complaints about Meridian next door and the other properties that they own the uh, Hannah Oaks and Meridian Point as far as the maintenance. And we have not been able to get back an answer on how you're gonna make sure this larger development on the major corridor will be uh, maintained. Um, we understand too, because they have other properties here in Tampa, like the um, 
uh, Grady uh, Square, which is wonderful and fabulously maintained. And we can potentially get a similar maintenance plan or a commitment to that similar maintenance plan. Um, we would be uh, appreciative. Uh, the next other concern is um, the traffic on 22nd Street. For those of you who um, try to turn right off of 22nd Street on a regular day, you know you can be backed up um, past the Amscot. Um, now you're going to add 300 units, um, even if they only have 300 parking spaces. Um, that uh, we're just really concerned about the congestion getting into and out of Leary and getting to the, um, the, um, the only real Walgreens pharmacy that's uh, in our community right now. So we are um, still hoping for uh, at least continued um, uh, conversations on how they will be addressing the maintenance. Um, the 100% affordable, I do know that we need uh, housing and affordable housing. Um, but East Tampa does not need to be the place where all affordable housing goes. If we're able to be able to draw amenities to East Tampa, to be able to draw professional, young professionals to move to East Tampa, we need to provide grocery stores, we need to provide eateries that are not fast food, but it means we also need to um, increase the uh, market rate housing that we have in East Tampa to provide some other options for housing as well. Again, um, not trying to say that we don't need affordable housing, but we do need a um, intentional mix to be able to make sure that we're growing the entire community. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Good evening. My name is Joy Dew. I'm at 5903 North 34th Street and my neighborhood association is Live Oak Square. So we are to the east of this proposed project. And I, I wanted to bring up a point we were not asking for the primary exit to come on to Hillsboro we were asking for them to already take advantage of a a red light that's already there um, just like what Allison said coming out on 22nd you have to realize 22nd as you travel north you're going to come on the back side of elementary school Sly Middle traveling south, you're going to be coming into um, Middleton. So it's going to be a lot of school buses on there. Uh, you also have the Heart Line on there as well. And even though they're lowering down the uh, parking, so that means they're expecting everyone to take the bus or they're expecting everyone to ride their bikes, it's not possible to ride a bike on Hillsboro. We know that that's one of the high injury corridor networks and you would be silly to ride your bicycle on Hillsboro. Um, as well as the fact that they're not offering um, space for the school buses to come in, load and unload, as well as heart. So you're having 354 residents or units coming out on 22nd and not providing a way for those buses to get out of the way so traffic can continue to travel north and south on 22nd. We wanted Hillsboro to be a second source, and, and we fought very hard for that red light there. If you're aware, you know, they did have some deaths there from some young ladies that were crossing to go to Milton. So take advantage of that. And as far as them going to FDOT, they only went to FDOT proposing their one right on, right off. They never even considered, uh, you know, making that an option. It, it, I believe it is doable. Um, the other thing is the safety issues. The safety issues, you know, they do own the Meridian, which is next door. And for them to say, and I'm not taking away for the fact that they are, we know that they have the ability to make good development, but it has not been evident at the Meridian. They also own, and the correction is um, Grand Oaks, which is on Hannah Avenue, as well as Brandywine, that's on 40th. And the statistics that TPD provides on their website shows that there are major issues there. Um, Hannah Oaks, you know, their security gentleman was murdered a lot several years ago. The management is just not there. They have the ability to provide a very nice quality product to East Tampa. We are not opposed to having affordable housing. We just want to make sure that this housing is, can grow and maintain, and uh, the Meridian is not a good example for them. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening, uh, Council. Robin Lockett. Um, I think it's dangerous uh, with uh, an exit, exit or an entry on 22nd, already uh, busy, backs up, and uh, there's 500 more cars, and more than that is going to be coming off of Hannah. So the area is already crowded and, and so forth, so something needs to be done with that. In regards to uh, the maintenance, 100% right. We canvassed Meridian Point, got complaints of the upkeep there, brandy wine, upkeep there. So the maintenance of, of those apartments over in the East Tampa area are not kept up very well. There, there have been complaints. We've uh, canvassed over there and we've uh, spoken with the tenants. This was within the last two years. So there is a concern in regards to the maintenance uh, issue with uh, uh, those apartments by the Richmond Group or theater owners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Pointer. Um, you know, usually I'm up here fighting against stuff. Um, but here's, here's the big picture. I went to the first meeting been to a couple meetings about this and the folks who went to the meetings the very first meeting they had concerns about the entrances and exits nothing has changed and the bottom line is you can drop down and make it smaller but if you still have an entrance and egress problem it's still an entrance and egress problem and to not look at it and think about it and say, hey, let's go back and punt and figure out a way that we can make this work for the neighborhood. Because they, they're telling you they only have two issues, the entrance and egress and the maintenance. And you know what? I'm sorry, but Richmond made that maintenance issue themselves by not being good landlords to start with. And everybody who's sitting on this council has had the experience of dealing with folks who have not had good landlords. So. We, we really have to think about those two things. Those, those two things are very curable, absolutely curable. This is not a horrific project. And the folks in the neighborhood, they're down. They're okay with it. But I think that they're asking for two safety considerations. And if we don't consider safety a number one priority for our citizens, if you, as a council, don't consider safety as number one priority, <coughs> then where are we going to be? And I'm going to tell you, this project, I've gotten more phone calls and more sauciness out of a whole bunch of people that if I started naming names, we would all be embarrassed. Honestly, there's been a lot of pushing and a lot of shoving going on about this. And I don't think that those two issues, safety one, traffic and safety to maintenance are worthy of the bullying that has gone on over this. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Kate Wells, legal department. I just want to state uh, one thing for the record. There's been a lot of discussion about a property maintenance plan that is not required as part of a rezoning application. You will oftentimes ask staff if we can add conditions to a zoning that would deal with how the establishment that will be located um, as a result of the rezoning, if, if you can monitor how that establishment will operate. That is beyond this council's purview in consideration of a rezoning application. So I just wanted to, to point that out with respect to the request for a property maintenance plan. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, there also was evidence presented about <coughs> the owner's um, management of other properties is that that's not admissible either. That is not relevant. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? If not, we go to uh, register speakers. I see we have Keela McCaskill on. If you would please raise your right hand so we can swear you in and unmute yourself. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Please state your name. 
Um, my name is Keela McCaskill, resident here in Tampa, a lifelong resident here in Tampa. And, you know, it's disappointing tonight that we come to this because I'm standing here and, and standing with the community concerning what they've expressed. And it's unfortunate because this same community is who I convinced because of my experience with Richmond. Previously, I attended a church in Richmond took over the property. I was a bit emotional about losing that church, but Richmond Group produced the signature product on that site. And, and because of that, I, you know, as a result of that product, I went on to use that. I, that was my signature property as well. And I know they don't care much about me, but I became a fan. I not only uh, advocated for that property on Grady Square, I went on to share with every single athlete and celebrated individual in the city. I mean, that was my go-to. And so I was assured that if the Richmond group is going to be on the site, we will have a quality product. Well, I will give them credit. They did me. I'll give them credit. The building came from six stories down to three. Now, I don't know if that was because it was a request from the community or they couldn't get the funding to meet that six story in the way they had it laid out. I don't know, because I don't know that they just did it for us. But I will say they did a good job of checking the box. And unfortunately, the mindset from those meetings, I walked away with feeling like we should be glad. We, sh we should be glad you put in something in East Tampa. So I was very disappointed when I found out Meridian Point was a part of Richmond because of what I witnessed the few times that I've been in the area recently. I mean, just the other day, there were three men walking from Meridian Point to the other property, walking down the street with the whole gun. Old lady had some kids. Like, it was just the middle of the day, and that's what we do at Meridian Point. But that's the indicator that there may be some issues with property management over at the Richmond property. And I know it may not be relevant for zoning, but safety, not only traffic, but safety. Their, um, the police reports that was provided from TPD on their website was ridiculous. Safety should be a concern, whether it's the street, or it's, it's in, the, in that actual property. And I'm convinced that while it's on paper as 100% affordable, the goal was the top tier, I guess 100%, 120 down to 90, whatever. I'm convinced that if you can't manage the property that's next door or the other three that's there, you're not gonna do a good job at this property either. But I believe they can. I don't want Richmond to go away because I do believe even with all of that, I still think they are an, an awesome developer and we need that type of developer on this, on this street. I hope that the city can can delay this zoning, give us an opportunity to communicate with them, especially about traffic, especially about the safety. We have that conversation and you all to make it worthwhile for them to come back because the attitude was demonstrated when Cammie said, these people, who are you talking to? Wow. These people, what does that mean exactly? That showed you that mindset. They didn't have an intention on providing a product when they came to meet with the community, check the boxes as they should and actually make a change. That didn't happen. Thank you Safety very much. It's important. Delay right. it. Thank you. Do we have Susan Morgan on the line? We do not. Okay, that concludes the uh, virtual public comment. Are there any questions or comments from council members? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to make a couple statements kind of justify where I, I'm going to be at at this. Um, we heard a lot of things from the community, and, and unfortunately most of what we heard from the community was not competent, substantial evidence. I mean, it was mostly anecdotal. The, the, tra the transportation found, found it, uh, uh, you know, that there wasn't a problem. And just because, you, you know, you indicate that there might be, it's, it's not something that we can consider. I think as, as, as Councilman Carlson asked earlier about evidence from uh, other properties that may have been developed by this and, and concerns about maintenance, it's something we can't consider. It's a, res it's a rezoning. Um, so I'm concerned about all of that. I'm also, I also, if, if, if I was the, 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 the person who made the decision there, I would have, you know, preferred to see a mixed income development here as one of the persons uh, discussed in, in, in their public testimony. I think mixed income developments are probably the way to go um, as opposed to exclusively, you know, institutionalizing people in, in, in one group. But uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, vote in favor of this. I, I heard the concerns, but again, most of that is, was not uh, competent, <coughs> substantial evidence that we as a council are able to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I have a, a question for the applicant regarding the 20% uh, reduction in the green space. The gentleman that uh, brought that up, can you go into further detail? Um, uh, Aaron, Mayor Development Coordination. Uh, the applicant 
has they they're providing 96,000 around 96,000 square feet of multifamily green space 350 square feet per unit uh, the requirement is I believe it's around 120,000 square feet they're meeting their VUA green space I will say the project is providing 25% of the parcel as green space, which is what a single family home also has to provide. Um, and so there is something about the six stories, you know, where if it's over six stories, they'd probably be providing less green space than, than what they are providing. Um, they are, they're giving all the use to use landscape buffers, which is 15 feet on most sides, I believe there is a 10 foot use to use landscape buffer. Um, and in regards to the trees, they're, they're saving all grand trees on the site. And with those use to use landscape buffers, um, they are meeting tree retention requirements of 59% of the trees on site they're preserving where the requirement is 50%. Uh, so they wouldn't need any waivers for that. And there are 31 trees that are either exempt species or dead. And those trees are Australian pines, which are exempt from the code. Um, there are a total of 100 trees on the site and they're saving, I believe it's 41 out of the 69. Okay, fair enough. And I know it's a, it was a drive-in, which is a pretty wide open parcel of land. Um, <coughs> and considering what they're putting to replace it with, I think that's a, a fair assessment that they've in, in many ways exceeding, you know, what, what they could be doing. Um, so thank you very much for the answer. Any other questions or comments from council members before we go to rebuttal? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question for um, Jonathan Scott. Yes. Uh, I am very concerned about the traffic. Like that's, um, honestly, like I, I have other concerns, but traffic is my number one, knowing that stretch of 22nd and Hillsboro and what's about to come with the Hannah City Center. There is no way that people leaving that development are gonna be able to turn left on 22nd to get to that light at Hillsboro. It's gonna take forever. It's gonna to be tons of backups. I, I'm, I'm just very concerned about that. What do you recommend? Yeah, Jonathan Scott Mobility. The applicant did provide a traffic study and their traffic engineers here. Um, they had to look at the impacts and, and mitigate those and they're allowed <coughs> to move on. Um, I understand that there will be, you know, some turns that I'd probably ask the applicant to help me uh, answer that specific movement. He might have a better answer for that uh, okay. particular one. Uh, good evening, Michael Yates with Palm Traffic. Um, so we did do a traffic study. Uh, we did look at the volumes. We actually ran the analysis in Synchro, uh, which is a modeling software that allows you to uh, look at what the queuing is that takes place at the intersection and how that will impact the operations of the driveway. And from the analysis that we did, we're able to show that with the driveway configuration that we have, it would work at an acceptable level of service. Now, I want to also show you kind of what we did from a site plan perspective. Go Before ahead. Before we move on to that, yeah. did you include in that the new 500 cars that are going to be going to Hannah City Center every single day? We did not include that as a background project. And that's, that's exactly what I'm talking I mean, we have to be able to start as we see these giant developments, include what's coming before we approve additional things. I'm very concerned about that, and I, 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 would, I, I, would, I would have preferred if you had been able to, to add to that, and I, in the future, I, I hope people start to think about those things. And traditionally, once it's approved, and that is something typically when we go through transportation review, that is something that we get requested to include in that, in the methodology. I, to my understanding, and I'm not aware of a traffic study that was done for the new center? Oh yeah, there have been multiple. I, I'm not aware of any uh, that specifically looked at the amount of traffic that will be going down 22nd and the volumes that would be at the intersection at Hillsborough and 22nd. I'm not aware of any. 
Okay. Yeah. That that's the but, part that, that. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. But that's, but let me explain yeah. what we did and why we did it, and. You can see the site plan, okay? Um, maybe zoom in a little bit. Uh-oh. <laughs> there we go. So um, we were able to get the right in, right out on Hillsboro, which helps get people out of the site, um, particularly, and then it doesn't force everyone to use 22nd. Mm -hmm. So it allows for anyone going west on Hillsboro to make that right out. Uh, it also allows for people that are going south on 22nd to come out the right and right out and get into the left turn lane on Hillsborough to go south on 22nd. So it helps alleviate, you know, a good number of the movements that would mm -hmm. have to exit 22nd if that was the sole means of access. But the other part we did is we did a boulevard entry. And so you can see this boulevard entry that we did. And so what we did is we pulled the traffic circle all the way back here. So you do not have any intervening driveways in this entire section. So if you do have cars that queue in there, that provides sufficient room for those cars to queue. And if you recall when I described Meridian Point and some of the issues on Meridian Point, that was it. They put an intervening driveway 100 feet from the stop bar, which causes operational issues. We, we purposely went through the effort of making this a boulevard and pulling that so far back <laughs> so you did not have those driveway constraints that would cause some operational issues. So this would allow for cars to queue on site. Now, okay, and you talked about a right off of Hillsboro so that people can get in the left lane to get on to to go south on 22nd you're crossing three lanes of traffic and getting into a fourth lane in a very short amount of time during rush hour agreed and, and so you will get and so you what you will get is this is this is the existing signal here at meridian point so when that runs you will get the traffic that stops on hillsborough so you will get traffic gaps in the traffic flow because of this signal operation at Meridian Point that will allow this traffic to make that right out without oncoming traffic during the PM peak hours or in AM peak hours. So you will have the opportunity to make that right out. Uh, is it gonna be constant that you can just free flow out? No, you're gonna have to stop, you're gonna have to wait for your gaps but you will get a gap because the signal is just to your east. It, from a traffic operation standpoint, this is a pretty good scenario for operation. That's why we had to fight with DOT to make sure we got that right in the right out driveway because to me, that's critical for the operation of this. So you don't have to send everyone out to 22nd. Thank you. Um, Mr. Scott, uh, when they, when, did, did your department ask them to consider Hannah, or is that something that they need to do when, when uh, uh, proposals come in front of you? Yeah, that would have probably been a good idea. When we set up a methodology meeting, that was, golly, Mike, I don't remember when that was. It, yeah. We didn't have them put that in the background, but that, you're right, though. That was probably a good thing to, to consider. To, we should try to have them do stuff like that. Yeah, okay, well, I appreciate it. The, there's no way I can support this uh, um, without that traffic study. Um, it's just, I, I know how bad it is now, and there's just no way that I see that, it, that being okay. I mean, that queue's gonna be constant, and I, um, I mean, there are other things I don't like about this project, but that's my main concern. Thank you. Councilman Vieira. Thank you very much, and I wanted to say, Councilwoman Hurtak, good, good, um, Citation of an issue after a heck of a long day. My mind is about a third slower, so so good for you. I mean that. Um, let, let me ask um, for, for purposes of that, because I, I think we all agree that we don't want to see a project like this with so many, uh, with so much affordable housing when that's something that we're putting such a big emphasis on uh, go down. Is there 
Um, and and I'm, I may be asking this to staff, is there any amended analysis that can be done to include consideration of the issues that Councilwoman Hurtak discussed? If so, how long would that take? Yeah, Jonathan, Scott Mobility. We can ask them to run some numbers between first and second reading, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and, and if I may, I mean, between first and maybe to the applicant, again, I don't want to um, uh, push anything one way or another, but would you all be willing to, uh, and, and legal staff, please let me know if I'm out of turn, um, uh, continue this a month where, where they can run those numbers? or Councilman D.R. Cami Corbett, for the record. I just want to clarify what that traffic study does and what our traffic study results in. I think Jonathan said it's from the top. What it results in is it determines our mitigation fee. That's all it does. It doesn't require additional improvements. It doesn't require us to redirect our access. It just will say, okay, do we have, should we be putting more dollars in the kitty for our proportionate share? That's all that that does. It, so that's, I mean, so from that perspective, it's not as though we're going to get a substantive improvement that comes out of that. I did also want Michael Yates to share with you an improvement we have agreed to make on 22nd that's not part of this rezoning, but will be part of a commitment in a, a, a potential funding agreement that will come to you as a separate approval. Uh, I think that's planned to come at second reading, so you'll see it at the same time, and you'll see this commitment to this 22nd, Avenue, this 22nd Street improvement. I'm, I'm going to turn it so it's north-south, maybe. There you go. I'm going to zoom back out. Uh, just hold up. Um, so, so this is 22nd down here. Or uh, Hillsborough down here. This is 22nd. This is our project driveway. This is Comanche. Um, so what we've, based on the initial discussions we had with DOT, one of the identified problems is that southbound left on Hills on 22nd, um, and you can see it. It's right here. Um, it ends right here, so it's extremely short. And so that causes some of the operational issues you see on 22nd where you get queuing that's occurring because it spills out past that left turn lane. And so what we did is we looked at extending that southbound left turn lane and to provide sufficient storage so that that could accommodate the future traffic on, Hill, on 22nd to allow that to be in a left turn lane and not queue back into the single lane going north. And then what we also did is we carried a two-way left turn lane uh, north of that. Uh, that would go up to Comanche and then taper back north of that. So that would allow the traffic that is trying to turn into Comanche or trying to turn into the project to get out of the through lane and not block the traffic. Um, so based on the projected volumes at Comanche, the projected volumes entering the site from the north that was about one car you know at a time would be in those turn lanes so it would more than sufficient to accommodate getting those cars out of the travel lane so you're not getting people stopping in the through lane waiting for someone to turn left uh, at both of those intersections so that is what we've uh, kind of worked out and committed to doing and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Councilwoman Henderson. Yes, thank you. Um, considering that um, you provided a study earlier, I think you could put it up for me regarding the reduction in parking spaces. It's about 100 um, less, or 100 more than some study that I'm not necessarily familiar with, but still about 200 less than what's required for, because you're asking for a waiver. And I'm not so sure considering that um, Hart said that they can't do anything regarding bus transportation in that area, that you can say for sure that that parking is not gonna be needed on that particular property, which presents another problem because that means that there may be more traffic than what you're actually anticipating based on a study. And if you can even compare that to the Meridian Point, um, did you do less parking there because of an affordable housing study? 
um, to develop that space. So yeah, 473, what is that, six? I can't see so that. So 623 uh, is 623. the code requirement. Um, we ran ITE parking generation, mm -hmm. which is based on actual studies of affordable housing projects and what is the parking mm -hmm. demand for those. That identified we would need 378 spaces. And then so we are providing 473. So a hundred more than what ITE says would be required. Yeah, but but 150. Yeah, but that still that study is not. It, you just said it was a study. It doesn't mean that it's correct or that it's justifiable for this particular project, it, it, including the fact that this is probably the busiest part of Hillsboro Avenue um, in terms of, you know, between Walmart, Ross, the, um, the Walgreens, everything that's over in that area, Irwin Technical Center. Um, I know that Leary um, is going to be moving out of their building, but still, that is a very high traffic area. And it may be appealing to people who want affordable housing to live there. So the parking, it may be a situation where this parking, I just don't believe that this study is justifiable enough. Um, to support the project at this time, unless you have other data. I, Did you pay for this study, by the way? No, no. This is this is from ITE, the Institute of Transportation Engineers. They do a parking generation study. So this is the fifth edition. They do parking. They collect parking studies mm -hmm. throughout the country at different land uses. Okay. So it's done by the Institute of Professional Engineers. So it's designed to be a compendium of what is actually occurring at sites throughout the country based on land use. It's yeah. nationally recognized, it's nationally accepted as a data source for what are parking requirements. I understand, but does it work? It, it is, it's yeah. accurate, that's where it comes from. It actually comes okay. from studies of actual sites okay. and what their parking demands are. And just as a sidebar, um, the hesitation from the community regarding upkeep of property, I know that does not have anything to do with the, um, you know, a vote here today, um, but I hope that Richmond is listening to the community and what their concerns are. So, because this is first reading, that you um, make every effort you can to address the community's concerns about maintenance um, of your property. Councilman Miranda, then Councilman Charles. Just a portion, and I, th I think sometimes in reverse. If this was not affordable housing, would the parking ratio be the same? Uh, it would probably be a little different. Um, I don't think it would be substantially different, but it would probably be a little more. And, and the reason I ask that, knowing how things operate, when you're giving an opportunity like this to have something and you start getting better, some of those kids are five and six and eight, nine, ten years, ten years from now, they're going to drive a car. And what you did today on the parking ratio is fine today, but it's going to be like that ten years from now. Because as you want to give an uplift to get better and do things better and move faster to society and have an opportunity to grow like society like everyone else, and I appreciate that very much coming from public housing. But I'm not too sure that your numbers will be even close to what they are today. Because I remember when we were all living in public housing, we wanted to get a job and we wanted to drive a car. And that hasn't changed. I understand that everybody's riding a bicycle. And everybody's walking. But I go up at Plain High School, Jefferson, and Hillsborough, and I don't see one empty spot in their, in their parking garage, parking areas. And I'm not trying to put that on you, sir. No, and, and, and I mean, I, I, I would have the, I would have the exact same concern if we were right at that number of ITE. Okay. If we were exactly at that 373 and we were right at that number, we're providing 100 more spaces than that number. So we have that buffer in there for that exact reason. But your point is well made. I understand, because you can't go back. Once it's done, it's done. Correct. Council Member Carlson. Yeah, I have three three questions. One, just following up on that, if it was not affordable housing, what would the ITE numbers be? I, to be honest, I didn't run it to find out. Is it is it anywhere close to what you all are proposing, or do you think? Yeah, I, I I would say it's slightly higher than what. So it would probably be a number that is between what we're propose what ITE for affordable housing has and what the parking rate that we're providing. Um, 
just staff, you, you all don't have to jump up, but does anybody on staff have a, a parking study that, that contradicts anything, any of the testimony that's been given, or does anyone on staff have a transportation study that contradicts anything that has just been said? And, and in particular, to the Hannah Avenue issue, we were speculating, but does anybody have any competent substantial evidence that refutes or contradicts um, what the applicant has said? Jonathan Scott, transportation. I, we didn't have a problem with the uh, parking waiver. The, the, the data that he provided does based on ITE, which is like a national accepted uh, standard and so forth. Um, but we didn't like compare any of that uh, in our analysis. So you, do you all just use the ITE system and compare those numbers or you just look at it and um, we just look at our code typically <coughs> and we're looking at uh, and then what about the things? traffic um, that does on a project like this does transportation do an independent study to evaluate whether their studies are valid or how do you how do you determine that when we do traffic studies we, we base it off the IT trip generation numbers which is what we would go by and, and mm -hmm. on, on standard projects you said that um, the Hannah you did not require the Hannah <laughs> Avenue uh, City Center numbers to be used but it it seems like on other projects you all have required um uh, yeah i just checked uh the the notes you might might have forgot but we did have them include that in the background so it is included it is included in the background mike might have just forgotten but it was uh i double checked it was. and is there anything from their study then that would show you that this that there is or any transportation <laughs> problems um well the study would in, would show like all the uh impacts to the area and they're allowed to provide a mitigation to move on but um no but from your analysis from uh, your analysis i'm asking for staff testimony from your analysis was there any any red flag there that um that confirms or contradicts what the community has said about their concerns with them um, the the traffic study did look at impacts to the area but uh, the, the individual movements and stuff there there will be some <laughs> Concerns, but the, the the changes that they're going to make are going to be, I think, a a good uh, like this things that Ca Council Member Hertek said about going across the lanes. Was did you all have any conclusions or concerns in looking at their data? That 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 uh, what I'm looking for is there's there's been um, testimony presented. I'm just trying to see is there any data that backs that up? Um, uh, in in your analysis, did you did you confirm or deny any of those? Um, concerns that the community had about transportation? Uh, not those specifically, but we, we looked at the analysis as a whole and had uh, uh, found that it met our, con our requirements, so to say. But how do you know that? Based on our mitigation procedures manual. They but do you, how do you validate if their numbers are correct and, and, what, and how do you determine what, whether there are any concerns? We base it out on the IT <laughs> generation and then we, we look at the synchro analysis that they did and the impacts to the area. Um, could I ask Ms. Um, <laughs> Ms. Uh, Wells, yeah. <laughs> could I ask you please? I just wanna make sure we have a strong record. Considering there's been lots of testimony presented, neighborhoods have, neighborhood leaders have presented testimony. Um, uh, there's been some testimony by staff, some testimony by the applicant. What, what if, um, the applicant's representative said that all of the transportation is only relevant as to the, um, sorry, it's been a long day, the, uh, the, um, the impact fees. Is there any, anything from transportation that would in fact impact our, anything of this testimony about transportation that would impact our decision about zoning? In your staff report, it identifies the sections of the code that are applicable in your review of a site plan controlled zoning district, which is what they're requesting today. So when you look at section 27-136, it's the purpose of a site plan controlled zoning district. And there are <coughs> nine different criteria that you would apply in this situation and then you also have to look at the criteria that would apply to the waivers that they're requesting so <clears throat> council has to consider the totality of the evidence that you've heard today as well as the staff reports 
um, and other information provided by the applicant and members of the public and look at how that information in its totality then applies to the criteria in the code. All right, thank you. Councilman Moran and then Councilman uh, I, 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 Again, I'm, I'm back on the traffic. If I may ask, uh, do you know what the traffic count is on Hill Drive Avenue and 22nd Street versus the one on, on Hill Drive Avenue and uh, Del Mabry? Um, Jonathan Scott, Mobility. Uh, let me get that. Uh, should be in the. Uh, While well, he's getting that, too, I just wanted to show you that. They did have uh, vested the hand of building in the background. They can provide that overhead. Can we see figure six? Figure seven. Figure seven. But it doesn't say the amount. It doesn't say the amount. It just says. <coughs> so, Commissioner Miranda, uh, to answer your question, these are the counts on uh, Hillsborough Avenue at 22nd. So, you got uh, 1,200, 1,300 eastbound, and then about 1,600, 1,700 westbound. Per day? Uh, no, that is the AM and PM peak hours. Okay. Wow. on a six lane divided roadway. So it's well under capacity of the roadway. So the capacity of the roadway is about 3,500, I think, from a capacity. So if that's true, then that means that the 22nd street traffic is 202 going north and 250 going south? That that's is, that's there's no way that is only the through traffic so you also have through. the lefts and the rights yeah those but are still, actual data counts that that's 364 for now going left or straight during peak hours yes those are counts actual counts done by an independent traffic company with video data collection but during school times yeah. and adjusted to peak season. Yes, but does that include the 500 cars from Hannah Street? So this figure does not. The, it, the question was about existing traffic. Okay. What is the existing traffic? We here's it, the, and, uh, here's that. and so my apologies. We did include the Hannah City project traffic. This includes the and this is the background plus project traffic, including the Hannah C City project. Holy cow. So you're going up to 500 straight or left. So if you're up here, this is the through traffic. This is the southbound through, and then this is the northbound through. No, you're, I'm looking at 22nd, not at the driveway. <clears throat> yes, this is, this is the through traffic right here, this number. Yeah. That is that the, for, that's 496. 40. Wow. That's a huge jump. So the capacity of the road, again, you are significantly below the capacity of the road. A two-lane undivided roadway has a capacity of 1,300 cars up to, you know, somewhere around 1,800 cars <laughs> in a peak hour. So you are well below the capacity of the road. So is that is that number on the top that. 462? Is that the existing traffic? Yeah, that's the. So that's we're only going from 462 to 469 Four. as a projection. Yeah, that's a peak. That's in the morning, and then okay. that's southbound in the morning, and then the PM goes from 415 to 469. And that's with Hannah's. So they're not anticipating that much of an increase. Well, because it's going south. Too. Correct, it's going south. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had a question. If you could put that new design of 22nd Street up. Uh, so I, I see how you extended the left turn lane, but that crosshatched area just north of that, what is that going to look like? Is that going to be paint? With cross hatches, or is that going to be concrete? No, further down, just north, 
There you go. What's that going to look like? It's intended to be painted. Yeah, that's not going to work because it's not people. I mean, this city, people in this city use that as a lane. <coughs> they just do. So you're going to have to have that be a concrete piece if you actually want people to not use it and to use it as a divider. Otherwise, people are going to be stuck in that to turn left. Yeah. And then the people won't be able to get out. So and we're happy to go through. This is just a sketch to show okay. conceptually what it would look like. We would still okay. need to go through design, permitting. You know, your transportation staff would review the design. Those are things that could be required during the review of that design. OK, thank you. I appreciate it. And I have a couple more questions for, um, I guess, Ms. Corbett. Uh, I heard concerns from the community that East Tampa doesn't want to be the place where all affordable housing goes. Mm -hmm. I do not disagree with them. We just had a great, robust conversation today in our CRA uh, workshop about how we share the wealth mm -hmm. with affordable housing. Was it ever a con consideration to put mixed-use housing there? Yeah. I can ask Mr. Fabry to address that as well, but we are considering this a mixed community. We are have the mix of incomes with the 80 to one, the commitment to do 60%, 80 to 120, and then the rest 50 to 80. So we do consider this to be a mixed use com community. And Mr. Fabry will tell you that 120% of the median income and those rents line up pretty squarely with what market rent is today. And if you, you want to answer. Yeah. Then I don't know why it was called an affordable housing if you don't thing. If that's right. the case, I mean, I, that's fine, but uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Todd Fabry with the Richmond Group. I was sworn in. I am a representative of the owner, and thank you for your question. Thank you all. I know it's been a long night, so I appreciate your efforts. Um, by definition, anything less than 120% AMI is considered affordable housing by the state of Florida, mm -hmm. and I believe by the city of McKinley as well. Um, <clears throat> having said that, 40% your typical affordable housing development would have 100% of the units at or below 60% of the mm -hmm. area median income. In this particular case, what we are proposing is 40% of those of the total units would be that mm -hmm. typical affordable income range. And 60%, which is the majority of the units, would be, as Cami expressed, 80 to 120. So that's, in my, you know, in reality, that's really mixed income, is, is what I would call that. Because the 80 to 120 is really what people sometimes refer to as attainable housing or the missing middle is a new term that a lot of people are using. Um, so. To answer your question, this really is a mixed income, uh, even though by definition it's considered. Would, would you consider um, even bumping it up to 140? Uh, of course, yeah. And we, that we, way, because there's also, we, we are also battling the stigma of affordable housing. We, whereas when we have a mixed use development, that seems to be more I'm, in line. And that's what I hear the community asking for is not limiting incomes so to draw people because when you draw people of that make more money that's what's bringing the grocery stores they want the restaurants they want things like that and, and commissioner uh, as a as the rich our philosophy we believe in the mixed income so i have no i believe what you're saying is is true so we have no argument from us about that so. i mean you can keep the percentages because we definitely need affordable housing but the mixed rate component i think um, market rate or 140 at least is something I would be interested in. Um, I understand that you worked with the community on lowering density and you know uh, I respect neighborhoods but this is a major corridor. I don't think this is enough density in this space. I'm disappointed by the amount of density. Um, I think that there was a way when you started with a six story project and dropped it to three stories that there's a middle ground there with maybe six stories toward Hillsborough and four or three stories toward the back. I'm, I'm disappointed with, we, we need housing so badly that I'm disappointed that you literally went in half 
um, and that you didn't fight the neighborhood more on that. I, I mean, no, don't shake your head at that because we need housing on major corridors. Um, that's the place to put it. And I'm not saying a 12-story structure, but we have seen very successfully people start with higher, closer to Hillsborough, and then build down as they get toward a neighborhood. Um, so I'm really disappointed. I would have liked to have seen more density. I feel like we're leaving a lot on the table here. And that's why I, I just, I can't support this because I expect more. We need more. We need more housing. If I could just speak to that real quickly. Obviously we, we uh, worked with the community and we were doing that in, in very good faith, despite what some people say, we were doing that in good faith and we listened to what they were saying. And so one of the major issues was the density, the height, and the amount of traffic, as you all are pointing out tonight, and, and parking. And so doing that, adding a lot of more density, you know, would require structured parking, which is extremely expensive and not financially feasible. So I understand your comment, but we were, you know, we're trying to have something that fits into the community, fits into the neighborhood, and, and hopefully that, that, you know, the surrounding residents can be, uh, you know, can live with and be happy with, and, and so that's why we did what we did. Um, but I understand your comment, and I appreciate it. Thank you very if, much. Thank you. Yes, sir. and can I briefly just, I want to just touch on a few of the other, and I'll do it very quickly. Will this be part of the rebuttal, or? Yeah, it's part of the rebuttal. All right, we'll yes, begin the please. rebuttal. Then. Okay, very thank good. you. Uh, just a little bit, the Richmond Group, we, a couple things to address. Um, we've been developing uh, affordable, uh, all types of multifamily housing, affordable, mixed income, luxury rental, for the last 20 plus years in the Tampa Bay area and throughout the state of Florida and other places as well. Um, the issue of safety and uh, is something that's, you know, very important to us. We, we are not your merchant style builder where you build it, you lease it up and sell it to somebody and you're on to the next project. We're long-term holders of all of our properties. We sell very, very few properties and that's been the case throughout the Tampa Bay area as well. Um, so having a safe community is very important to us. Um, when we met with the community and I was hearing these things, I, I went and said, I wanna sit down with the city a police department with the folks who actually patrol this area and hear from them. Is there a problem? It, you know, if, we, if there's things we can be doing differently, we wanna do them. Obviously, we wanna protect our investment as well as have safe environment for folks that live in our communities. Um, so we did that and I asked the question very directly and honestly, the answer I got back was no, there's nothing unusual about your property that would you know st stand out or stick out and I said, Okay, having said that, we still want to work very closely with the city police department with our new development. So we've offered a number of things. Actually, the city uh, officers that we met with had suggested three or four things that we can do, and we've agreed to all of them. And so we will be doing those things, and I think that will have a major uh, you know, impact to the community and the safety around us. Um, so it's very important to us as a company as well as the maintenance and the preservation of our properties and, and you know, our investments and also wanting to have the, the property look its best. Meridian Point was a property that was almost 20 years old. Uh, there were capital improvements that needed to be made. We've made those in capital improvements recent uh, over the last year. Um, we've spent uh, a, a large sum of money doing that um, with those major capital improvement uh, projects. So. I just want to address that that is important to us. We're committed on this project. Obviously, we are going to be putting a significant investment into this project as well. So we're committed to, to maintaining it uh, and preserving it and making it a very safe community and hopefully bettering uh, the surrounding area. Thank you very much. Ms. Thank Corbin, you all you for your time. Else? Appreciate it. No, I, that's it for me. Yeah, yeah. Cammie, you can finish. Um, I just do want to add a couple of pieces of evidence into the record. Um, one is an email. Uh, from Hart basically indicating that the bus pullout wasn't feasible and it was a recommendation that we 
uh, have the bus stop placed by FDOT standards and we're working with that. So we are providing the bus stop so we didn't completely neglect um, the, the heart or tra public transit issues. And again, I just want to bring you back. We are in a rezoning hearing. There's lots of different issues, lots of collateral issues. And the fundamental question is, has the applicant met its burden to provide substantial competent evidence that the proposed development is consistent with the land development uh, code and the comprehensive plan? You have staff reports in the record, expert planning testimony, or tes both testimony and evidence in the record saying that we have met our burden. And I don't think any of the concerns that you heard from the residents constitute co substantial competent evidence to say we did not meet our burden. We met our traffic mitigation requirements. We are agreeing to do an above and beyond transportation uh, improvement. Many of the waivers, with the exception of the waiver for the 10-foot wall, they're approvable. They're at a level that are approvable through either a design exception or administrative variance, but we're still here in the PD process because we committed to be, and one of the commitments we made was that 10-foot wall. And so we're here, we're in, here in good faith, and we would respectfully request your approval. Thank you very much. Can I get a motion to close? So move. Motion to close from Councilman Mayor, second. second from Councilman Moran. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, what's the pleasure of council? Would anybody like to read this or make a motion? I'll, I'll read it. A councilman? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You want to read it? Go ahead. Item number seven. Yes, ma'am. File number REZ22113, ordinance being presented for first reading consideration. An ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 2302 East Hillsborough Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification CI commercial intensive to PD planned development residential multifamily retail sales, specialty goods, personal services, business professional, providing an effective service. Second. We have a motion from Councilwoman Henderson, second from Councilwoman Miranda. Roll call well, discussion, yes ma'am. Um, yes, and I, I've already said I'm not supporting this project. I'm not supporting it for many, many reasons, but the biggest one is it's a huge parcel of land and we are not, not using it to the um, uh, capacity it needs to be. And that's, that's a huge one. The traffic is something that I truly believe we can work through. But if we're, if we're gonna put suburban development in an urban core area, then we should have suburban style parking. So you either, you get one or the other. You either build urban and have less parking or you build suburban and you have enough parking. Um, I'm disappointed with the suburban design in an urban area. So I'll vote no. All right, roll call. Miera? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? No. Hertek? No. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Motion passes with Carlson, Hertek voting no. Second reading <clears throat> and adoption will be held on July 13th, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. Held at Old City Hall, 315 East Kennedy Boulevard, Tampa, Florida, 33602. Thank you. We're moving on to item number eight. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Agenda item number eight, case REZ 23-21. This is for the location 3102 West Coachman Avenue, proposed rezoning from RS50 to PD residential single family detached. We'll now pass along to our planning commission. Thank you. Emily Phelan, planning commission staff. The subject site is located within the South Tampa Planning District in the Bay Shore beautiful neighborhood. The site is not within proximity of transit. Ballast Point Park is the closest recreational facility located one mile southeast of the subject site, and the site is located within evacuation zone A and the coastal high hazard area. This is an aerial of the subject site. It's outlined here in purple. Um, it's in the interior of an already established single family detached neighborhood, single family detached residences, surround the subject site and they characterize the portion of West Poachman Avenue between South Mound Avenue and South McDill Avenue. 
The subject site is here, represented by the residential 10 future land use designation. And as you can see from the map, the site is surrounded by residential 10. The request would allow for two single family detached residential units at an overall density of eight units per acre. This portion of West Coachman, Coachman Avenue between South Mount Avenue and South McDill Avenue, excluding the subject site, has an existing density of 5.88 units per acre based on 16 sample sites. This portion of West Coachman Avenue has been developed <coughs> at approximately 59% of the density anticipated in this area of the city. The subject site can currently be considered underutilized and an increase in the number of dwelling units is consistent with the policy direction of the comprehensive plan to provide an adequate supply of housing for Tampa's growing population. Additionally, the request would allow for a development similar in form, height, and scale to the surrounding residential uses on this portion of West Coachman Avenue. The PD is comparable and compatible with the development pattern and is consistent with the long-range development pattern encouraged under the Residential 10 Future Land Use Designation. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? Nope. Mr. Hussein? Zain Hussein, Development Coordination. I'll go ahead and share the aerial view of the property. As you see the property right here outlined in red, uh, surrounding the property are uh, all zoned RS60 and they're all residential single family detached uses. To the north, you'll see, let me zoom out a little bit. You have a uh, West Line Avenue. To the east, running north and south, you'll have South McDill Avenue. To the south, you'll have West O'Keller Avenue and West Villa Rosa Street. Uh, and to the west here, you'll have South um, Ferdinand Avenue. The proposed development is to allow for two residential single family detached units. The site is currently uh, vacant at this time, as uh, there was a residential single family home and has been demolished. Uh, the maximum building height is 40 feet, as I will show you the site plan to come. As you see the site here at that intersection, South McDill, right north and south, and West Coachman, running east to west here. You have the two lots. Uh, lot one is for 5,433 square feet. Lot two is for 500, I'm sorry, 5,440 square feet. Uh, the vehicular access for lots one and two comes off of West Coachman, as you see the entrance into the garage. Uh, on lot one and also on lot two. The subject site contains a, a total of approximately 10,873 square feet or 0.25 acres. A total of four parking spaces are required and the applicant is meeting those four parking spaces with two car garages in both uh, lots. I will now show you the elevations provided by the applicant. As you see the elevation to the east, the elevation to the south, the elevation to the west, and the elevation to the north. I will now show you the, uh, the pictures that I went on the site. As you see, the site as is vacant. Another picture of the site, vacant with trees. To the east, this is uh, South McDill, running north and south. And a residential single family detached across the street.
Again, at the intersection here was Coachman and South McDill, right north and south, South McDill, residential single family detached in the surrounding area. Looking west here, you have a vacant lot. Um, the next case will have a proposed rezoning on that. Oh, 21 and 22 are not together? No. No. And on the opposite side of that vacant lot is residen residential single family detached. And directly north, you will see residential single family detached. There it is. I will show you the site plan one more time. Now, the applicant is requesting one waiver, and that's to remove two non-hazardous Grand Live Oaks. I have Aaron here from Natural Resources who will speak more on that. Development Review and Compliance staff has reviewed the application and finds the request to be inconsistent with the Land Development Code. Should it be the, uh, this is due to the findings from Natural Resources, as Aaron will speak on. Should it be the pleasure of City Council to approve the application, the applicant must provide revisions to the revision sheet between first and second reading. I'm here for any questions. Yes. Uh, normally with this type of um, rezoning, you provide us with the quarter mile around the different The control map? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, in this case, the lot meets the 50 foot width. It's 59, about 60 feet in width. So uh, it was not required. As you see, 59.97 on the um, okay. side line. Great question. So is that, is that a standard size lot by 90 by, 90 by 59 or 60 by 90? So uh, this lot here uh, does not meet the uh, standards and needs of PD due to those trees on site. That need to be removed but it with that with if the trees weren't there this is a buildable lot with that we never see it correct 5,000 square feet is the minimum required regardless of the width and length correct the, the width meets it and the length is correct yeah minimum width is required and meets the minimum width of 50 feet the minimum width is required to be 50 feet and it meets that being almost 60 feet and there's no minimum depth no. Oh. That's the that. Okay. Council LaShawn Dock Development Coordination. So just to talk for a moment about the conforming map that you're referring to, um, Councilwoman Hertek. So the conforming map is um, generally provided when a request is made to create a lot that would create a width that is smaller than the underlying zoning, than what is required. So in this case, the underlying zoning was the RS-50, and the lot width meets that minimum requirement. The only thing is if they don't have the depth of the lot area, or in this particular case, there's the tree removal that requires the waiver. So that's why this is a PD before you. But if it meets that minimum lot width requirement, then we do not provide the conforming map. The analysis within the conforming map that is usually provided for you that goes along with that conforming map always gives you that comparison of the lot frontages, the lot width. Okay, thank you. Aaron Mayor Development Coordination. Don't be confused by this. This is just the original submission. 
So when the applicant had originally submitted, they showed every tree on site being removed, except for this D9 Grand Laurel Oak that's right on the property line. So, you know, Natural Resources expressed our concerns as to, um, you know, what we wanted to see additional trees preserved on site because um, there are three non-hazardous grand trees on the site. Now let me show you what the applicant then did. So here I just want to point out the circles with the red X's in them are the proposed non-hazardous grand trees that are being removed. The green circles are proposed non-hazardous grand trees that are being retained. The one little X here is a proposed hazardous grand removal. And the triangles down here at the bottom are the proposed <coughs> retained trees that are either specimen or protected trees. Um, and to orient you, Coachman's to the north, McDill is to the east. Uh, the applicant had then came back to us and they preserved, you know, the, the best grand tree on the site, which is tree 88. And you can see that's this tree right here. It has a green star on it. It's a 32 inch DBH live oak. It's worth 23 mitigation trees. Um, it's very upright, so it will require some minimal pruning. Uh, the project has also notched out the second floor of the building to provide the protective radius to 20 feet. Um, it still will require minor pruning. Um, that said, there are you know, these other grand trees here on the site that are these two, number 98 and number 89, are non-hazardous grand live oaks that require waivers to be removed. Um, and you can see here, the location of these trees are, you know, quite problematic if you're gonna develop two homes on these lots. Um, this one's smack in the center of the site this one here, they provided reasonable reconfiguration. However, it would move the house almost to the back property line, and then you would have to have the garage off McDill, which I don't know if anyone would even support that configuration of a site and that access um, onto the lot. And then the other one, if you move the driveway to the corner, there's a corner clearance issue, which is also problematic. So natural resources um, was overall inconsistent just due to, to the fact of the two non-hazardous grand tree waivers. And then the applicant did also save those three trees back here. These are three live oaks. Sorry, it's not the best photo, but these three stars are remaining, tree 93, 94, and 95. Um, someone may bring up that number 93 is D6 rated. That's because it was pruned for Tico, so it was essentially a topped tree, um, which is not an ideal you know, situation for a tree. However, the tree does arch out towards, more towards the street there. Um, and it's in the very far southeastern corner of the site. So, and it's being, it's, that tree is being buffered by these two trees like in front of it. 96 and 97 would have to be removed because the protective radius cannot be provided. Um, but the applicant has worked with us on saving additional trees. However, we still would have liked to see more grand tree safe, but it's it's a very tight site. And then I'm here if you have any questions. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, it's not a tight site, though, if it stays one site. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm asking, like, if right now you could build a house and not have to take down any of these grand trees. Um, right, I mean, though, I believe what they're doing is going to what's platted in the lot in the area. And so um, I believe the lot's platted in that manner. So it is platted as two lots, correct? Okay, I don't need to speak to that, but <laughs> thanks. <laughs> This one? Yeah. <laughs> it's 
the site plan. Right. Yeah, the applicant. Plan? I have it. Okay. I have it. Um, good evening, Council. Steve McElhaney. I've been sworn. Uh, these are two, two platted lots, and by right, you could build two houses here. Um, the reason we're in front of you is to request the uh, ability to remove the two, the two grand trees. Um, we, as Aaron, Aaron pointed out, we've worked very closely with, with her and the city staff for several weeks in trying to figure out. Do I need to move that up some? And try to figure out how we can we can save um, additional trees. And what we came back with was there. Are, there are. Hold on a second here. This, this cluster of three oak trees are right back here. The other trees that Aaron showed you, one's in the middle of a lot and one's here where you can't meet the protective radius. And uh, the rest of the staff comments, including the, uh, the planning commission as well as the city staff, are, are consistent. We, but no one felt comfortable coming forward with, with a, a consistency finding without you all weighing in on what can you do. Um, these, all these lots are, are the entire subdivision. <coughs> and there's, there's four, well, I don't want to talk about the other property yet, but all of these, these properties are 50 by uh, except for these two corner ones, they're 50 by 90.7 feet, the entire subdivision. And I'll, I'll show you the subdivision map is, is here. <coughs> and the development pattern matches that same, uh, the same <coughs> development. All of the homes to the south are on 50-foot lots, and they're only 90 feet wide. The aerial photograph... I don't, know if you, I don't know how well you can see that, but um, the dominant development pattern is 50 by 90, this entire subdivision. We've been before you previously on these 90-foot lots. I'm not sure how and why they got developed that way, but, but they don't meet the code. The zoning is, um, is RS-50, and we're fortunate that these two lots on the, on the corner are 60 by 90. Otherwise, it would be another non-conforming lot. So anyway, we worked with the staff, and um, we came up with a configuration that saves the larger cluster of, of oak trees here. And then we we moved this one back so that uh, we preserve that grand oak that that Aaron said was a specimen oak. We've reduced the setbacks so that they are 10 feet in the front and 15 feet in the rear, but we only did that to, to accommodate the trees. Um, the remaining development in the area is, is pretty consistent. Uh, like I said, we're not, we're not trying to, to jam something in here. This is the, probably the, the best design that we could come up with that preserves the oaks on the site. And I, as I said, but for the fact that we had to deal with the trees, these lots are buildable. Um, I can go through the rest of the criteria if you like and with the, uh, the Planning Commission report showing consistency and reference that <clears throat> the site is, is compatible. Uh, this is under 27136. The site is compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. It's an appropriate application and proposes to incorporate single family residential into an area that's predominantly single family residential. It encourages flexible land use. Yeah, this is not introducing a new land use. This is a single family residential lot and it's being proposed to be single family. Promote and encourage development where appropriate in a location. Um, this is an appropriate location for single family residential. And um, 
it, uh, it, it, it mirrors all of the detached uses that are located around it. Promoting the more desirable living, um, the application seeks to allow the two single family detached units and is requesting one waiver and that's for the trees only. All of the other code requirements will be met. The elevations submitted are complementary to the surrounding area. The site is occupied uh, or was occupied by a residential structure that was demolished. The waivers, the design of the proposed development is unique and therefore in need of a waiver. We've demonstrated to you that we are saving more oak trees than we're removing uh, by square, by uh, inch, caliper inches, and also the number of trees. Uh, it's unfortunate that we can't save the other two, but they are literally in the middle of the lot. It does not substantially interfere with the rights of others. Um, there aren't any other properties that are impacted by this. Those trees are wholly contained within our property. And uh, we think that we've done a, a good job at trying to uh, weave a footprint around that. <clears throat> With respect to allowing the waiver, substantial justice being done, we believe that uh, we've met that criteria. We, we proposed three additional designs, um, none of which saved those two oak trees. Generally, when you come in for a waiver for a grand tree removal, you're required to provide three alternate site plans that show that you're trying to mitigate um, the removal of those trees. Uh, we did that, and we discussed that with, uh, with natural resources, and none of those designs saved those two trees. Yes, sir, uh, Mr. Hussein. I have to interject here. Uh, Steve, the uh, site plan you have is, if approved in first reading, this was the change you can make between first and second reading. But as per this uh, request, let's do it off of the site plan that is going to first reading. So if you want to present this one instead. That's not the correct one. That's, that's the one for this case hearing until you make changes. Okay. We're not requesting this. However, we would be making the change between first and second reading should council approve our request. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, Does this maybe, one that's on the screen that Mr. Hussein ha handed you still protect the three trees in the back? No, it doesn't. The, Mr. That Chairman. Was, that was the original submitted site plan um, that we revised continually with, with staff, and this was the latest site plan that we came up with. This is the one that we would be requesting ultimately to be approved between first and second reading. And this and this is the cluster of trees that we were protecting under that revised plan. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Uh, the, the site plan provided to council and that I presented on is a site plan that was submitted by the submittal date of 420. 2023. The applicant is providing a site plan that was provided after the fact of the uh, needed deadline for site plans. So if approved, uh, the applicant can make those changes between first and second reading. But I just want for the record to be clear that the site plan that needs to reflect off of this staff report and off of this uh, presentation is the, the one on the screen as is. May, may, I, may I just inquire? Go ahead. Go, ahead. Go ahead. Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney, through the chair. I'm inquiring as to the site plan that's been provided to council that was available to them in the conference room and which I've placed on the dais for their review. May I show it to you and just you tell me is it which, because it looks similar to what's on what was, what was previously provided to on Mr. Michelini's overhead. May I provide this to Mr. Hussein? Take a look at it, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you. Can you just take a look at the site plan and locate when it was dated and on what did you base and what did you base your report on? It's, a, it's an undated site plan.
Right. Is that, are site plans not supposed to be dated? They don't need to be dated. So the question, Mr. Hussain, then, is if you can, what, which site plan is being discussed and presented to council? Mr. McAleen, you, you would know this. This is the one. Yeah. So the one is, the, the one is, what is this thing? Correct. So you can see, you know, he just did that. That wasn't the one that was presented to council, was it? That's yeah. the one. Yeah, that's exactly correct. So the, the site plan provided to council via email as, per, as a presentation is a this site plan here prov provided by uh, Steve and his team on April 20th. This is the site plan that reflects this case and this presentation today. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma do we have a do we have a staff report that reflects the changes? Yeah. No. This, this is the second one tonight where we've had a, com a site plan that is promised to be changed between first and second reading. And what I'm gonna tell you is that if we start approving these, the second reading is gonna have to be a full reading because I can't approve something that I don't see the actual change to. And I'm very uncomfortable with looking at a site plan that is not gonna, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with, min, with small changes, but when you change an entire, I mean, both of those house site plans are gonna be totally different. I'm uncomfortable with approving a site plan that I can't see and I don't have a staff report that matches because that's Correct. what I was prepared for. Correct. Yeah. So uh, to answer that, uh, the applicant will provide a site plan. It goes through DRC, Development Review Committee, where uh, a panel of different departments review the application with the applicant uh, stating you need to fix A, B, C, and D. We redline it, we mark it up, we provide it to the applicant. The applicant then, about 30 days later, provides a final site plan that goes to council, which is the site plan as is in front of you, um, which was provided on April 20th. If the applicant needs to make additional changes, that's, with it, that's written within the staff report on the revision sheet, and that's also discussed with the applicant. Now, if the applicant sees that staff report or needed revisions prior, and he provides a, a new site plan, that site plan is not recognized or reviewed until after it's uh, approved the first hearing. Councilman Clendon and Councilman Carlson. Uh, Mr. Michelini, uh, can I suggest or, or should I make a motion that you continue this uh, for first reading at, at another date? I just, I just asked him to say good. I, I, I don't have any objection to continue it to get additional information from the staff. That, what I just conferred with Aaron about was her, re her report regarding the removal of the two grand trees won't, won't change regardless of which site plan you're looking at. It will save additional trees that were shown to be removed, but as, a, as I said, I, I don't have any objection to continuing the case. Yes, Councilman Carlson. Zane, I, uh, or maybe some other staff member, I, when when we make changes between first and second reading, usually it's small, minor changes. I've never, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't remember any that, that was a complete redesign uh, between first and second reading. Is that, is that a normal thing? suggestion to continue this. Correct. If the applicant needs to make uh, massive changes, substantial changes, <laughs> then we say, hey, staff, or hey, applicant, you need to go through DRC again. Uh, this being a minor modification to site plan, which has about one department really reviewing it. Do you think this is a minor modification? Uh, for natural resources, it will be need to be reviewed, correct. Can 8 and 9 be together or 21, 22? Can it, be, <clears throat> it can't be one item? No, no you have no, to read them separately. separately. It's separate no. properties. Yeah. Separate. They're just right next to each other. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I see. As I said, I mean, council, isn't, there, isn't there a process by which um, if applicant, I, to me, this, these are more substantial changes. Isn't there a, a process by which the, the staff can Thanks. get the applicant to go back and change it before it comes up for first reading so we don't end up like this? The difficulties that we run into, Councilman, 
it, is the, are the time limits and the staff review time, <laughs> and and it's not the the staff's fault. It, by you know by code, you have certain time limits to submit things. We continued working on the site plan with staff because we recognized that there was an issue regarding saving trees, and it's unfortunate that we we couldn't hit the deadlines that are provided for in the code. Um, as I said, I, I have no objection whatsoever to continuing the case so you can get a full staff report uh, and come back to you with, with their analysis. I'd like to make a motion to continue um, REZ 2321 to somebody help me with the date. Don't do July 13th. No, no that's a day meeting. That's then you say saying development coordination. Later date. We have an evening meeting at rezoning is um, we have we have a lot of rezonings on July 20th. If not, it would be August 17th. Uh, and don't forget, we have to take public comment as they can turn it. I know, I know, I, I know, I know. I s believe me, I know. Um, well, if we continue, do we have to do that? If we continue to the next one, August 17th would be the. Yeah, it's only speak to the continuance. Is August 17th an acceptable date for staff? Is August 17th? Yeah. Fine. Does it okay. work for staff? August 17th is set. Uh, we have not set cases yet for August 17th, but uh, we can keep this in mind. And this will be a continued case going forward if approved. And we can put it first on the agenda because people have been waiting here and, you know. All so. right. So we have a motion from Councilman Clendenin to. Uh, continue item number eight, REZ 2321, to August 17th at 5.01 p.m. at the City Hall and City of Tampa. That's just for the clerk okay. to do. You don't uh, have to do that. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Um, should I take public comment before we take the Yes, vote? but before we have that date, I just want to be clear that with the staff, August 27th, uh, August 17th. Um, August 17th takes into account because, for instance, council has a, a pretty much a standing uh, policy, no more than 13 uh, hearings in the evening. Tonight we have 15. So you went over, and the question is... Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm watching the calendar to make sure we don't do that because I see we have 10 and then a continued TACPA, which is minor, on July 20th. So July 20th is already... Full. Right, yeah, and, yeah, and August 17th, 17th hasn't been but set yet. No, but, but we're getting in, in early. It's only showing one. Right, but in land development coordination, when they plan these things ahead, they do set aside the time that the hearing is scheduled for. So I just want to make sure that we're not over the 13th. Cor you be correct. Thank you, saying development coordination. You have 10 set cases, <coughs> and you have up to three continued cases per hearing. So this could fit on July 20th. Um, if yourselves and uh, the applicant want the August date, that can also go forward that day. Well, let's look. I have the, the, the council, motion in a second, but I want to get public comments. Also, council, if I may, LaShawn Doc Development Coordination, keep in mind that tonight's agenda has this number of items because there were circumstances to where there were at least three cases which were continued to tonight. Yes, it wasn't true. due to scheduling or the continuance. It was so unusual. That's why. I want, that's why I just want to be yes. clear moving forward that we're keeping track of that. So we're we not, are. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. That's all I'm asking. Okay. August it was probably better than jamming up your July calendar. Okay, thank you. We're going to go to public comment on the continuance only. Hi, my name is Caroline Bennett. Please do not approve this continuance. Um, the, grant, the problem with the trees was not foreseeable. Those trees are 80 years old. There's eight people who've been sitting here for hours. We're ready to go. We're not flying by the seat of our pants and doing things at the last minute. We're ready to go. This is ridiculous. It's inconveniencing people. There's someone online. Do not approve this continuance. This problem was imminently foreseeable. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Pointer. Um, I, I'd like to point out to council that you guys made a rule maybe about a year ago that you couldn't present a case that the, and then the citizens come and they say their part, public comment, and then ask for a continuance. Well, I'm sorry, but when you come here, when was the DRC? I'm sorry, I don't have that paperwork. Okay, so 
since March, we've known what the plan was that Mr. Hussein brought, okay? And then tonight, it, it, I, it seems to me like it wasn't even readily apparent that to Mr. Hussein immediately that it wasn't the plan that was presented at the DRC. Why do we have DRCs if you can show up and, oh, let's just do this plan today. All these folks who are sitting here, I'm not even like the tree lover, you guys know that. I mean, I like trees, but I'm not the tree hugger. But these people have been here for hours waiting to speak. How do you get up here and, it, I'm sorry, it's bait and switch. In my opinion, it's the exact same thing that city council said a year ago that they were gonna stop doing. And why is it only coming up now? Because you guys all got letters about it in the last week and they're in the QJ box and he got a chance to read them and said, oh, I better change my plan. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Michael McNabb. President Palmacy West, I'm a 50-year resident of South Tampa. Uh, I'd like to see this go forward tonight. People, are, they're getting tired. We're prepared. I don't see the reason for the continuance. We're basing what we saw on the original plan, so I'm not in favor of a continuance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. I'm Pamela Jackson Haney. Um, I drove here today from Alabama cut my trip short with my family to be here for this hearing based on the records that were online when I looked at this. I also prepared for what was online. And it's not my full-time job to prepare for this. The people here that are saying they're not prepared, it's their full-time job to be prepared for this. So I prepared in Alabama with my one-year-old grandson and then drove home seven hours with my one-year-old grandson to be here for this and have been sitting here for hours, and I would like it also to go forward tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I'll be fast. I'm Bob Whitmore, Executive Director of City Tree. I've got a picture to show. We can activate the overhead. I don't mind staying here till 1 o'clock in the morning to talk about this. I don't mind if, uh, what, I, what I do mind is that if we move this ahead, what might happen is what happened to the lot next to it. They clear cut the trees, took down three protected trees, the great tree savers that are up here talking to you, clear cut that lot, and I still don't know why they just didn't go ahead and clear cut to the, to, all the way to McDill. So I'm worried that by August, they'll go ahead and clear cut this next lot and pay that whopping $3,000 fine that they get for taking down protected trees. We need to move ahead on this to protect that land. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we had someone online, Ms. Perino. Were you sworn in? No. Please raise your right hand and uh, we'll swear you in if we could get her on the screen. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You may lower your hand. Go ahead. Well, I was, uh, I've been waiting for hours, too. I spent two days working, studying this. This is a very confusing um, rezoning because it's two rezonings. It's two lots. And I spent two days preparing my comments, and I'd like to see it go forward also. <laughs> And I agree with, with Bob um, that, you know, these trees have been here, for, and Carol Ann, these trees have been here for 80 years. And what's the confusion? I don't, I don't understand. I'd like to see it not continue. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Okay. We have a motion from Council Member Clendenin. We had the second from to continue to August 17th at 5.01 p.m. Yes? Um, I'm, I won't support the continuance. Um, I, if, if they provide a site plan, I want to vote on the site plan. If they wanted a, a change, that continuance should have come. Um, but I agree. I, I think we just go ahead with what we have. Is it appropriate to withdraw my uh, motion? Yeah, sure you can. You yeah. withdraw the motion after hearing public comment? Yeah, I mean, yeah I'll, sure. I'll withdraw my motion. If, if I could counsel, it's, it's not, um, it, it, there's confusion there about which site plan was there. I, I never thought that the old 
original site plan was being proposed this evening. Um, and that's why you have in your record, you have the, the revised site plan that we submitted. I, I think that it probably creates problems if you move forward, but I, I do not want the original site plan to be considered by council. Um, and that gives everyone an opportunity to clear the slate and make sure that the site plans are correct and that the staff reports are correct and reflect the correct site plans. You, apparently you don't have that right now. Um, and I would appreciate you just continuing the hearing. I mean, I've been here too, just like they have. I didn't expect this. Yeah. And um, there was a lot of misinformation being spread about what this project is about. Okay. And um, I think that the time provided for a, a continuance would be a, appropriate. Mr. Shelby. Uh, I'm sorry, did you want to be heard? I'm sorry, Mr. I was going to ask uh, Kate and the, and the rest of the legal department here what our options are. Oh, yeah. Can I say something close? Go ahead. Well, while Kate's getting up, it, this just, it, I've only been here four years, but I, it, 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 this is a really weird situation that um, I don't remember coming up before. And we have, um, information that was put in the file. We always argue that we need information put in SIRE in a timely way that inf the, the correct information is put up. And now we have a, a whole bunch of people and um, uh, who have prepared, including us, based on the other evidence. And I, some people may consider this a minor change. For, for neighborhoods, this is a major change, um, what's being proposed. Kate Wells, Legal Department, this is an odd situation, but this is why it's so critical that applicants present the site plan that they have filed with the city in response to the DRC comments and not continue working on changes to the site plan and then present those when staff hasn't had the opportunity um, to review those further revisions. In this situation, um, the site plan that was included in SIRE and that went out by email last week with the staff report does not show the home on lot one being notched out to save the three trees on the southern southeastern part of the lot. That appears to be the only change from what I can tell and I would want Mr. Michelini to confirm that for the record. It's just that notched out portion to save the trees. Because you've got members of the public that are prepared to be heard this evening, I don't know whether their comments go to those revisions or not, or whether their focus is on other aspects of the application before you. I think council could hear this. I think we can all make it perfectly clear that the site plan, if this is gonna move forward this evening, the site plan is the one that does not show the notched out area in the home. If this were to be approved this evening on first reading, part of the revision between first and second reading would be to show that notched out area. It's my understanding that that one modification to the site plan does not require the application to go back to DRC and that that revision could be accomplished between first and second reading if this council would like to continue with the hearing this evening. Councilman, I, I need to make a point. Um, our attorney just said that uh, Councilman Vieira, if you would, uh, if you would acknowledge that, uh, withdrawing your second to my, I was going to say that. It, okay. Yes, sir. Um, all right, Councilman Carlson. Yeah. It, 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 so the options are: we can go forward, um, we can continue, but we, I think we've we've withdrawn that. We'll see what happens. I, I'm just making these up, but I guess. Um, you know, there's an option that we would approve it and then it would come back for second reading and we'd see what happened then and it still would need to get approved at a second reading. There's an option that we would re reject it and then and then there's an option, is there an option that the applicant can withdraw the application? And what's the difference between those last two situations? There's a, if we voted it down, there's like a six month waiting period or something or a year late, what, I've, sorry, I can't remember the number. Certainly, if council were to deny an application, there's a 12 month waiting 12 month. period 
which can be moved up to six months in the event that changes are made to the plan that was denied and that those changes are responsive to the basis for denial. If, on the other hand, the applicant were to withdraw the application, then there's a six-month waiting period. And, and, it, and tonight, we can't, when we vote, we're voting on the one that was in Sire. We can't vote on the new one, right? That is my recommendation, that council vote on the site plan that is in Sire, and then um, the applicant can identify what changes have been made. He's now saying that something else changed, so I, I've not compared the two plans. Uh, but to the extent that council wants to hear it this evening and you're inclined to approve the application to rezone, then the applicant needs to identify the additional changes to the site plan so that those can be added to the revision sheet uh, to be addressed between first and second reading. Councilman Vieira. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I, I suggest we go forward. The motion has been withdrawn. Right, we've gotten advice from our legal counsel. Uh, my main issue in seconding that was to uh, protect us from any decision that we would make. But if we're, um, you know, given that advice, I suggest we move forward. Is, is it's uh, ten eighteen? All right. So where were we? We were you were presenting as the applicant. Um, Did you have anything further? Well, the the only changes that that I would ask for from counsel, if you can, if you approve this on first reading. We're saving that grand oak there that Aaron pointed out and the cluster of oaks back here. We're following the, uh, the recommendations of natural resources with the exception of the two, the two grand trees that are in the center of the site. Okay. I mean, I'll be happy to answer any further questions you might have. Any questions at this time? No? All right. If not, we'll go to public comment. Ms. Bennett has, let's see if I have all the names here. No, uh, one. Sandy Sanchez. This is Thank you. Uh, Jerome Adcock, did I say that? There you are. Uh, Adrian Laramie. Thank you. Uh, Joanne McNabb. Thank you. Donna Dade Smith. Five additional names for a total of eight minutes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carol Ann Bennett. I'm a lifelong resident of South Tampa. Um, a while back, we discussed in council the problem with continuances. And uh, Ms. Abby Feely and other staff members, we, taught, we discussed making a change in the procedure so that um, continuances had to be asked for a certain number of days in advance. And development coordination would like that to be seven days or more because they put a lot of work into these. They prepare the staff report a week ahead of time. If they know uh, a week ahead of time that it's going to be continued, it would save a lot of their time and effort. It also saves the time and effort of the public. I would like for you to resurrect that idea and, and talk about it. I'd also talk, like to talk about the plats that were shown that showed they're all 50 by they're, they're all 50 wide. Those plats are the plats that were originally done in the city of Tampa over 100 years ago. The plats that were done over 100 years ago is not the pattern of development. The pattern of development is what was actually built. And it just so happens, and I don't waste time explaining why, but I do have the conforming map for, the, for this property. I want you to look right here. See, this, this is Coachman. This is the, the street we're talking about. I want you to look at the colors. These orange, these are all 70 by 112. This is 100 feet. This is 75. This is 60, 60, 75, 75, 75, 75, 70, 60, 70, 60, 60, 60, 75. Over 100. You have to go all the way over here before you find the first ones that are only 50 foot wide. And you know what? They go all the way from Coachman to Fielder. Those are 50 by 180. So the pattern of development, the
the pattern of development is clearly 100% large lots. I'd also like to speak to the whole thing about two different site plans. They're both bad. They both kill too many trees. They kill the grand trees. We cannot afford to lose a single grand tree in South Tampa. We have continually, over years and years, lost more tree canopy in South Tampa than any other place in Tampa. And every one of those trees is solid gold infrastructure that needs to be treated like solid gold infrastructures. Those trees did not spring up overnight on May 31st. They've been there for decades. Everybody knows they're there. There are professionals here. They know what the rules are in the city. They know what the codes are. They know what can and cannot be built by right when they purchase property. There are no secrets here. And all this talk about, oh, you can't fit it. It's a, it's a, it's a tight squeeze and da, da 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 It's a tight squeeze because you're putting two houses that are over 5,400 square feet on a lot that used to have one house. There's your missing middle right there. So now that I've gone off script, I'll go back on script. I hope you said everything, heard, remember everything else I said earlier tonight about flooding and overbuilding in South Tampa and the fact that South Tampa has the highest growth rate in the entire city when it's supposed to have the lowest, that South Tampa has done its fair share of contributing to housing to this city. This lot had one house on it because that is what appropriate and that's what meets the zoning of RS-50. The applicant needs waivers and special exceptions in order to cram two houses on this lot. You can't have waivers for Euclidean zoning and you can't have waivers in RS-50. You must meet the requirements of the zoning. That's why they're asking for a PD. They're using a PD to circumvent the zoning. The purpose of PDs is not to circumvent the zoning. They are asking for an exception to the setback rules. The setback rules are 20 feet. They want a 50-foot rear setback. RS-50 requires a 20-foot setback. So does RS-60, RS-75, RS-100, and RS-150. The city of Tampa does not have a single residential, single-family residential zoning category that allows a 15-foot setback on an interior lot. They are asking for something that does not exist in Tampa's zoning. Why would you give that to them? They're asking for an exception to the building height rules. They want a 40-foot high house. RS-50 allows a maximum of 35 feet. I know it's on here. Isn't it? Dang it. It got cut off. Anyhow, it allows a maximum of 35 feet, as does RS-60, RS-75, RS-100, and RS-150. The city of Tampa does not have a single family residential zoning that allows a 40-foot height. They are asking for something that does not exist in Tampa's zoning. Why would you give it to them? Here's the stormwater report. On the stormwater report, it asks if the outfall is adequate. The department's answer is questionable. Questionable, is that okay? It doesn't sound okay. It certainly isn't okay with all the citizens in South Tampa who are constantly dealing with flooding. Then it asks, is the property, then it asks if the property is stormwater, advisory, or flooding, or volume sensitive. And the answer is yes, zone AE. This property, property is stormwater advisory, flooding, and volume sensitive. It is in flood zone AE, the coastal high hazard area, evacuation zone area, and the adequate outfall of stormwater is questionable. The stormwater report also said that this site exceeds the city's 50% maximum impervious surface rule. So it's in flood zone AE, the coastal high air hazard area, evacuation zone A, the adequate outfall of stormwater is questionable, and yet they want to supersize the impervious area. This is the epitome of stupid growth. The stormwater department found the plan inconsistent, so the applicant had to show how they were going to retain the stormwater on site. This is how they did it. They're going to build two retention ponds. Isn't that lovely? The front yard and the side yard will be a retention pond. I'm sure the neighborhood is thrilled. Since there isn't even one house in the neighborhood that has a retention pond for a front yard or a site yard, I would consider this inconsistent with the character of the neighborhood. This is a quote from the city's natural resources report that you have a copy of. Out of the 13 trees on site, 
10 live oaks have a C or better rating. There is no reason to remove these trees except for the impacts from construction and or conflicts with the proposed structure. Based on this analysis, Natural Resources finds the request inconsistent, and that includes two grand trees. The staff found it inconsistent. The, T the PD was created strictly for the tree removal, which was highly anticipated, uh, able to be anticipated, and the special exceptions to the rezoning, the setback and the height. That's all you need to know to know that this is a bad project. Please vote no on stupid growth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Well, that's a hard act to follow. Exactly. I'm just going to talk about the two trees, the two grand trees. Let's see if I can get them on here. 88 and 98. And... Uh, they're not, they're big, but they're not dangerous, okay? Because that's what they used to call these trees, dangerous. Not over, I would like, I think they should be able to keep, we need to keep these. Not overbuilding on, oh, I didn't I identify myself. I'm Allison Date, and I live in 240, I live in Tampa. Okay, let me just put that, I'm tired. Not overbuilding on their lot will allow for maintaining adequate permeable space and preserving these mature trees that play a vital role in decreasing the impact of flooding and the effects of rising temperature. That's why we need to save these. Last month, the city shared its devastating report about Tampa's urban forest, and the mayor stated that we must not let the canopy continue to decline. This report is from data collected through 2021, and we know that more trees have been, have, have been and continue to be cut down with or without prior permission. The greatest loss of canopy was in South Tampa, which is where this lot is. There needs to be a concerted effort to save healthy grand trees, especially in the high hazard storm areas, and the developers need to be encouraged to, be a, to participate in that effort. I would like to suggest that most of the PD developments have been allowed to mitigate for trees and clear the lot that, and have been allowed to mitigate for trees and clear, clear the lot of vegetation. That was this builder's original plan, the one that you, I think you see now. Fortunately, the developer was encouraged to make some adjustments and but I think even before then, they were saving the one grand tree. But b working with natural resources, I wanted to say that needs to be commended. And I'm glad that that happened. And that kind of thing needs to continue to happen. Natural resources would have liked, in the report, to have seen an additional grand tree, especially 89. Even with the building that's there, the footprint could, have been could be redesigned to save that tree. But the city and developers need to be accountable for both of the other grand trees by making alterations so the building is appropriate to the size of the lot that it's on. Developers are as developers as responsible citizens, just lost my place here, um, should be expected to take extra effort to value and protect Tampa's natural resources. Purchasing a lot with grand trees should automatically signal the need for additional construction considerations. This can no longer be considered a hardship. Instead, it is a necessity that needs to be done for the good of the community. Today's case sets a precedent for the future PD requests. Is South Tampa's dwindling tree canopy going to preserve, be preserved, or will its demise be allowed to continue? Is Thank you very planned? much. Yes, anyway. So please vote no. Thank you. On rezoning this lot. Right. Next you. person, please. Please state your name. Uh, Pamela Jackson Haney. I need to be sworn in, too. Do I, I need to be sworn in, right? Yes. Do I need to be sworn in? Yes. Okay. You weren't, yeah. <laughs> do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Thanks. Um, I live in Bayshore, beautiful, and less than a quarter mile from the subject property. If there has ever been a more unnecessary zoning request, this might be it. 
To rezone this lot PD and split it to literally squeeze in two houses would be out of character, non-conforming, and precedent setting in our lovely neighborhood full of RS50 and RS60 lots. I was happy to see so many of my neighbors write emails to you stating the same. The staff report said that the rezoning request is all about the trees and the setbacks, as you heard uh, Carol Ann say. Let's start with the trees. The council has been instructed to give careful consideration of potential adverse impacts to on-site natural elements. This lot contains many priceless trees. In fact, it is considered a wooded lot from aerial images. It's a very cool lot. The trees grew up and away from the house that was torn down. The old single house that was on the lot was nestled among them. Two out of the 10 healthy live oaks are non-hazardous grand live oaks, and this developer needs a waiver to remove them. And it's my understanding that this rezoning would automatically allow that. The developer has finally agreed to save a few oaks, as you heard, um, with um, his redesign, but one of them is a D-rated tree that actually needs to come down along McDill Avenue. I consider that a, a a hazard. To me, this shows they're not serious about the trees and the possibilities to use these grand workhorse trees that Bayshore Beautiful loves and cherishes in their plan to even try to conform to the rest of the neighborhood. Could they tweak their plan to save the trees? Most certainly. Up the street, just a few blocks away, on the same lot at Fair Oaks and McDill is a great example of how to do that. For that single family home, the oaks are used as a lovely buffer and incorporated in the design of that home. This could easily be done here if that lot is not rezoned PD. Um, you heard what Ms. Mayer said about um, the only, there's out of the 13 trees on site, 12 of them are live oaks. 10 live oaks have a C or better rating and there's no reason to remove these trees, but they conflict with the construction and that's the only reason that this developer wants them out. As the latest tree report shows, we are in crisis mode in South Tampa regarding our grand oaks. We have lost 6% of our canopy from development and illegal tree removal over the five-year period ending in 2021. For the setbacks, I was visiting my son and daughter-in-law at their Army Economy Housing this past week. The single family homes are built tightly together in their little community. I took my measuring tape outside and realized they, will have, they have more of a side yard and backyard than is proposed by this developer for this lot. I was stunned, and so were they, because they're both from South Tampa. Another big concern is the lack of green space and permeable space due to two houses being squeezed onto this lot. Stormwater initially found this plan inconsistent, but then those retention ponds again pop up, which just, I'm telling you, there are no retention ponds in the neighborhood that I know of um, that I can see. And I think that it's just really a safety factor for ch small children, for older people, um, and it's just, this is just not a right fit for this parcel. So I respectfully ask you to vote no on this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mike McNabb, I'm here representing Palmasia West and the other South Tampa neighborhoods that have had flooding for the 50 years that I've lived in my house. And my house is 18 feet higher than sea level, and I have had it up at my front door before. So I know about flooding, but I'm not nearly as much as some of these folks who their houses flood regularly. Uh, this project pushes the envelope, really. It's a Frankenstein, the 40-foot high height, this 15 feet in the backyard, the 90-foot mosquito pond that runs down one side of it. Um, there's no pop-off that I see on those retention ponds, so I don't know where that water goes in a hard couple of days of rain. There's no, there's no impervious surfaces left in there for the water to soak in. It's in the flood zone AE. When you take the trees out, it makes it even worse. Uh, they're really using every square foot that there is there. But the one thing that struck me was I did not know that flooding was questionable in South Tampa. I learned that tonight. I thought it was a fact. Because the city spent more than $250 million on, on really good stormwater projects in South Tampa. But if we could have just dug a pit in our front yard or down our side yard, we wouldn't have needed all that. We could have just all have a great big pit in our yard to take all that water up 
and the city could have saved the money. I am being facetious with you, but there's no houses in my neighborhood that have retention ponds. I've never seen a house that has something like that to capture water. Uh, we would never support a project like, like this in Palmacia West, I can tell you that, with all the problems with it, particularly the trees. So I'm just asking to vote no on this. Um, this is a neighborhood unfriendly PD, frankly. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Bob Whitmore, <clears throat> Executive Director of uh, Tampa City Tree. Um, please keep that original schematic in front of you because that is what the builder wanted. They know the problem with the trees and they know what we're up against and they know that there's been a 17% drop in trees in South Tampa, but instead they came with those plans and natural resources had to make them notch it out to save those oak trees. And when you have bad players doing things like this, we will never ever get to the point where we are going to actually either stop the decline of the canopy or we're going to be able to reverse the, the, the decline of the canopy. This project, I understand that they want to buy these pieces of lot and then make a bundle on them, but this is a single family lot and it's ready for a great single family house. Jamming those two townhomes on that is just not the way to go and it's irresponsible. But I'm going to show you this is, this is what it'll look like. There's nothing comparable around it except for maybe this monster here, and I don't know how that got. And again, the past does not define the future for us. Let me tell you, the, let me show you the real project. Here's the real project. That's the real project. Because what's coming up next is the sister to this one. And what they want to do is they want to put in four identical looking houses, townhomes, and fill up that area with those townhomes. That's the project. And they split it somehow. I don't know, I guess we had to do it. It has to be done. But that is what we are really looking at right now. I'm asking you to please reject these plans, send them back to the drawing board, make them do other things, make them put one great single family house in a fantastic neighborhood. They could build a little mansion there with trees and make a lot of money. And since they clear cut the next lot next to it without permits. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I'm going to ask counsel, you're talking about another case. <coughs> Granted, it's <coughs> situated nearby. There, it's there'll been be another opportunity to speak. There'll to be another opportunity, opportunity to speak to that. So counsel, I'm going to ask for the purposes of this hearing that you disregard the reference to the next case. Um, as being inappropriate for your consideration at this time. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I'd like to point out, good evening, Stephanie Pointer. I'd like to point out that two times tonight I've heard someone talk about the comp plan and infill and vacant lots. This must be a new thing because this is like the first time I've noticed that developers are emptying the lot and then coming for the rezoning. In the past, there's always been a, something on the property. But now we're coming in with a vacant lot because whoever the owner is has destroyed the original home. So I just want to point that out to you. Um, here we are, all everything in red, coastal high hazard. And of course, we've got our uh, objective 1.1, you know, direct future population concentrations of get away from the coastal high hazard area as to achieve no net increase in overall residential density. Now, of course, we've talked about this already this evening. 1978, they may have had a little bit of a different plan, but it wasn't even that much of a different plan. But the bottom line is these two lots are in the coastal high hazard. And this is my favorite trusty, dusty notebook, development in the CHHA. It says, no new density. 
So bottom line is there was one house, now they want two. This evening, we are going to hear that there were three houses, and then they wanted 14. So when does it stop? I would say it should stop here. And you know what? I want to remind everybody, even though South of Gandy, we have gotten the onslaught. We've given three of you tours of South of Gandy now. And we've gotten more than our fair share of housing, but none of that in Rattlesnake Point involved taking out grand trees. None of that in West Shore Marina District involved taking out trees. So those trees got killed in South Tampa one lot at a time. And today is the day that you stop it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have um, Miss Lorraine Perino online. She was sworn in. She spoke of the continuance but did not speak yet. If Miss Perino's online, ma'am, we can see you. Is it time for me to talk? Yes, go ahead. Please state your name. Good evening, I'm Lorraine Carino. I'm president of the Tampa Tree Advocacy Group. This corner lot contains 10 healthy oak trees. The builder wants a waiver to destroy seven of those valuable trees, including two healthy grand oaks, a 40 inch live oak and a 34 inch live oak, to build two houses on a lot that is too small and does not comply to the required setback or height requirements. City Council, these builders want to come into established neighborhoods with your support Destroy the ambiance and charm of these old neighborhoods by splitting lots, increasing density, removing old growth and young trees, basically change the entire character of the neighborhood so that they can make their quick millions, leaving chaos and destruction behind them. They should be compared to one of the many hurricanes that now threaten Florida annually. They rush in, do their damage, and leave in their wake destruction, increased traffic, increased density, overcrowded schools, flooded streets, and no shades, because they have destroyed the trees which stored the excess rainwater and air pollution, which created shade and lowered the heat index and the blistering summer heat. And they want to accomplish all of this negativity and destruction with your complicity and your cooperation. They want you to set aside the rules that would protect these long established neighborhoods and give them the ability to do their worst. The recently released 2021 tree canopy and urban forest study analysis informs us that South Tampa has suffered more tree canopy loss than any other area in the city. South Tampa alone has lost 18% of its tree canopy. Tiny Davis Island, prone to flooding, has lost 10%. This death by a thousand cuts of Tampa's tree canopy is a sad result of building huge properties on two small lots. Keeping this destruction of Tampa's tree canopy in mind, the city must not grant any waivers or exemptions for moving grand trees because once they're gone, they're gone forever. This rezoning request meets none of the criteria for granting waivers. In fact, granting this builder a waiver will interfere with and injure the rights of others' properties. The waiver is not in harmony with the city's land development regulations or Tampa's COP plan. And the waiver will have no public benefit either to the neighborhood or its residents. In fact, the only, quote, individual hardships that will be suffered by the failure of city council to grant a waiver, unquote, will be to the neighborhood residents themselves, who will suffer the negative effects of an increased heat index, increased flooding to their yards and streets, increased traffic, increased density, and school overcrowding. City staff and national resources have found this PD request to be inconsistent, both through the plan's violation of setback and height requirements, and because there is no reason to remove any trees on this property. You, City Council, must stop this corporate greed by preventing the destruction of our cherished trees and beloved neighborhoods. You, City Council, must choose to either follow the code and protect campus neighborhoods and tree canopy, or instead grant waivers and rezonings to irresponsible developers. City Council, you must follow the code and strengthen it even more to make it impossible for builders to even request tree destroying waivers. Please vote no to this destructive rezoning request. Thank, Thank you very much. All right, next up we have Nicole Palowski. I don't believe you were sworn in. If you could raise your right hand, we'll swear you in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. State your name. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, City Council. I'm Nicole Pulowski, and my family and I have been residents of Bayshore Beautiful for almost 11 years now, and we currently live at 3101 West Fielder Street, which butts up to the south side of this lot. 
Um, I am opposed to rezoning of this land for several reasons. First, the non-hazardous oak trees will be cut down. The trees are old, large, and beautiful. They create shade for the neighborhood and provide a unique landscape with their canopies. The trees need to stay. Approving the rezoning will only lead to more cutting down of trees. Second, Bayshore Beautiful and South Tampa continue to rezone land and build more homes on top of each other. The size of the homes coupled with how close they are together is overbearing and unsightly. Let's stop putting two houses on one lot. Fourth, this will contribute to the overcrowding of South Tampa. My children's school is overcrowded. McDill Avenue already has too many speeding cars and the area's infrastructure is not capable of handling more. No, no matter how this uh, land is zoned, the developer will make their profit and move on. The lasting impact will be left on the neighborhood and the residents. I oppose the rezone and urge the city council to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe that concludes our uh, virtual public comment. or comments from council members? No? All right. Mr. Michelini, you have rebuttal time, sir. Um, council, I'd, I'm sorry? Go ahead. No, no, rebuttal time. Uh, somebody was talking. Uh, anyway, uh, these are two conforming lots. I'm not here to ask you to make them conforming. They are conforming as they sit right now. So you you are able to build two homes on these two lots. We, we worked with the staff, and, and I'm, I apologize for the confusion regarding the site plans, um, but we worked with the staff to try to accommodate and save the greatest number of trees possible. We're required to mitigate for any trees that are removed. Stormwater and flooding is not part of this petition. Uh, you have to meet the code. You can't waive stormwater requirements. There, there are no exceptions to that. Um, and when people talk about flooding, the existing homes that are, that are in the area contribute to that flooding. They don't have any stormwater mitigation, none. The new homes are required to have it. Um, we also have to put in new sidewalks on Coachman and also on McDill. The issue regarding the design of the stormwater retention is handled at permitting. What's shown on the plan is a, is a conceptual location for a potential stormwater treatment area. The side yard setbacks <coughs> comply with the RS-50 zoning district. It's seven feet on each side. The only thing that we did was shift the building back and forth to accommodate the trees in the front and the trees in the back. And then this tree over here in the front of, the, of lot two. Um, and I, again, that was done to accommodate the trees. I mean, and try and not, not to remove any more than was necessary. The remainder. Yeah, that's, that's not the site plan that we're considering tonight. I, I, I don't have the other one. This is the one that I have that we originally prepared. But he has. And it was superseded. Uh, I don't know exactly what the date was when the when the revised plan was submitted, but this plan was superseded. Um, and again, you, you have a provision in the code that says that you have to be able to provide reasonable use of a piece of property. And denying reasonable use is a whole different set of criteria. I think that you know we have submitted a plan that provides reasonable use, it protects a reasonable number of trees, and it does protect the neighborhood. It, it does what it's supposed to do. Um, I, don't, I don't know what else I can tell you. We're, we, with the exception of, of natural resources, we meet the, the code requirements that are before you, and we've done our best to comply with natural resources with the exception of the two grand trees to be removed. I don't think that the um, staff can confirm this, but I don't think that 
the report from Natural Resources is going to change regarding those two trees that they want us to try to, to save. But again, denying reasonable use of the property is, is a different kind of issue that we have to address. These two lots are buildable for two single family homes as they sit right now. Thank you and I respectfully request your approval. Thank you very much, Council Member Clendenin and then Council Member Hurtak. Yeah, this, um, so this evening we received um, some competent substantial evidence showing a, the development pattern in the neighborhood along Coachman. And it would be contrary to your statements that would be made about the, the size of the lots and how that particular street had been developed. That generally on that street they're much they're much larger um, lots, and the only reason that you're able you would be able to develop is to request a PD. That without the PD, you'd be subjected to the setbacks and other restrictions on this in this development. So, um, you know, I, I, I find some of the statements a little contradictory to some of the substantial and competent evidence that we've heard tonight. Um, and again, I think the only reason that you're here tonight asking for a PD, so it's not just the, the rezoning, so you couldn't build what you're asking for without that, without us approving a PD. So I don't, uh, that's not accurate. You can confirm that with staff. You, 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 so you, you could build exactly what you're doing without a PD, then why aren't you just no, requesting no, it? No, no, sir. I didn't, I'm not saying that. You would have to meet standard setbacks for the lot. Right, so you could not build what you're requesting without the PD. Without the removal of the trees. That's and correct. without the, with, so without the PD. That would have to take another process to get the removal of the non-hazardous trees. But you couldn't, you couldn't build what you're presenting tonight without the PD. So and for, that, for that reason alone, I, I, will, I will not be supporting this. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, yes, actually I have a question for staff. Um, I'm, if you could bring the site plan. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> In both the new and the old versions of the site plan, and particularly the old version, which is what I think is interesting because um, it shows the same 15-foot backyard setback, correct, before we even looked at, at moving things around. Correct. So the and south that would, is that 15 is 15-foot setback. Yeah. So, even, so I can understand the one where the, the tree needs to be moved back, but the other one shouldn't, shouldn't need to, correct? In theory... That, that one should be able to, to handle the correct setback. I, I have not reviewed the, the new site plan. Uh, no, no, no. I'm looking at the old site plan. Oh, yes. Because that's what we're looking at. 15 so, foot setback in the rear. Yeah, but, but there's no reason that lot one couldn't actually have that 20 foot setback if they moved the, the house forward. Uh, correct, but then you need okay. to meet the front setback. Oh, wow. Okay, so basically the house is just too big. You couldn't save those. For the lot. Right. Okay, that's, that's one question. And then... The other, the other question I had was um, something that several of the um, uh, public commenters had to say. Sorry, it's late, and I'm um, that it is. It is. Look, they're looking for 40 feet. Is that correct height? It's 35. Uh, let's see. The applicant is requesting uh, 40 feet in height. That's yes, and so 40 feet of height is over what is normally allowed in that area, am I correct? Councilman, that should have been revised to 35 feet. There's also a note on there that the roof lines have to be adjusted to accommodate the tree limbs. No. Okay. That's on the plan already. Thank you. In the zoning, uh, it's 35 feet in height. Councilman Carlson. Ms. Uh, Wells, Ms. Wells. <laughs> um, I, for the first time tonight, uh, it, to my recollection, I heard the 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 um, a comment about re reasonable use. I, what, do I remember that term correctly? Can you just tell us what the uh, w like what the legal threshold is of that, and how do we avoid um, breaching that? I'm trying to figure out how I want to respond to this. Sorry, um, easy question. You know, typically when we, uh, a lot of times you hear the term reasonable use when a board is being asked to look at a variance and that at times when you look at the variance criteria, um, part of that criteria will include that the hardship is not self-created and that the variance is needed to provide reasonable use of the property. We're not here on a simple variance. We are here to consider 
an application for rezoning. And I would ask council to look at the criteria in your code in chapter 27 with respect to the purpose and intent of a plan development site plan and then the criteria that must be met for the waivers that are being requested to remove the two non-hazardous grand trees. There's been some testimony that that um, a, a smaller, two smaller houses might be able to put on or one, one big house could fit without changing anything. Um, does, does that by itself meet the threshold that that it that it is that there is a um, reasonable use allowed I'm not going to go down that path of discussing reasonable use because this is not an issue of a simple variance being requested of council we're here on a rezoning and the criteria is different yes sir and mr. chairman members of council uh, Martin Shelby City Council attorney and now we have uh, uh, two new members of council. I just want to uh, inform them and, and also remind council that in a site plan controlled plan development that you have a PD, the setbacks are set on the site plan. They do not appear as a waiver, but as council member Clanetting <coughs> stated, there are dimensions on the site plan that differ what would be under Euclidean rezoning. So in that sense, can that be evaluated? And the answer to that is yes, but that evaluation does not come under the waiver criteria because under the way the city of Tampa views it, it's not a waiver per se. It's not like a variance criteria, but that can be evaluated as part of your 27136 criteria as to whether that is an appropriate setback or series of setbacks, particularly as to how it relates to fulfilling the, the, um, the, the nine criteria set under 27136. I hope I made that clear to you. That, that setbacks are not called out necessarily as waivers, but they are relevant as to the criteria of whether it's an appropriate use of a PD. It was it was brought to my attention that um, Carol Ann Bennett, when you uh, presented your development pattern, you did not submit that for the record. Are you, uh, can you can staff look at that and, and verify that this is a, a, a accurate portrayal of the development pattern in that neighborhood? Council, I haven't I haven't seen that map. <laughs> yeah, she she dis she displayed it during her testimony. This is the same map from 3408 staff report. Who has the map? They have it in the staff report for 3108, Coachman, which is the may, next one. May, I, may, may we inquire of staff with regard to this, please? It's online. Um, it's on is it? It's online for this it's one. Not this item, but the next item. Right. Yeah. This wasn't prepared for this site. Um, the, as per the revised staff report, a conforming app was not needed. So this and the revised staff report was sent to council uh, earlier this week, uh, stating that for the record. But is that an accurate portrayal of the development pattern along that street? That is accurate. That's from our mapping and GIS department. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, could we submit that to the record, please? Yes, but I need it for the next one. <laughs> I, Council, I, this wasn't prepared for this petition, and you're taking an application and a map that was prepared for a different application. And well, it, was, it was entered into testimony from a, a citizen I, that provided testimony and displayed that to Council, and so we're just asking her to... They didn't prepare it. I mean, I don't... Attorney? You can inquire of staff as to whether that is an accurate portrayal. Is it an accurate map? Is it an accurate document? That, that was, yeah. he did, he did he, exactly. So that being the case, um, council, council can accept it into evidence if it's being offered and then it can weigh it as it sees fit, if it's appropriate. Yeah, I'd requ I would request that be submitted into evidence, please. Yeah, second, and it goes to the weight the All right, fine. 
We're going to vo motion to submit that into the record by Councilman Clendenin with the second from Councilman Vier. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Anything else? Can I see it before you go? Is there anything else? If not, we're going to ask for a motion to close. I'd like a moment to look at this map, if that's... Sure. We only have seven more cases tonight, so we'll be done by lunch tomorrow. In the city of Tampa. I have an idiot. Where is it? 305 East Kennedy Boulevard, Tampa, Florida. The subject site is the 3187. Can we take a restroom break? How do I ask for that? Yeah, we'll finish up. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is it is it possible? To, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is in the staff report. It's in the staff report for 3108. It's online. Would you like to do a recess? Let's do a recess for While five minutes. Looking, yeah. Just for the rest. Of All right, yeah. recess. Five minutes. Thank you.
Uh, roll call, please. I'd like to call this meeting back to order. Carlson? Here. Hertak? Here. Clindenen? Here. Henderson? Present. Vieira? Here. Miranda? 100% here. Meniscopo? <laughs> <laughs> we have a physical quorum. Since July 15th, 1887. Can we get <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Man. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you, Martin Shelby City Council Attorney. Before we move on from our last discussion, I believe Mr. Hussein has the map that Ms. Bennett had provided, and I would just want to uh, close the uh, circle on that, if we can, please. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Uh, the uh, community member who brought that map I got from the staff report for the next case, but this is a uh, accurate representation from our mapping and GIS department, this map. And so we're going to place that into the record at, as, Correct. at council's request? You already, voted. you already voted on it. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Michelini, anything else before we make a motion to close? Um, the only thing I can say is that I've had a chance to look at the map, and it looks like that the properties abutting this petition to the, and those to the south, those are all 50-foot lots. Um, the other ones are not, but... Uh, it does show a, a development pattern that is consistent with the 50-foot lots. Thank you, and I appreciate your consideration. Would someone like to make a motion to close? A motion to close from Councilman Vieira, second from Councilmember Henderson. All in favor? Aye. 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 What is the pleasure of Council? Councilwoman Hertek. Okay. <clears throat> I move to deny REZ 2321 for the property located at 21, or 3102 West Coachman Avenue. Um, due to the failure of the applicant to meet its burden of proof to provide competent and substantial evidence that the development as shown on, uh, conditioned and shown on the site plan is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the city code. <clears throat> Specifically, failure to comply with land development code section 27-136. Um, <clears throat> in that it does not promote the efficient and sustainable use of land and infrastructure with careful consideration of potential adverse impacts to on-site natural elements surrounding impacted neighborhoods and cultural resources. Um, that's subsection one, also subsection six, um, to promote and encourage development where appropriate in location, character, and compatibility with the surrounding impacted neighborhood built environment and existing geography. Um, <clears throat> failure to comply with section 27-139 subsection four, um, the desire to remove two non-hazardous grand trees necessarily supports the fact that the proposed development is not appropriate for the site and does not comply with the land development code. We have a motion can, from council can, can I add one more thing to what she just said? I need said? a second first. Oh, second, okay, I'm sorry, okay. second. Yeah, great. Now that we have a second, would you like to add something, sir? Yeah, I think because I think it's important with the, what we just put into uh, evidence is the proposed lots are significantly narrow in width and that pattern of development on that portion of Co Coachman Avenue. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll take that. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a motion from <coughs> Councilwoman Hertak, second from Councilmember Clendenin. Roll call. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Hertak? Yes. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Meniscaco? Yes. Motion to deny carried. Thank you, Council. No Go ahead, Zane, Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Agenda item number nine, case REZ 23 22. This is for the location 3108 West Coachman Avenue, proposed rezoning from RS 50 to PD, residential single family detached. I'll now pass along to our Planning Commission. Phelan, Planning Commission staff. 
The subject site is located within the South Tampa Planning District in the Bayshore Beautiful Neighborhood. The site is not within proximity of transit. Ballast Point Park is the closest recreational facility located one mile southeast of the subject site, and the site is located within evacuation zone A and the coastal high hazard area. This is an aerial of the subject site. The subject site's here. <coughs> Um, this subject site is within the interior of an established single-family detached neighborhood. Single-family detached residences characterize the portion of West Coachman. Here's, oops, sorry, switch my map. Subject site's here. It's surrounded by residential 10, and it's also represented by the residential 10 designation. The request would allow for two single-family detached residential units at an overall density of 9.52 units per acre. This portion of West Coachman Avenue between South Mound Avenue and South McDill Avenue, excluding the subject site, has an existing density of 5.88 units per acre based on 16 sample sites. This portion of West Coachman Avenue has been developed at approximately 59% of the density anticipated in this area of the city. The subject site can currently be considered underutilized and an increase in the number of dwelling units is consistent with the policy direction of the comprehensive plan to provide an adequate supply of housing for Tampa's growing population. Additionally, the request would allow for a development similar in form, height, and scale to the surrounding residential uses on this portion of West Coachman Avenue. The, plan, the proposed plan development is comparable and compatible with the development pattern and is consistent with the long-range development pattern encouraged under the Residential 10 Future Land Use Designation. And that concludes my presentation. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. I'll first go ahead and share the aerial view of the property, get an overhead look. This one will be very familiar. Um, as you see, the lot is outlined in red on West Coachman to the north, uh, along north and south to the east. You'll have South McDill Avenue. Uh, you have uh, South Ferdinand Avenue to the west, and West Villa Rosa Street uh, to the south here. All the uh, houses in the area are either residential single family detached uh, or RS-60 or RS-50 zoning. I will now show the site plan provided by the applicant as of 420, 2023. We'll make sure the date, we have the date. The applicant is proposing two residential single family detached units. The site is uh, currently vacant at this time, as I'll show you in pictures to come. The maximum building height is proposed to be 35 feet in height. Vehicular access for lots three and four come off of West Coachman Avenue, as you see here with the garages. A total of four parking spaces are required and four parking spaces are being provided in those two car garages. The subject site contains approximately 9,000 and 63 square feet or 0.21 acres. That is, so lot three, you have a lot uh, square footage of 4,529 square feet. And lot four, you have 4,534 square feet. And I'll get to that um, uh, in a few minutes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just real quick before yes. you leave this picture, um, can you uh, state the front and back setbacks that would be required for an RS-50 for us, just in the record? Uh, let's see. For the record, um, off the top of my head, I believe it's 20 in the front, 15 in the rear, and 7 on the sides. No. It's 20, 20 and 20, right? 20 and tw Sorry, 20 and okay. 20. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And 7 on the sides, correct. All right. Uh, these are the elevations provided by the applicant. Elevation to the east, elevation to the south, elevation to the west, and elevation to the north. I 
I'll now uh, show you the pictures as I took on site. The current vacant site as is. Looking at the current site and also to the east of the site. Vacant those trees. To the north of the site, a residential single family. And to the west of the site, you'll have residential single family. I will show the site plan one more time. Yes, sir. Uh, Zane, so you, yes. so you don't have to jump up again. Um, was there another site plan um, presented after the deadline? Uh, not to my knowledge. Not I talked to the applicant. Uh, prior to walking up here, and he will be presenting on the site plan presented as a 420. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Development coordination and compliance staff has reviewed the application and finds the request to be consistent with the land development code. Staff came up with these, uh, this finding as there were no waivers. All staff members were consistent with the uh, proposed uh, project. And the PD uh, was essentially for that lack of uh, square footage. <coughs> yes. So how could it be consistent <clears throat> if it's not the correct square footage? Correct. So, but, but no, seriously, how do you find that consistent if it's actually not? Understood. Uh, for a developed coordination, we, we look at all of the aspects of the site for the compatibility, uh, for anything that the applicant has provided in the analysis. Uh, square footage would not dictate if it would be inconsistent for development coordination. Or, or the setback. Correct. As per the PD, they can okay. request the setback. Okay. Thank you. Of course. I'm here for any questions if needed. Any questions? Thank you very much. Mr. McAleen. Uh, good evening, Council. The, the site plan that you have uh, has not been superseded. It is the same. There we go. Um, according to the consistency map, all of the properties to the south of this property are 50 feet wide or less. And as I said to you earlier, the development pattern to the south, if you look, this is the subject property. One, two, three of those properties are all 50 feet or less. And then it skips down to, and then the rest, all of these in here are 50 feet or less. Now, these are originally platted lots, and um, I showed you, the, um, I showed you the, the subdivision plat where they were all platted at 90 feet in depth. So regardless of whether or not you have 50 feet of width <coughs> or you have more, the depth is all is 90 feet. And um, so we're asking for consideration of that. The, uh, we're not, ask, not asking for any waivers. The Planning Commission and the city staff have found us to be consistent. And uh, with respect to that, the... Um, land use policies contained in the overall residential development and redevelopment are consistent. Single family areas consistent. Neighborhood community plans consistent. Adequate sites for accommodate housing consistent. Coastal high hazard is recognized uh, to be uh, dealt with in terms of the FEMA elevations for properties. And the staff analysis by the Planning Commission shows that, that they have found it to be consistent. With respect to the criteria for, and we don't have any waivers, but the criteria for a PD, let me go through that real quick. Um, is it compatible with the surrounding neighborhood to the north, south, east, and west? And it was found to be consistent. 
allow the integration of different uh, land uses and densities, it was found to be consistent. Incorporate residential single-family detached areas. The lots uh, measure 50.0 feet by 90.7 feet, and um, <clears throat> and they can only be allowed and considered under a PD. With respect to promoting and encourage development where appropriate in location, character, and compatibility, the site is surrounded by single-family detached uses. The proposed uses incorporate single-family detached units mm -hmm. and a layout depicting a built environment is similar to that of single-family residential detached units proposed in the character and compatible with the surrounding impacted neighborhoods. Promote more desirable living conditions. The application seeks <clears throat> for these two lots to be allowed to be two separate single-family residential de developments <clears throat> and the applicant is not requesting waivers. The elevations submitted are compatible with the surrounding area. The site is currently occupied um, by a single-family house which was demolished. There are no waivers being requested and um, as I've said earlier, Stormwater is not an issue regarding any of these sites. You can't waive stormwater. You have to deal with it, and you have to show engineering plans which show that you've addressed it. Um, I respectfully request your approval, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? All right. We'll go to public comment. If you're here to speak on this item, please come to the lectern. Ms. Bennett has four names, uh, Sandy Sanchez, thank you, Adrian Laramie, did I have to get that, no, close enough, thank you, uh, Jerry Adcock, and Joanne McNabb, thank you, four additional minutes for a total of seven, please. <laughs> did Stephanie fall asleep? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up. Oh, yeah. If I have to be awake, you have to be awake. I'll be awake Hi, my name is Carol Ann Bennett. I hope you remember everything I said earlier tonight because it also applies to this case. This lot has always had one house on it because that is what is appropriate. What meets the zoning of RS 50? The applicant needs special exceptions in order to cram two houses on this lot. You can't put two houses on this lot with the Euclidean zoning. You can't, you can only put two houses on this lot with a PD because as you, as you see, these two lots are 4,500 square feet. The minimum Minimum size for a conforming lot is 5,000 square feet. There is no single family residential zoning in the city of Tampa that allows for a lot less than 5,000 square feet. That's why they're asking for a PD because that's the only way to do it. They're using the PD to circumvent the zoning. This is not the purpose of PDs. Uh, frankly, I'm surprised they even proposed this. If they were asking for a zoning from Euclidean from RS60 to RS50 and it had less than 5,000 square feet, if it was a Euclidean rezoning, it would have been found inconsistent because the requirement for RS50 is 50 feet of frontage and 5,000 square feet, not or 5,000 square feet, and 5,000 square feet. This is a non-conforming lot. RS50 requires, uh, excuse me, I lost my place. Um, they're asking for something that does not exist in Tampa's zoning. How is that okay? They are also asking to, for an exception to the setback rules. They want a 15 foot rear setback. RS50 requires a 20 foot rear setback as does every other single family residential zoning. The city of Tampa does not have a single family residential zoning that allows a 15 foot setback. They are asking for something that does not exist. How is that okay? And again, 
stormwater report. It's the same as the one before. The property is stormwater advisory, flooding, and volume sensitive. It is in flood zone AE, the coastal high hazard area, <coughs> evacuation zone A, and the adequate outfall of stormwater is questionable. <coughs> Uh, I also want to point out that you have the same problem here about the impervious. Can you, that up? Can you see it? Sorry. It's in the staff report. Yeah. The, um, it has, it's, they're asking for more than 50% impervious. And that's why the, stat, the stormwater originally found it inconsistent. They want to, just like the one before, they want to supersize the impervious area so the stormwater department found it inconsistent. To solve that problem, the applicant is making, making a front yard of both houses a retention pond. And again, I'm sure the late neighbors will love it. There isn't one other house that has a retention pond front yard. So again, it is inconsistent with the neighborhood. Now, um, originally the staff prepared the conforming map. <coughs> and analyzed it because of the lack of 5,000 square feet, but then um, they said they didn't, shouldn't have done that because it had the 50-foot frontage, but it doesn't change the facts. The facts are that staff finds the proposed rezoning request to be inconsistent with the existing development pattern of the overall study area, block, and block face. They found 100% of the houses on both sides of Coachman were big lots. 81% of the 501 lots in the analysis were big lots. Only 19% had a 50-foot frontage. And that's all on this map here. 100% of the lots on the subject block and block face are big lots, and zero houses on, the, on Coachman had a 50-foot frontage. Staff has said they cannot generate the conforming map because it has 50 feet, but it doesn't change the fact that it doesn't have 5,000 square feet, and it doesn't change the facts or the conclusion of the map. The development pattern is overwhelmingly large lot, the 50-foot frontage is inconsistent with the pattern, and the lot does not have the required square footage. This lot can be developed with one lovely home. All they have to do is pull permits. This is another instance of wanting more, more, more. It's a bad plan that will cause more flooding in a neighborhood that is plagued with flooding. The comp plan says repeatedly that the character of neighborhoods must be preserved. The applicant is asking for special consideration that violates the, ca the character, the pattern of the development, and does not uh, rise to the requirement of 5,000 square feet. That's how you know it's a bad project. I want you to vote no on this, and I want you to remember again, if you look at these lots, 100 feet, 75 feet, 60, 60, 75, 75, 75, these are all 70 by 112, all along here, that's the development pattern of the neighborhood. And if you talk about reasonable use, you have, to, you have a non, if you want, if you have one lot, it's a conforming lot. Divide it in two, and it's a non-conforming lot. Please vote no, it's getting late. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next person, please state your name. My name's Allison Date, 2403 West Chicago, Tampa. And um, I didn't know a lot about PD before a few days ago, but it seems to me that the main purpose of PD rezonings is to allow for exceptions to long-standing residential zoning regulations some of which are extremely important in certain, in, especially in certain environmentally vulnerable areas. And this is one of those areas. A bias is being created against single family homes meeting standard zoning regulations. Single family homes are essential to preserving the tree canopy and retaining permeable surface. Most of our tree canopy is on those private uh, residential uh, lots. Live oaks need a 20-foot radius, so changing zoning to favor density 
will eliminate grand trees. Again, this change disregards this area's environmental issues. Will creating a few storm retention ponds be sufficient to deal with the flooding in this area? Is making holes in place of retaining permeable space a wise solution in this flood-prone area? I don't know. I talked to a number of residents near this development, and they were all against rezoning. Many older homes are feeling the impact of, a, of the loss of space as old homes are replaced with towering buildings that consume the entire lot next to them. They are concerned about the impact of flooding created by altering the rezoning to fit the buildings and not the amount of land. I want to share part of a letter from one of the neighborhood's residents. I'm the oldest resident on this block so far back that I remember the old alleyway between properties on Bar City Block 10. I've been dealing with serious stormwater issues for decades to the point where stormwater suggested that I install a sump pump, which I did at my own expense. As an aside, if the alleyway had been kept by the city of Tampa, I doubt I would have had to, the stormwater drainage issues that I have had to deal with. It's just the grace and mercy of God that these properties have not flooded. As I would like to age in place and preserve my 1942 legacy homestead, the added stormwater burden in this area would be an added concern to me. The kind-hearted Gary Mays in stormwater department, who has been helping me, informed me that the east end of Coachman is the lowest elevation in the city of Tampa. Having less green space on Coachman, in my opinion, is asking for trouble. Thank you for your wise decision making that will your wise decision making that will avoid future problems and bless the residents. Please vote no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please state your name. Hi, Pamela Jackson Haney. Um, when I listen to um, the request by this developer, I have to ask myself why? Why in this neighborhood? I know this developer's goal is to make money, and I respect that. The facts are, this area has been and continues to be very lucrative for the developers as is. This developer paid $1,535,000 for these two lots, 3102 and 3108. That's $767,500 per lot. The going rate for a lot in this neighborhood and the same one quarter mile I know it's disgusting, but it's true. Between $800,000 and $900,000 for the dirt, for one lot. That's the going rate. So he, some people are like, when I walk the neighborhood, gosh, he got a great deal. Sad, but true. Um, so this fact alone determines there will be no hardship for this developer if he can only put back the one single home on this nice lot. They'll not be deprived of anything, certainly not money. Um, the Bayshore Beautiful Homeowners Association sub did submit a letter to all of you um, opposing this project. And I just want to read real quickly just a little bit of it. Every day old homes are being torn down with two, sometimes three new houses being built on what were single family lots. More and more we are seeing green spaces disappear. According to the city's land development code, plan development can only be considered to accommodate unique conditions or considerations which other zoning districts cannot create or includes a mixture of appropriate land uses not otherwise permitted in other districts. Allowing these lots to become PD lots would be considered non-conforming. The city's allowance of single family lots to be divided under certain conditions was a long discussed and highly controversial matter with the resulting restrictions meant to maintain the nature of the city's residential neighborhoods. The PD construct is for planned developments of a much larger scale than two residential lots. Last, City Council must recognize the strain of overbuilding and the effect it has on the community. We already have overcrowding in our school systems, below standard fire and ambulance assistance, and our roadways are already overburdened. We must address these issues first and not stretch the rules to accommodate additional buildings in our neighborhoods. Please vote no on this resounding. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Just a reminder, Council, to when you take testimony, it has to fit into the context of the criteria within the code. 
and the economics of the lot purchases or the sale of the house or the market values are not something that fits within the criteria, and I ask that you remain mindful of that, please. Yes, sir. Attorney Shelby for that lesson. Yes, sir. Please say your name. Go ahead. Michael McNabb. Ladies and gentlemen, in the words of the great catcher Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again. Yogi Berra. <laughs> wow. So oh, you have funny. to vote. You have to vote no in this neighborhood on Sunday <laughs> PD. Thank you. Yogi Bear and the baseball player. Not the, <laughs> not the cartoon. Not Yogi Bear. I yes, sir. I haven't heard Yogi Bear in a long time. That's all. So as I was saying. <laughs> she slapped, she slapped that drum. <laughs> Somebody has slapped that guitar. Well, the, uh, <coughs> I'd love to talk about the trees that I want to save on this piece of property, but as you can see, they were <coughs> taken down without a permit, and that's why they don't need waivers. And if they had left the trees that were supposed to be there, um, they'd need waivers to do this. This is the greatest existential problem to the tree canopy that we have right now. What's going on? This is a perfect illustration. I'm really sort of glad it's, it's happening and we're, we're looking at it. It's not related putting in a, a big condo. It's the systematic destruction of small pieces of property all across the city, and especially in South Tampa. Bad actors are going in and they're just taking out the trees. I don't, I don't even know why this didn't keep going. But we have got to do something to stop that in its tracks. I'm hoping we can make it criminal. I'm hoping we can make it a misdemeanor. You know, take down a tree that's uh, protected and you're going to uh, have to uh, answer for it at a trial. This is, uh, this is one of these things that I really don't care what you do with this piece of property right now. But um, I do hope if they do something, they put the trees back that they took down. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, ma'am. Please state your name. <sighs> is it morning? Good morning. Um, you know. Yet. Oh, oh, okay. Um, you know, tomorrow in, in the morning, I'm, I'm going to Kentucky. And in Kentucky, it's okay to put bathtubs in your front yard. <laughs> I don't think it's code in Tampa. Sorry, not sorry. I'd like to point out that this whole non-conforming lot thing that bothers me. Oh, oops, sorry. Let me move it up. Zoom, okay, zoom, 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 zoom. Okay, so... I, I can't figure this math out because y'all know I can only do elementary math. Okay, so when you take a 91 foot lot and you shrink the setback to 15 feet instead of 20 feet, aren't you even closer to your neighbor than you would be if you had a 100 foot lot, right? Yeah, so your neighbor gets hosed not once, but twice because this, they, they're, getting nine, they're getting nine extra feet that they are going to be closer to their neighbor because it's only a 91-foot lot. You see what I'm saying? I don't know how you do the math, but y'all figure it out. Y'all are smarter than I am. That's why you're on council. Um, I like Bob's idea about making it a misdemeanor. You know what I like even better? I would love to see that if you cut down protected trees, you are not allowed to rezone or build anything on it for two years. That's just me. And I would like to remind you once again, it's in the coastal high hazard, and my lovely development in the CHHA. You know what? I very rarely print out documents, but I love this one so much. <coughs> Please remember that we're not supposed to have any new density in the CHHA. And when you go from one house to two houses, that's new density. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you very much. We have uh, two speakers online. I see Lorraine Perino. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Please say your name. Uh, Lorraine Perino. I'm the president of the Tampa Tree Advocacy Group. The builder of this property is asking City Council for, for the privilege of rezoning this property from RS50 to PB to build two houses on a lot zone for one. Stress rate builders wants permission to ignore existing zoning regulations for setbacks, height, and density. 
He wants all these special privileges, although the property is in the high coast, coastal high hazard area, and his plan contradicts Tampa Comp Plan's land use regulations. The builder wants two adjoining lots rezoned to his spec so he can double his millions of dollar profit by squeezing four houses onto two small lots. He has shown contempt for the city's tree codes by illegally re removing two protected trees from this lot without city permits. The illegal removal of valuable trees seems to be a pattern of his. In April 2022, this builder illegally removed a healthy 28-inch live oak from a lot on Davis Island. The protected tree located at the edge of the property was not in the TRC. Nonetheless, the builder illegally removed it while the city was engaging with him on reasonable reconfiguration to preserve the tree. Davis Island lost more than 10% of its tree canopy in the past five years due to building huge structures on small lots. Despite the city's efforts to preserve the protected tree, stress-free builders removed the live oak, deliberately violating the tree ordinance. Now he's done it again, this time illegally removing two protected trees. I've read the many opposition letters from neighborhood residents. They complain of yards and streets which already flood during heavy summer rain, threatening their very homes. No one in this neighborhood wants the existing zoning codes and tree regulations waived, so this builder can cram four houses onto two small lots. The letters plead with you to protect the neighborhood trees and characters of their neighborhood and are counting on you, City Council, to be their proxy vote to deny this rezoning request. The recently released 2021 Tree Canopy and Urban Forest Analysis informs us that South Tampa has suffered an 18% loss of tree canopy, more than any other area of Tampa. A quick look at tonight's agenda tells why. There are nine petitions to rezone properties from residential to planned development. One builder alone has filed three petitions to change zoning laws from residential to PD. And one lobbyist has filed four requests for the same zoning changes. Planned development should not be allowed at all. They exist only to remove valuable trees from established neighborhoods, split lots, and disregard existing setback height and flood codes. They deliberately destroy the charm and ambiance of Tampa's established neighborhoods and trees. The 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound bag argument applies here. The intentional disregard of zoning laws and tree codes to fit a large development into a too small space. City Council, you have a responsibility to all Tampa residents to protect Tampa's natural resources from the ambitious, greedy, and selfish, interested only in their own financial gain. Respect the tree codes that protect our neighborhoods and tree canopy. They need your no vote to stay healthy and thriving. Please Thank you very no much. to this directed rezoning request. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anybody else online? No? All right. Uh, that concludes public comment. Yes, sir. Petitioner has uh, rebuttal now. Uh, council. The, um, the proposal is for two single-family residential lots. I would uh, like to clarify that the setback, uh, should this be approved and go to, for first reading, would be 20 feet and not the 15 feet as shown. There are no waivers being requested. There's no green space waivers being requested. We have to comply with the tree and landscape code. The height of the building should be clarified to be 35 feet in height. The uh, R10 allows for this to be considered, and this does not create or uh, establish a new precedent in the neighborhood. As I showed you, the, the three houses directly abutting this to the south are all 50-foot lots. And then if you look south and westward, you can see that the blue areas are all 50-foot lots. Um, it is an area that is, that is redeveloping. And the property, this is the property here, and then the three lots directly behind it are all 50 feet. Excuse me, Mr. McLean, I'm sorry to interrupt, but did you want that into evidence? Because I don't know whether it is in this case. I, I think the, they've already it's taken in the, this. It's in the updated staff report? Yeah. It's not in the updated staff report, or is it? Mr. Hussein, could you mind? It, I'm sorry it, to interrupt it, you, sir. Could we stop is, the clock for Mr. This McLean? This is in. Madam this, Clerk. This is in your staff report already. Can you stop the clock from Mr. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. Uh, this was, the conform map was attached to staff report for just a general consensus of knowing the width of the adjacent lots for conforming matters. But there's no analysis. There is no analysis 
not needed due to the, the width meeting the standard. But the diagram is there. The it, diagram is within the staff report. The updated one as well. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Yep. Thank you. Yes, sir. Start the clock. Um, as I as I said before, there's no waivers for stormwater. The uh, after development conditions will be better than the current conditions regarding stormwater. Um, we're not asking for any exceptions regarding green space, tree replacements, um, or the density. The density relates to uh, the number of units you can build. It's R10, which is 10 units per acre, and we comply with that. Both the city staff and the planning commission found our proposal to be consistent. We respectfully request your approval. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? We have a motion to close from Councilman Vieira. Do we have a second? Second from Councilman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. What is the pleasure of council? Would anybody like to read this? I'll take a stab. It's your turn anyway. Okay, so it's my turn anyway. <laughs> so I did such a bang up job last time. Uh, move to deny REZ 2322 for the property located at 3108 West Coachman Avenue. Due to the failure of the applicant to meet his burden of proof to provide competent and substantial evidence that the development as conditioned and shown on the site plan is consistent with the comprehensive plan and city code. Failure to comply with the applicable goals, objectives, and, uh, and policies in the comprehensive plan. While the proposed rezoning may be allowed for consideration under the existing future land use designation, I find the resulting, results in, resulting lots are not consistent with the pattern of development for the immediate area, and the application is therefore not consistent with land use policy 93.9.3.8 which requires new residential redevelopment uh, projects to be minimally disruptive to the adjacent areas. And failure to comply with land development code 27136. Proposed development as shown on the site plan does not promote or encourage development that is appropriate in location, character, and compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood. The proposed lots are significantly narrower and width than the pattern of development on that portion of uh, Coachman Avenue and do not meet the RS-50 requirements. In addition, uh, from 27136, uh, I find that it fails to um, create a more desirable living and working environment than would be otherwise possible through stricter application of the minimum requirements for the zoning district. Um, and you know, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from <coughs> Council Member Hertag. Any discussion? Anybody? Yes. I, I always like to explain my vote because I voted uh, no on one I, um, before, you know, the distinguishing point from this is, and by the way, this is the first city council meeting in six and a half years. I've never worn a tie. So just for the record, that reflects how late it is. I'm gonna, that, you're you're going to get a commendation. There you go for, for chilling out. No, but, um, no, but uh, you know, here we have clean staff reports. We have no waivers. I see that as clear points of distinction. Uh, on this one, so uh, just my uh, my opinion, which I don't say that for discussion because it's late. I just say that for uh, explaining my vote because I always believe in doing that. Thank you. And I agree with what you said. No waivers were requested here, and um, yeah, it's different from the previous one. So, Councilman Clendon. Yeah, I mean, I would I would respectfully disagree because we talk about the. Um, requirements to uh, of, of how it fits with the um, development pattern on coachman which was one of the points that were made in the in the previous uh, case that we heard and this uh, is clearly subjected to the same criteria that th there's not a single lot on coachman that doesn't conform with uh, in the, with the euclidean type of zoning um, you know, I mean, when you looked at, the, I think there was some evidence that was put in the record talking about the percentage of a property that conformed to that type, to the existing Euclidean zoning. So, I, I think that you you look at this and you say these are these lots are less than five thousand. Five thousand is already a very small lot. I think one of the uh, persons testified that there's no that Tampa doesn't even have a zoning classification that has a lot that's less than five thousand, and they're asking for lots. Not, and the only reason they're able to, or would be able to develop this 
is if we granted a PD. And I think it's, it's an abuse of that process, and I think that they should be held to the same standard that other property owners are held for, too. Okay, Councilman Carlson. Yeah, I agree with uh, what Councilmember Clendenin just said, and um, you, you clearly see from looking at the maps the pattern of the development in the area, and um, what happens is one of these, you make an exception, it's, it's breaking lots of rules, and um, suddenly then the next one comes in and says, well, you let that one do it, and then the whole neighborhood changes, and that's not what the community wants. People invest in properties with the expectation that we're going to enforce the rules. And in this case, the rules are, are the, we're being asked to change the rules and it's not fair to the to other property owners. Thank you. Council Member Hurtag. Thank you. Um, I agree with the two uh, previous council members who spoke, um, but especially, uh, man, just forgot my thought. Um, in that, our um, <clears throat> we we have we have zoning for a reason. We have particular zoning uh, <coughs> sizes for a reason, and we we really need. Um, oh, that's what I was looking for. We it needs to be special and different. And there's I don't I don't find this lot to be special or different. So I'm I'm not I'm not thinking that I, I don't find that it d deserves or needs. Um, to be rezoned or considered for it. There, there's nothing. There's nothing that that lends me to to think that it should. Sorry, it's midnight. Roll call again. Yes, sir. Okay. I just want to add one more thing. Um, the the business journal has asked us over and over again in articles to be predictable and consistent, um, and they say that that's what investors want. And in this case, if we support this, we're not being predictable and consistent because people invested with the idea that we would be predictable and consistent in enforcing the rules. And if we change the rules, then we're not being predictable and consistent. Thank you. Oh, snapping, that's not allowed. Yes, sir. Let me just say this. I, I listened to this and I, I can't put what happened today or yesterday or last year on today's everyone, eight, nine, 10, they're all here, but they're all different. And, and you have to understand that we apply the rules as they come. In this case, there are no waivers. In this case, there's not much I can hand my teeth on and, and succeed. And I know the neighbors are here, and I know they, they spoke very eloquently, but maybe we have to change the rules on how things are done. A, on the trees being disappeared before the hearing, that should change, and B, and, C, and further on, that uh, if you want to change the lot size and make the rules to change, you can't change anything but this lot size that you're going to make a lot of lot, not only not conforming, but not usable, period. But these are the things that I look at, and in this case is different than the ones that I heard today. That's all I'm going to say. Roll call? And I have, I have one more thing to make. Is that, and it's just I, one more statement to make, and that's because I, I reviewed the criteria. So the request from uh, of, of, of the uh, applicant is to change this from a Euclidean zoning to a PD. But if you look at the criteria that for a planned development of PD, I don't see that they meet any of those burdens. So I mean, I don't know how we justify granting a PD if they have not met the criteria for a PD. I don't, I don't get it. Roll call. Okay. Carlson. The motion was motion to, to, to deny. deny. To Councilman Clendenin, second from Hertek. Yes, so, um, uh, yes. Hertek? Yes. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? No. Vieira? No. Miranda? No. Maniscalco? No. Motion to deny did not pass. Another motion is in order, Council. All right, who wants to make the motion? Someone needs to make a motion to approve it. Okay. You want to read it? Yes, if you would read it, item number nine. I know. My papers are everywhere now. Hold on. Here it is. I move file number REZ 23-22, ordinance being presented for first reading consideration. An ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 3108. 
West Coachman Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification RS50 residential single family to PD plan development residential single family detached providing an effective date. There is no revision sheet related to that, is that correct, or I, is there? I committed to a 20-foot rear setback and 35 feet in height. Okay, for the record, does that include, Mr. Hussein, did you catch that? Is there anything that we need to do any more than that? <coughs> Sir, did you catch that, uh, the, the, um, um, uh, the set, the changes that are to be made between first and second reading on the uh, representations of the, and there's a revision sheet as well, is that correct? In addition to the revision sheet, to add that to the revision sheet, is that acceptable, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, can you make that as part of your motion, please? Yes. And would you also then please add any criteria with regard to meeting its burden then? <clears throat> Do you have that information in front of you? I have a lot of things in front of me tonight. <laughs> Hold on. Mm -hmm. Again, this is item number nine. Nine. REC 23-22. 23-2 here it is. Move the ordinance, RZ. You did. You read the title. Okay. And if you could just find um, and make any findings with regard to the uh, the applicant um, meeting. Compliance with compatible goals and objectives and policies of the comprehensive plan. Um, section 27-136. Is that what you want to hear? Uh, yes, and did you want to say anything with regard to the, the, the um, staff report? I would say report? the whole thing. Proposed development as shown on the site plan promotes and encourages development that is appropriate in location, character, and compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood and the resulting lot meet, meet the minimum myth with requirement for the RS50 zoning district. Okay, thank you. Do a second? Second from Councilman Vieira. Uh, roll call vote. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to um, again say that I don't support this for many reasons, but mainly we have a, a criteria for plan development, and this actually doesn't meet those criteria. And uh, there's nothing special that makes this PD appropriate. All right, roll call. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Hertak? No. Um, Clendenin? No. Henderson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. <coughs> Motion pass. Thank with you, Council. Carlson, Hertak, Clendenin voting no. Second reading and adoption will be held on July 13th. 2023 at 9.30 a.m. in the old City Hall building located at 315 East Kennedy Boulevard, Tampa, Florida, 33602. Anybody Organized need? July 15, 1887. Anybody need, uh, need a break? There's no. no. I will say, may I say something really fast? Just that I don't, I don't know, it, may I, sir? Um, yeah, that ju just for the purposes of, I mean, we're at 12 o'clock and I still think we have six more. Uh, so just um, uh, to try to keep comments to minimum and move briskly, if possible. If there's something that's contested, obviously, let's, let's have at it. But just my opinion. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, sir. Zayn Hussein, Development Coordination. Agenda item number 10, case REZ 23-27. This is for the location 605 South Albany Avenue, proposed rezoning from RM16 to PD, residential, single family attached. I'll now pass along to our Planning Commission. MLA <coughs> Phelan, Planning Commission staff. The subject site is located within the Central Tampa Planning District in the South Howard neighborhood. The closest transit stop is located approximately 600 feet to the west at West Swan Avenue and South Howard Avenue. Hyde Park is the closest recreational facility located approximately 300 feet south of the subject site and the site is located with evacuation zone C. There's an aerial of the subject site. It's outlined here in purple. Um, the area is predominantly residential in character with a mix of single family detached and attached units surrounding the site. 
This is the adopted future <coughs> land use, the sites here represented by the residential 35 uh, future land use designation. And you can see that the subject site surrounds it and moving forward, moving towards the west and the southwest, it transitions into the community mixed use 35 designation. The average existing density on this portion of west of South Albany Avenue between West Horatio Street and West Swan Avenue is 24.34 units. The comprehensive plan promotes a residential development pattern consistent with the compact city form strategy with increased availability of housing at densities that promote walking and transit use near employment concentrations and residential services and amenities. The comprehensive plan encourages the design and development of single family attached projects to include the orientation of front doors to sidewalks and streets. Units one and two interface South Albany Avenue and units three and four face the improved alley west of South Albany Avenue. The site plan proposes two sidewalks connecting the entrances to units three and four to the sidewalk to South Albany. The request supports many policies in the comprehensive plan as it relates to housing, the city's population. The comprehensive plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure an adequate supply of housing is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future populations. And the proposed plan development is comparable and compatible with the surrounding development pattern is consistent with the density anticipated under the Residential 35 Future Land Use Designation, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? No? And if we could just be quiet in the audience, thank you. Yes, sir, Mr. Hussein. Thank you. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. I'll go ahead and show the aerial view of the property first, give you an idea of where this is located. As you see, the property right here. Right here, outlined in red, as you see uh, to the north, you have RM16 zoning. To the south, you'll have that RM24. To the uh, west, you'll have PD. And to the east, you'll have RM16. Uh, a few streets in the area. To the, to the north, you have West De Leon Street. To the south, you'll have West Swan Avenue. Out to the east, you'll have... Uh, south um, uh, Fremont Avenue and out to the west you will have um, South Howard Avenue running north and south. In the uh, surrounding area you'll have condominiums and also commercial use. I will now show you the site plan provided by the applicant on 4-12-2023. The proposed, uh, the proposed rezoning is for the development of four residential single-family attached units. Subject site is currently occupied by a residential single-family detached home at this time. Uh, the subject site is located on South Albany Avenue out here to the east. The subject site contains a lot area of 8,121 square feet or 0.186 acres. The proposed maximum building height is at 45 feet. A total of nine parking spaces are required and the applicant is providing 12 parking spaces. That's two garages for each unit and one guest space uh, in front of each unit. Um, the vehicular access for units three and four, as you see three and four here, uh, pr are provided from an alleyway to the west. And then vehicle access for units one and two are provided from South Albany Avenue. I will show the elevations provided by the applicant. The elevations for the east and west. And the elevation for the north and south. <clears throat> I'll now show you the pictures I took when I went out on site. <coughs> this is the current residential single family home structure.
this will be demolished and those four residential single family attached units are proposed. Another up close picture of the site. To the east of the site, you have condominiums. Another picture of more condominiums to the east. To the south of the site, you'll have residential single family attached, and also you'll lead to West Swan Avenue, which leads to more of Hyde Park. To the north, you have more residential single family attached and condominiums. You have West of Leon Street running east to west out there to the north. And to the northeast, <coughs> you'll see more residential Thank you. uh, in the proposed area. I will show you one more picture. I'm oh, sorry, one more time I'll show you the site plan provided by the applicant. The applicant uh, is requesting three waivers. Uh, that's to reduce the required use-to-use -use buffer, to allow the front doors to face the alley to the west, over here, and also request to reduce the required residential multifamily green space from 350 square feet per unit to 309 square feet per unit. Development Review and Compliance staff has reviewed the petition and finds the request to be inconsistent with the Land Development Code. See findings from Natural Resources to see the reasoning. Uh, should it be the pleasure of City Council to approve the application, the applicant must provide revisions to the revision sheet between first and second reading. Now, if the applicant makes those revisions uh, as of what Natural Resources uh, requested, Natural Resources would actually find this consistent. So, something to keep in mind there. Uh, if approved via council. Repeat that again. They would find it consistent Natural if... Natural resources would change their finding to consistent if the needed changes were made in between first and second reading. Thank you very much. Any questions from Mr. Hussein? No? Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. I guess it's good morning now, council. <coughs> Steve McElhaney. We know who you are. <laughs> just for the record. Just for the record. Just okay. for the record. Um, we have already committed to making the changes between first and second reading regarding natural resources. Um, I don't <clears throat> I don't want to belabor this, but we, we would then be found consistent. Um, we're allowed to, to develop the four units. We're surrounded by townhouses and condominiums, which much higher density than, than what we're proposing. Um, we do need the waiver for two of the units to access uh, off of the alley. We've confirmed that that was a, approvable by the fire marshal's office, and they had no objection to it. <clears throat> this is probably one of the last single-family houses in the whole area. The entire area now is, is uh, developed with uh, <clears throat> townhouses and condominiums. Waivers one and three disappear when we... Um, work with and commit to the revisions requested by staff. Um, the purpose is to promote efficient use and substantial use of the land, and it was found to be consistent. Allow the integration of the four units and the attached single family design is found to be compatible and consistent. <clears throat> Acknowledge that the change in needs of this area is already changing and is becoming a townhouse and multifamily district. Encourage flexibility for providing more parking spaces than are required. In addition to that, we we'll still will be meeting with the green space requirement uh, with the revisions requested by staff. Promote and encourage development where appropriate in location and character. This is already designed uh, to be compatible with the surrounding properties. Promote some more desirable living conditions. This is in the district that is doing exactly that, and we are compatible with that. 
promote the architectural design and features. We are compatible. The staff has reviewed the elevations. <clears throat> promote the retention and reuse of existing building stock. We're removing the one unit and replacing it, proposed for replacing with four townhouses. In terms of the waivers, the design of the proposed development is unique and therefore requires the waivers. The waiver, if allowed, would not substantially interfere. As I said, the only waiver remaining would be the, the facing of the front doors, and the fire marshal has agreed that that's approved is a is approvable. The waiver is in harmony with and consistently serves the general intent of this chapter. It never was meant to deny a project based upon that. And again, we're working with staff to uh, remove the other two requested waivers. Allow the, the waiver result in substantial justice being done, and it would be as it will allow this project to move forward. I'd like to cite the Planning Commission report and make that part of the record. It's late. I don't want to read all of that if you don't mind. Uh, but if you can just incorporate that by reference, I'd respectfully request your approval. We have received no indication from anyone that there were any concerns or objections to this project. Any questions for the applicant? Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on item number 10? Yes. Mr. Saint, could I see the pictures you took? Would that be appropriate? Oh. Now, that big old, that big tree. I'm sorry, sir. Could you state your name, please? Oh, uh, Bob Whitmore, executive city tree. City yeah. Tree. So I think this is the, uh, I think this is that secret, I think that's the secret um, waiver that they're going to get. There's no waiver. Well, are you going to keep that tree? No. What? So. I saw it peeking in one of these pictures and they're saying they're going to say hey we're going to do that next reading and I just don't trust them sorry so Aaron can you clarify sure uh, Aaron Mayor development coordination no this this tree is a I believe it's a 24 inch live oak that's in the right of way so no waiver is required to remove the tree it's a, it's a protected or it's a specimen, I can't recall at the moment. But um, as you can see, it, it's also been pruned pretty badly by Tico. And the, the vigor of the tree is just, I don't think it's worth preserving. What's the rate? <laughs> the rate, um, I think I rated this. It's, it's not a hazardous tree. It's just, you know, the vigor. I don't propose that it should be preserved when you're going to be constructing a brand new building. Is this the environmental? Uh, Thank you. Oh, should I not do this? No, no. Can I talk to you then? Yes. Uh, then address us, sure. No. Okay. Do you want to keep that? You can. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just curious as to what the environmental, what that environmental thing is that he's going to change to get things all right, right for the next reading. Thank you. Okay. Um, Aaron Mayor, development coordination. So we had discussed with the fire marshal <coughs> if the sidewalks are required because they're showing them right up to the property line. And as such, they would need waivers to the use to use landscape buffer to have them there. Fire marshal told us they didn't need to have the sidewalks. And if they remove the sidewalks, then they don't need a waiver for green space as well. So they removed two waivers by removing that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else wish to speak on this item? There's nobody online for this item. Any questions or comments from council members before I ask for a rebuttal? I hear none. Yes, sir, you have a rebuttal. Uh, we've committed to making the revisions uh, requested by staff. Uh, we respectfully request your approval. All right, may I have a motion to close? So moved. Motion to close second. from Councilman Vieira, second Council Member Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Council Member uh, Hertak, would you like to read item, or what is the pleasure of council? Anybody? No, if not, <laughs> Council Member Hertak, would you like to read it? Yeah. No? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm voting no, so probably no. Probably well, the minority. Yeah, then yeah. you don't. So, Council Member Clendenin. I move on Ordinance 2327. Uh, 
as the applicant has met its burden of proof, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, exactly, it's late. I move uh, I file number REZ 2327, uh, an ordinance rezoning property in the uh, general vicinity of 605 South Albany Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from the zoning district classifications, RM16, residential multifamily to PD, plan development, residential single family attached, providing an effective date with the uh, revisions that the applicant has uh, submitted that he would do before, between first and second reading. And I, I find that the, uh, the applicant is uh, compliance with the applicable goals and go uh, objectives and policies in the comprehensive plan and that the proposed rezoning is consistent with the land use policy 921 and housing policies 131, 133, and 134, which encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure that an adequate supply of housing is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future populations. In addition, compliance with uh, land uh, development code sections 23136, uh, proposed development as shown on the site plan promotes or encourages development that is appropriate in location, character, and compatibility with the surrounding neighborhood, which includes condominiums and commercial uses, and also compliance with sections 27139.4, such as the design of the proposed development is unique and therefore is in need of the waivers. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Councilwoman uh, Henderson, roll call. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm, I'm voting no on this because this is, I mean, once they take those sidewalks away, what are the people in the alley gonna do for garbage? What are they gonna do for mail? What are they gonna do? I mean, like the mailman's not gonna be able to get to them, packages, all that stuff. Um, this is the kind of development that we need to get away from. It's lazy. And I just, it's, the fourplex is just awful. There's a, there's a much better and nicer way to do it. And, but, but the sidewalk was the tipping point for me. You take away the sidewalk and they're just gonna build another sidewalk because they're gonna have to. And then everything goes out the window, but. Bless you. Roll call. Anything else? Hertek? No. Clinton? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Motion carried with Hertek voting no. Second reading and adoption will be held on July 13th, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. at the Old City Hall building located at 315 East Kennedy Boulevard, Tampa, Florida, 33602. Thank you, Council. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Hussain. Mr. Hussain, moving on to file uh, number 11. <coughs> Hussain Hussain, Development Coordination. Uh, agenda item number 11, case REZ 23-29. This location at 2002 North 62nd Street, 2002 North 62nd Street, Unit 1 half, and FOIL number 15988100000. Proposed rezoning from RS50 to IG. I will now pass along to our planning commission. Good morning. Uh, the subject site is located within the Central Tampa Planning District in the East Side Commercial Neighborhood. The closest transit stop is located one mile west of, at East Broadway and North 50th Street. Oak Park is the closest recreational facility located 0 0.62 miles northwest of the subject site and the site is located within evacuation zone D. Here's an aerial of the subject site, it's right here. Um, there's a mix of uses in the area. More of the industrial uses are located to the south, and there are some single-family detached uses and vacant land to both the north and the east and the west. The subject site is located here, and it's represented by the Transitional Use 24 designation, which surrounds the site to the northeast and nor northeast and west. And to the south of the subject site is the light industrial and the heavy industrial future land use designations. 
The transitional use 24 designation allows for wide ranges of uses, which has the potential of creating a development pattern that does not adequately mitigate for intense uses allowed under this designation. The proposed industrial general zoning can be considered under the transitional use designation and is consistent with the land development code consistency matrix. While there are existing detached single family units to the north and the west of the subject site, the comprehensive plan requires commercial uses to be appropriately buffered from any residential development. The comprehensive plan promotes compatible development and redevelopment to sustain stable neighborhoods and ensure the social and economic health of the city and discourages residential development near industrially zoned properties. Given the presence of the parcels currently zoned for industrial general and industrial heavy to the south of the subject site, the proposed industrial general zoning supports this policy direction by discouraging <coughs> the potential of residential development on the subject site. The proposed IG would provide for a development pattern that is comparable and compatible with the transitional use 24 future land use designation. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Yes, sir. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. I'll go ahead and show the aerial view of the property first. As you see the subject site outlined in red. Now to the north you have vacant land uh, that's zoned RS50. To the east you have vacant land that's zoned RM24. To the south you have a warehouse that's zoned IG. And to the west you have residential single family that is zoned RS50. Uh, the proposed rezoning is to allow for the, the development with industrial uses as he uh, is applying for IG. The property is located at 62nd Street and East 10th Avenue. The site is approximately one acre in size. I will show you the pictures I took on site. As you see, this is a vacant site. This is the site as is. Another angle, you'll see the public notice sign in the front and the vacant site behind it. To the north, you'll have um, vacant land and also past that vacant land, you'll have industrial uses. To the east, you will have also vacant land. And to the east and southeast, you'll have uh, the warehouse I was talking about. Development Review and Compliance staff has reviewed the application and finds this case to be consistent with the Land Development Code. I'm here for any questions. Anybody have any questions? Hearing no questions, is there an applicant? Yes, sir. Applicant online. State your name. Sam. Can you sir, hear me? Yes, we can. And can you raise your right hand and be sworn in, please? No, I've been sworn. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth and nothing but the truth? I will. Thank you. You may proceed. Good morning, Council. Uh, Joseph Brickelmeyer, 26736 U.S. Highway 27, uh, Leesburg, with Macklin Burns Law Firm, representing the applicant. Uh, Euclidean rezoning, as uh, Zane pointed out, we're compatible with area uses. My clients bought this property in 2009 and it was being used for its current use at that time, and they were not aware they were in violation until they were given a code enforcement action. About a year and a half ago now, um, the intent is to continue the use of a maintenance storage facility and open storage on the site, which is also allowed uh, under the IG zoning. For that, I don't have anything else to add unless council has questions given the hour. Are there any questions? No questions? Hearing none. Thank you, sir. Sure, welcome back. Thank you. That was the applicant. All right. Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on item number 11? I see no one, and uh, we have no other registered speakers online. Mr. Hussein, did you have anything? No, sir. No? 
Motion to close from Second. Councilman Miranda. Second from Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. What is the pleasure of council? Okie dokie. Councilwoman Hertek, would you like to read item number 11? Sure. It's always fun to actually move something to industrial general. It's very rare. So, um, file number REZ 23-29, ordinance being presented by first for first reading consideration, an ordinance rezoning the property in the general vicinity of 2002 North 62nd Street, 2002 North 62nd Street, Unit 1 half, and folio number 159881.0000 in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification RS50 residential single family to IG industrial general providing an effective date. We have a motion from Councilwoman Hertex and Councilmember Miranda. Roll call. Clinton. Yes. Anderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Vertec? Yes. Menscaco? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on July 13th, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. located at the Old City Hall, 315 East Kennedy Boulevard, Tampa, Florida, 33602. Thank you very much. Zane yes. Hussein, Development Coordination. Agenda item number 12, case REZ 23-30, at the location 2502 and 2504 North Boulevard, proposed rezoning from RM16 and RS60, two PD residential, multifamily, and all CN uses. I'll now pass it along to our Planning Commission. Emily Phelan, Planning Commission staff. The subject site is located within the Central Tampa Planning District in the, Ridge, in the Ridgewood Park neighborhood. The closest transit stop is located approximately 200 <coughs> feet north at North Boulevard and West Columbus Drive. Phillips Park is the closest recreational facility located approximately 490 feet northwest of the subject site. And the site is located within evacuation zone B. The subject site is here outlined in purple. Um, there's a mix of uses in the surrounding area, commercial uses along the corridor of, of West Columbus and residential uses as you move further south into the east of the subject site. This is the subject site. It's represented by the residential 35 designation and directly to the north and along Columbus Drive. This pink area is the community mixed use 35 designation and further to the south and also to the west is the residential 10 designation. Commercial neighborhood uses can be considered in the residential 35 designation if the site meets locational criteria and planning commission staff has found that the request is consistent with locational criteria. The proposed plan development is intending on utilizing both density and FAR for their project. The minimum lot size required to accommodate the CN uses in the residential 35 designation is approximately 3,334 square feet. After subtracting the minimum lot size required to accommodate the proposed CN uses, approximately 11,040 square feet can be considered for residential development. The plan development proposes eight dwelling units on the remaining parcel, and the applicant has entered into a bonus agreement for the one additional unit. Planning Commission staff finds the request consistent with the density and intensity anticipated under the Residential 35 designation. Planning Commission staff has reviewed the surrounding area and finds the request comparable and compatible, and the request supports policy direction that seeks to provide a transition from higher density to lower density single family areas. The request will be developed within the existing block, the block and lot configuration. Vehicular access to the site is provided from an alley to the west and also off of, Amel of West Amelia, which is encouraged by the comprehensive plan. The request supports many policies in the comprehensive plan as it relates to housing the city's population. The plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure an adequate housing supply is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future populations. 
in the plan development would allow for a development pattern that is consistent with the density and intensity anticipated under the residential 35 future land use designation. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? Mr. Hussein. Thank you. I'll first go ahead and show the aerial view of the property. As you see the property outlined in red to the north, you'll have residential, um, you'll have RS60 and CG zoning. This is a vacant land and also commercial. To the south, you have RS60, that is residential single family. To the east, you'll have RM16 zoning. This is residential single family semi-detached. And to the west, you'll have RS60 zoning, and this is residential single family. I'll zoom out just a little bit, give you a better idea where this was located. To the east, you'll have North Boulevard running north and south. To the north, you'll have West Columbus Drive running east to west. To the south, you'll have West Francis Avenue. And um, I'll say to the uh, west, um, east and west, but to the west here, you'll have North Glenwood Drive running north and south. I will now provide the site plan provided by the applicant. The proposed rezoning is to allow for mixed use development comprised of residential multifamily eight dwelling units and commercial neighborhood uses on this site. The property is currently vacant at this time and is located on south of West Columbus Drive and northwest corner of West Amelia Avenue and North Boulevard. The site, the site plan submitted identifies a two-story structure. So as you see the site here, a two-story structure encompasses the site uh, containing 8,204 square feet with two ground level commercial units, as you see, commercial units, each containing 1,000 square feet of commercial space, which overall uh, would be providing 2,000 square feet of neighborhood uh, serving commercial uses, and also eight residential multifamily units. The commercial uses front North Boulevard, right here with the resi residential units located on the second floor um, of the proposed structure. The ground level contains associated residential use of storage area for residents only and is provided one <coughs> per unit here uh, to the west. The proposed uses require a total of 22 parking spaces and 22 parking spaces are being provided by the applicant. Bicycle parking spaces are located just north of the building. Let me see. Where was it? Uh, north of the building. Uh, the applicant is proposing to improve the alleyway on the west side, right here. And also proposes a point of access allowing for vehicle parking on the western boundary of the site. The structure proposed contains an open area on the ground level which will accommodate surface parking, as you see the surface parking uh, throughout the ground level. Given the subject site containing 14,374 square feet or 0.33 acres, the applicant proposes to construct the 2,000 square foot of commercial neighborhood uses. The remaining square footage uh, allows for a total of seven units uh, and eight, seven units by right and eight units are allowed with a bonus provision met. The applicant is proposing to develop eight units on the site and has entered into a bonus provision agreement for that one additional unit, which um, the applicant will provide the bonus provision agreement with the second reading. So it will conjoin together. I will now show the elevations provided by the applicant. First, we'll start with the retail frontage. As you see, the elevation to the east. The elevation to the west. The 
the elevation to the south. And the elevation to the north. As I went out to the site and took pictures, I will show you what I saw. First, I will show you the vacant site as is. To the south, you'll have a residential structure. To the northeast, you'll have uh, commercial space, residential, and also vacant land. More uh, residential single family homes to the south. To the east, you'll have residential single-family semi-detached. <coughs> to the west, you'll have residential single-family. And also to the west, you'll have that alley, as the site's right here, the alleyway right here to the west. I will go ahead and show the site plan one more time. The applicant is requesting three waivers. Um, first one is to reduce the required multifamily green space from 350 feet per unit to uh, 310 square feet per unit. The second one is to request or reduce the required 20% VUA green space to 13%. And the third is to request or reduce the required uh, landscaping buffer. Development Review and Compliance staff has reviewed the application and finds the request to be inconsistent with the Land Development Code. And for this, you should see the findings from Natural Resources. Should it be the pleasure of City Council to approve the application, the applicant must provide revisions to the revision sheet between first and second reading. I'm here for any questions. Any questions? Nope. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll hear from the applicant. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Isabel Albert with HAF um, Associates representing um, the applicant for this project. I do have a, a presentation. If this can come up, please. It's, it's up. You. If we can get it on our screens. There we go. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, think I'm, I feel like I'm using the pointer instead of the up. <laughs> I'm applying someone here. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so... Zane explained it very well. He's exactly where the site is. It is currently zoned RMC 16 and RS 60. Uh, we also have recently got approval for a comp plan amendment for, it's actually Res 35. But, and then unfortunately I have Res 30 there. So I can't see my presentation because of the writing on top of it. So I'm just gonna follow it from here. So what we have for you today is a mixed-use development. Um, and the first story is a 2,000 square foot of retail shown here in the sort of pink area. Um, and then the residential unit is located on the second floor, which hoovers over the parking area. And then also we have those uh, storage area for the, uh, specifically for the residential um, units for the apartments. We have, um, and I think it's, what's shown here is when we received the application, that the staff report that found it inconsistent, it was inconsistent because of natural resources comment that the uh, retention pond is encroaching into the radius of the protective um, radius for the tree. And we wanted to protect that tree, so we went back and redesigned the pond to split it to make sure that we met that radius. 
and this is what's found seen on the right hand side and wanted to show that to natural resource staff to Erin to say hey is this what you're looking for and she's like yes this actually meets what I have and with meeting that then it will find a consistency um, application but as it stands today in front of you it's that striped pond so just to help out with the, the the drawing the elevation could be a bit difficult what you see in blue is actually what you can see through so the building is there with some pass through on the sides to go in the back and this is facing from North Boulevard this is from Amelia um, you can see there the retail portion of it with the rear was the parking and then on top of it is what you're going to see for the um, the apartments and then from the rear this is facing uh, from the parking area looking in the area um, that's sort of beige is actually uh, recessed inside and the uh, residential is on top of it mm. So this comes back to the waivers. Um, so one of them uh, that Zane didn't explain, didn't say, is one of those access to a local street. That's a waiver that we have to request, and that's how it's um, being accessed. And also the, the reduction in multi-green space from by 11%, uh, the reduction of the uh, vehicle use area from 20 to 13, and the redu reduction of the buffer from five to three feet on the south side. <coughs> Again, that's the um, uh, request. Uh, we have met with uh, both Neighborhood Association, um, the Ridgewood, sorry, the Ridgewood Association with uh, Katie Elderman. Uh, we had different discussions and they have no objections to the application, as well as Tampa Heights Civic Association with uh, Brian Seal that also said he had no objections to this application. And I'm here if you have any questions. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank Do we have you. anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Bob Whitmore, Executive Director of City Tree. Another wall to wall to wall development. No green space, no place to mitigate trees, no place to add to the trees that we're losing. It is street to street to street to street. And while I appreciate them trying to save that tree, once again, a developer has to be told to save the tree. I don't want to come back here, and I don't want to keep people till 11, 3 o'clock, whatever. As long as I know that trees are going to be saved, and we don't have to watch out for these things, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So I ask that you send them back to the drawing board. You, you make them put in a little bit of green space for the people in that neighborhood, if anything, but you know, basically, again, for the opportunity to mitigate and put some trees um, where there are no trees. And I see a lot of trees being encroached upon. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? I, Motion closed. Wait, do we have uh, any rebuttal from the applicant? Uh, <clears throat> William Malloy, 325 South Boulevard, proudly uh, representing this applicant. I just want to make clear to the council that tree was never in danger. The issue was the dry pond and whether or not it was an encroach underneath the canopy. The tree wasn't going anywhere. Uh, just want to make that clear. Thank you. <coughs> and furthermore, yes, we had no intention of removing that tree. And furthermore, we are replacing some more trees on the property just to make it. We're doing what? Say it again. Replacing more We are trees putting on additional property. trees on the property. Now, can we do a motion to close? Second. Go ahead. Motion we have close. a motion to close from Council Member Clendenin, and second from Council Member Vieira. All in favor? Aye. 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 Council Member Carlson, I believe it's you. And then we have the bonus, the resolution afterwards. Oh, wait, after that second reading, I'm sorry. To move on. <coughs> File number REZ 2330, ordinance being presented for first reading consideration, ordinance rezoning property in general vicinity of. No, oh, somebody say something. <laughs> in the general vicinity of 2502 and 2504 North Boulevard in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in Section 1 from Zoning District Classification RM16 Residential Multifamily and RS 
60 um, residential single family to PD plan development, residential multifamily, and all commercial neighborhood uses providing effective. Second. Rate. We have a second from Councilmember Henderson. Roll call. Second. I'd like to make a statement on it. Yes, me too. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, and be, be real quick. This is exactly what we should have PDs for. This is the type of project, you know, as opposed to these residential areas that we're looking at. I mean, this we're we're engaging a street. We're we mixed use development. This is this is what a PD is made for. So I I, I fully support this. Thank you, Councilwoman Hertek. Um, and I, I I wholeheartedly agree. But not only that, the detail and the thought of bringing the uh, retail above the parking back. I mean, the urban Tampa Bay. I hadn't read that before, but that's exactly what I wanted to say. It's it's really well thought out. Um, it's unique. It's it's solving the problem we have, and I don't think you said it, but I believe I got, uh, I believe Miss Wells talked to me about it in our um, planning. That but the um, the bonus agreement is going to be one unit of affordable housing. We've closed the the oh, yeah, sure. yeah. So but um, mm -hmm. that's uh, so I don't know if I'm allowed if yeah. I'm allowed yes. to bring you text. Well, you, you Okay, well then never mind. Okay. But uh, I just wanted to say that this is the kind of development that, that we're looking for, the creativity, the outside the box thinking, and I appreciate that. Um, yeah. We don't say that enough. Yes. Council Member Carlson. Yeah, I agree with my two colleagues, and it's good that we have urban design in, in an urban area. Um, but also I have to include in my motion revision sheet. All right, we have a motion from Council Member Carlson, <coughs> second Council Member Henderson, that it also includes a revision sheet. Mm -hmm. I think the property owner named Cowboys and Pirates LLC is great. <laughs> yeah. I noticed that. Uh, let's take a roll call vote. Yeah, I just wanted to say really oh. quickly to, you know, it's also in a transient corridor, I mean, um, transportation <coughs> corridor, which is really great um, for the Tampa Heights community. So I was glad to see something like this come to the dais. Thank you. Roll call. Henderson. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Vieira. Yes. Miranda. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Hertak. Yes. Clendenin. Yes. Maniscalco. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on July 13th, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. Located at the Old City Hall building 315 East Kennedy Boulevard, Tampa, Florida, 33602. 49 July 15th, 1887. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. So sleepy. Motion to go to sleep. Motion to go to sleep. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. Good night. Zany Sane Development Coordination. Agenda item number 13, case REZ 23-31. Uh, this is at the location 2709 West North B Street. Proposed rezoning from RM16 to PD residential single family attached. I'll now pass along to our planning commission. Before I begin my presentation, the Planning Commission needs to correct the future land use map that was submitted with the staff report. It is the incorrect, staff, uh, incorrect future land use map, and I have copies of the correct one to enter into the record. Okay. So move if necessary. Yeah, move second. To put that into the record. Second, Councilmember. Uh, motion from Councilmember Vieira, second, Councilmember Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah. All right. Um, the subject site is located within the Central Tampa Planning District in the West Tampa Urban Village and the Armory Gardens neighborhood. The closest transit stop is located two blocks south at, Ken at West Kennedy Boulevard and Arwana Avenue. Vila Brothers Park is the closest recreational facility located 0.2 miles northeast of the subject site, and the site is located within evacuation zone D. Uh, this is the aerial of the subject site. It's located here in our line in purple. The surrounding area is residential in character with single family detached residences present between North 
West North B Street and West Fig Street. Single family attached dwellings are to the south of the subject site and just west of North A Street as well. This is the future land use map of the subject site. It is outlined here and represented by the residential 20 designation. And as you move further west across uh, west to North Havana Street, it turns into the residential 10. <laughs> Um, this portion of West North B Street, excluding the subject site and the vacant parcels per the property appraiser, has an existing density of 8.77 units per acre, which is below the density anticipated under the Residential 20 Future Land Use designation. The proposed rezoning would allow for consideration of up to three residential dwelling units at an overall density of 16.6 .6 units per acre. Planning Commission staff finds that the request is comparable and compatible with this portion of West North B Street and is below the density anticipated under the Residential 20 designation. The request will provide infill in -fill development on a site that is presently underutilized, which is encouraged by the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan encourages single family attached residential uses to be designed to include orientation of the front door to a neighborhood sidewalk and street. The front entrances are oriented toward and connect to the sidewalk on West North B Street, meeting the intent of these policies. This request supports many policies in the comprehensive plan as it relates to housing the city's population. The comprehensive plan encourages new housing on vacant and underutilized land to ensure an adequate housing supply is available to meet the needs of Tampa's present and future populations. Additionally, the comprehensive plan seeks to direct the greatest share of growth to urban centers and villages, and the proposed PD supports this policy direction by creating additional housing opportunities within the West Tampa Urban Village. The proposed PD balances the need to be sensitive to surrounding uses in the neighborhood while providing additional housing options with the residential 20 future land use designation. And this concludes my presentation. Any questions? Mr. Hussein? Zane Hussein, I will go ahead and show the aerial view of the property. <coughs> As you see the property right here outlined in red. Surrounding the property are all residential single family homes to the north, south, east, and west. And these are all zoned RM16. I will zoom out just a little bit to give you a uh, bigger view, bigger picture of where the site is. To the west, you'll have North Habana Avenue. Uh, to the south, you'll have West North B Street. To the east, you'll have uh, North oh God, Ar Arowana Avenue. And to the north, you'll have West Fig Street. I will now show the site plan provided by the applicant. The proposed uh, rezoning is for the development of three residential single-family attached units. As you see, one, two, three. The subject site is currently occupied by a residential single-family detached home. The subject, uh, subject property is located on West North B Street. The subject site contains a lot area of 7,820 square feet or 0 0.18 acres. The proposed maximum building height is proposed at 35 feet. Uh, a total of seven parking spaces are required, and the applicant is, actually, is uh, providing 12 parking spaces. Uh, there's a two-car garage for each unit, and also the applicant is proposing two cars in front of each unit also. Vehicle access is provided from an alley to the north. I see the alley right here to the north. And you'll have West North B Street here to the south. Uh, the applicant provided elevations, as I will show you now. As you see, the elevation to the south, to the north, 
to the east and to the west. As I went to the site, I took pictures, and I'll show you what I saw. First off, I'll show you the current residential single-family structure on site. To the south, you'll have residential single-family structure. To the southwest, you'll have more residential single-family structures. Directly west, you'll have a residential single-family structure. To the east, uh, you'll have residential single-family leading to downtown Tampa. And to the southeast, you'll have residential single-family structures. I will show you the site plan one more time. The applicant is requesting three waivers. The first is to allow a reduction in aisle width from 24 feet to 12 feet. Second is to reduce, to a request to reduce the use to use buffer uh, from the required five feet to two feet on the west side. Uh, and the third is request to reduce the required front setback uh, from 23.2 feet to 12 feet for urban design. The development review and compliance staff has reviewed the petition and finds the request to be inconsistent with the land development code. Uh, for this finding, uh, please see the transportation findings, and I have Johnson Scott here if needed. Should it be the pleasure of city council to approve the application, the applicant must provide revisions to, to the revision sheet between first and second reading. I'm here for any questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, what's on the other side of that alley? Uh, residential single family. And is it, it is it their driveway or what's what, what does it face? Is it um, just a fence or is it backyard? Just an asphalt alley. No, but what's on the other side? Yeah, I uh, I did not get to like go. When back they back there. up, what are they backing into? With only because the alley is only twelve feet wide, right? Let's uh, I'll zoom into the aerial view. Uh, as the property is here, there's an alleyway here. It looks like that's residential, uh, single family. Uh, and it looks like that'll biker. be their rear, their backyard. Yeah, their rear so rear. what's, and that two feet that you showed on the site plan, what, can you explain that on the side? The two feet. On the site plan. Okay, I'll go to the site plan. On the left side there, bottom left. Can you make, zoom out the other way? Your other out. <laughs> <laughs> what am I looking at? Two feet. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's the issue. Correct. So uh, let's see. The second waiver requests to uh, reduce the use to use buffer from the required five feet to two feet along that west side. <coughs> and that's this right here. Use to use buffer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you move it down just a little <coughs> bit? And in your revision sheet, make uh, have it spelled correctly. Just gonna throw that in there. Alley must be paved in its entirety. Sorry, it's like one in the morning. But as an editor, that's wrong. <laughs> I saw oh, it. I can't say no. Oh, in in it is entirety. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna have to take a recess. You have to correct that. Oh my I'm kidding. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Oh. I said in the revision sheet. I like when people use your and your. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, done. sir. Anything else? Are I you done? We were hear from transportation. Are we gonna hear from transportation? No. No, not unless you have questions for transportation. No, no, no. All right, then we go to the applicant.
Uh, good morning again, Council. Steve Michelini for the record. Um, this, this is a substandard alley. Uh, I recognize that it's a substandard alley. One of the waivers is to request that we still be allowed to use it. But we had, we had, we were stuck between a rock and a hard place because we, we either had to comply with the West Tampa overlay, which means we had to use the alley and, and the walkways were in the front, or uh, if we had the access in the front, we wouldn't, we wouldn't need a waiver except from the West Tampa overlay uh, requirements. So I, that's the only, um, the only issue that we cannot resolve between first and second reading. We're committing to making the revisions according to the, the sheet provided by natural resources. By, uh, <clears throat> by density, we're allowed to develop three townhouses. There's a four foot uh, buffer and a, on the west and a 10 foot, I'm sorry, four foot on the west and a 10 foot buffer on the east. Um, I think some of these codes, I mean, we, we need to kind of look at them uh, introspectively and figure out if you're forcing us to access from the rear, what are we going to do when the alley is not, not up to code? And that's transportation's objection is that the alley simply isn't wide. Uh, w we have designed these uh, parking structures and the visitor parking in such a way where we will be able to remove uh, maneuver. The, 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 the parking here is all enclosed. These parking spaces on the outside are, are there for visitor use. Um, as the staff pointed out, it's 7,800 square feet. It's compatible with the development pattern in the area. It's a residential 20 in terms of land use density and we're below that. We have 12 parking spaces when we're, we're not required to have that many. Um, we agreed to comply with the arborist recommendations regarding saving a 28 inch oak. Um, and uh, we'll have, we're working with the uh, natural resources to, to put the, that, that's in the revision sheet that we're committing to. 35 feet in height and um, generally we're preserving the, seat, the trees and, and landscaping that's provided on the site. The, um, the planning commission report, um, and I have to go through this, I have to apologize to you. Promote the official, uh, efficient and sustainable use of land the property of the north, south, and east are all residential family, but the lots are zoned RM16, so the potential for multifamily already exists. Allow the integration of different uses with the three residential property attached. The residential structures <coughs> are adjacent, and you may see more of these coming forward with this type of land use and zoning. We've committed to 35 feet in height, which is a typical residential height structure um, for the height. We're encouraging flexible use of, of the land. A total of seven spaces are required for parking. We're providing 12. Two of them are inside the, each of the garage units and two of them outside. And again, we're working with transportation regarding maneuvering and we recognize that it's a substandard alley. That in and of itself justifies the waiver. We cannot replat and make the alley any wider than it is. Promote and develop and encourage a location and compatible with the surrounding neighborhood and we have been found to be consistent with that. Promote desirable living conditions and residential families is, co is compatible with the surrounding neighborhood which is developed in residential uses west, north, east, and south. Promote more de desirable living conditions <clears throat> and war working environments the residential single family is compatible with the surrounding neighborhood, which is developed in residential uses. Promote the architectural features. We're compatible with that in the West Tampa overlay, and they've, Hartman Design has reviewed our uh, submission and found it to be compatible and consistent. <clears throat> um, the design is promoting and has been reviewed by the city and complies with the West Tampa overlay. The waivers, if not allowed, will substantially interfere with the rights of others. Again, we can't change the width of the alley. We're provided with that width, and we have to deal with it as, as it's platted. 
The waivers in harmony and reserves and general intent of the chapter and other applicable City of Tampa development regulations has been found by the Planning Commission, who is the reviewer of the chapter on comprehensive plan to be consistent and compatible. Allowing the waiver will result in substantial justice being done considering the public and private benefits. And uh, lastly, we've been found to be consistent with the, uh, with the Planning Commission report, and we've committed to making the revisions that the staff has stipulated that on second reading we will be found consistent if we make those changes. Uh, I'd like to have the report of uh, the Planning Commission be received and filed and made part of this record so that I don't have to reread it. And I appreciate your time. That concludes my presentation. Do you have a quality picture of the alley right now? Because it says that it's asphalt, so. We're required as part of our, uh, if this is approved, we're required to repave the alley from one end to the other, the entire alley. So it will be brought up to City of Tampa standards at our expense. Because it's 12 feet, which is the transportation issue, um, <clears throat> is it possible that the, the alley requires everyone to drive one way does it you have to that's a jonathan scott question but because it's only 12 feet right usually with that width it, it is designated as a one-way alley mm -hmm. and jonathan scott mobility the uh, alleys are typically uh, two-way they're not one way unless we uh, come in there and sign them one way which is kind of rare but otherwise they're two-way First come, first serve. Yeah. Basically, yeah. It's, yeah, uh, I mean, that's how we do if it. If there's a lot of traffic on them, we'll go one way on once in a while, but uh, very rarely. But does transportation deem this to be a usable alley? Uh, yes, this is okay. a usable alley. But not wide enough? Well, it's uh, a lot of alleys are about, you know, 10 to 20 feet. It's, uh, it's really... Uh, it's a tight backup for the spaces in the driveways, let's say. But uh, the petitioner, I'll let him justify his uh, waiver for that uh, part of it. Well, we can't replat the subdivision. We can't make it wider. One of the things that probably, this is a, kind of an aside comment, that needs to be looked at is when the when the West Tampa Overlay District was indicating, you know, it requires you to use an alley, that we probably need to know when when that should not be applied. Uh, and we really don't have a, a lot of choice in that. And as I said, and I and I confirm this with, with transportation as well, that if, if we flipped if we flipped the site and ignored the West Tampa overlay and had the access in the front with the front garage, we we wouldn't have that problem. Yeah, but we wouldn't approve that because well, it would be a, it would re, it would require a waiver of right. the West Tampa overlay, so that's why I said we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Complying with the West Tampa overlay causes an a you know a concern from transportation because of the width, uh, but the development criteria means we have to pave that alley from one end of the block to the other and improve it to City of Tampa standards. So that that's that's a very expensive process. But it's something that we've committed to, and it's on the site plan. Okay. Yes, sir. You see, you're you're only uh, so the issue is you know backing into the alley. You're only one car because um, you really you're only re required to have seven, right? Correct. So there's really only one car in an alley that really is above and beyond like the, 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 the other one's a bonus. Right. Um, we. Um, we can we can restrict that we don't I mean it's it's shown on there for diagrammatical purposes um, but this is another issue that I've discussed with Jonathan Scott and we can show only one it's not a required parking um, scenario so you know we, we can we can do that okay, thank you it's a, obviously a, part of the revisions we have to make between first and second reading all right, any other questions? Nope, public comment. Anybody here from the public wish to speak on this item 13?
Mr. Chairman. If I may, just a minute. There we go. Jerome Adcock. Thank you. Adrian Laramie. Thank you. Uh, Caroline Bennett. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie Pointer. Thank you. Um, and Allison Hewitt. Thank you. I have Survivors. one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> and three makes eight. Hopefully, I won't Thank need you. it. Let me get this. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Maybe not. There you go. Does everybody have a copy? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, it's not good evening. Good morning, City Council. My name is Sandy De Diego Sanchez, and I live in the Armory Garments community, a block away from the proposed site. This request for rezoning was a 30-day notice. A week after the sign notification, the applicant asked to have a meeting with the community. I explained that some folks hadn't had time to even see the notice, much less respond. Because of this, the negative neighborhood feedback did not come to a head until this last weekend. The negative comments came from uh, residents on North B and also on Fig Street. Please see item number one on your uh, packet, which is basically the city uh, map that they gave you showing all the RM16s and a few RM18s, and there's one PD uh, on North A that's part of the Kennedy Boulevard overlay. The comprehensive plan which you now have the correct copy, which was incorrect in the staff report, shows that everything around this property is RM16. There's not another PD within the Armory Gardens community. The only one showing is that property that I mentioned there's on the Kenry Boulevard. There are three waivers that are needed. Request to allow a reduction in aisle width from 24 feet to 12 feet. Please go to page three, which is the diagram. I have added the dimensions of some cars in a diagram of the 90 degree radius that is needed to park in the driveway or garage. Since the 24 feet are not available, those cars will be parking on the street, jeopardizing the safety of a community with no sidewalks. The transportation found this to be inconsistent, both in the city staff report and the comprehensive plan. The second request for the site plan that the Sire and also Plant Pipe presented was to reduce the use buffer from the required five feet to the west to two feet. Some of you know that we had seven homes built on, on Fig Street, two of them next to me. They were five feet apart, away from me. If I was two inches taller, I could open my bathroom window and touch the, the, the fence of my new neighbor. When I have coffee in the morning and I look out of my kitchen window, I can watch my neighbors have breakfast. That's what five feet is, and that will be changing in the West Tampa overlay to seven. So when do we consider the simple amenities like privacy? Two feet is just too, too close. The other re request for the re reduce the required front setback from 23.2 feet to 12 feet per the West Tampa overlay. Per that overlay, and I quote, at no time may the waiver exceed the average front setback of the two adjacent properties. City Council, all homes on this side street line up with a common setback. Please remember that the West Tampa overlay guidelines are primary for consideration. There are two plexes within 50 feet of the proposed site. The one is across the street if you go to page four and it was built, finished, completed in 2019. This triplex is directly across the street from the proposed site. It was built under the original zoning designation of RM16. There were no design exceptions or waivers needed. 
Garage access are through the alley where the West Tampa overhead guidelines and the 24 feet owls needed for the 90 degree city ordinance are evident. This property is 14,000 square feet. If you go to uh, page five, you will actually see the alley that Mr. Michelini says needs to be improved. This is the triplex that is on faces Fig Street. This is the alley between North A and Fig Street. That alley is 13 feet wide and the apron to go to the driveway is 24 feet. Obviously big enough to make the necessary turn. The garage entry is through the back per West Tampa overlay and the guidelines are easily showed. This is built on 10,000 square feet and all this without a PD designation. Please look very quickly behind the last page of your packet and you will see a very crude drawing <laughs> to show you where that number five, that, that uh, triplex is in relation to the site. I, I, I drew that while I was sitting here, so I apologize for the crudeness of it, but I just wanted to tell you that if Mr. Michelini had just taken a walk in the alley, he would have seen that half of it is already paved, and that alley is 13 feet wide. I even gave Mr. Scott a ride through that alley so he could see that that alley was clear. The pro applicant's property is 7,800 square feet, about 2,500 square feet, difference from the other triplexes. The proposed site plan shows it does not have the footage for the required turning radius needed. These cars, cars will end up in the front street. Remember, there is no parking allowed in the alleys. The reason the applicant would like the zoning change on this piece of property is because he's trying to put, and I hate to say it, we've said it five times today, tonight, the proverbial 10 pound uh, uh, of potatoes into a five pound bag. If you grant him the PD designation, you will be jeopardizing the safety of the men and women and children that are forced to use the streets as we have very few sidewalks. The one sidewalk on North B is on the opposite side and it is just in front of the triplex. No other sidewalks there and no other sidewalks on the rest of the street. You can tell by the pictures that I have presented that the Armory Gardens community is not opposed to responsible increase in density and we certainly have nothing against duplexes or triplexes that have sufficient property and don't require waivers. I'm amazed that staff would find this consistent. It is not. I'd like to quote a short part of the city staff summary. And I must say, I'm offended and you should be offended too. And I quote, allowing the waiver will result in substantial justice being done Considering both the public benefit intended to be secured by this chapter, other applicable city of Tampa land development regulations, the Tampa Comprehensive M, and the individual hardships that will be suffered by failure of city councils to grant this waiver, unquote. Is that a threat to you? Is that a bias? I don't understand where justice comes into making this decision. There is no public benefit from this development and where would the justice be served to the Armory Gardens community, a community that is constantly struggling to keep their residents safe. This is a frivolous request for rezoning to PD. It would set a serious precedent in this community that has been fortunate enough to ward off the PD open book that ignores waivers and overlays. The West Tampa overlay and city ordinances are risks, ordinances that, ordinances that are there to protect the quality of different neighborhoods. I have given you clear, com competent, and substantial evidence why this rezoning should not be granted. I've shown you pictures to show that that alley could be used, and it does not meet the objectives and policies of the comprehensive plan. Please Thank deny you. this applicant's request. Thank you very much. Any questions? Anybody else for public comment? <laughs> Yes, sir. Please state your name. You have three minutes. Were you sworn in? Yes, okay. at five o'clock. At five o'clock. Yesterday. Is that in the morning or in the evening? I, I don't even remember. This is a new day. Yes. Good morning, Jonathan Sigrand. I am a neighbor in on North B Street. 
Um, I've voiced concern on topics before, um, but now this is directly, basically in front of my face, so I felt the need to come in and speak on behalf of myself and my family. Um, so what they're trying to do is you're knocking down one and you're building back three. That's too common in our neighborhood and it needs to stop. That, like they said, it's going to continue to go on and it's, this needs to stop. Uh, you want to put $1.5 million home, go ahead. But you're going to put a two-story shed and sell it for $500,000. And that's not appealing and that's not going to fix your affordable housing crisis. Um, the school boundaries. Um, has been a topic that's been in our neighborhood. Um, I moved in in 2012. I built my home. I bought my home. Um, I didn't come up here and cry for any variances to try and get anything fixed. So now my kids may not be able to go to the same school. Five, ten years from now, when it comes to going to play in high school, the, the boundaries may be shut short because you're putting one home, knocking it down, putting three. Now there's two, six, ten kids on that same property that it wasn't there before. So now the continuing crowding of the schools is going to continue. Um, so the, the, the neighborhood that we are in is family living. These homes are not projecting to the family. You may be there one year, two year, or it's going to be a dorm rented out to some UT kids from, got kids from New York that have plenty of money. Um, you want to talk about the cars in the parking lot. I don't know anybody in this room that has a two-car parking lot, st standard two-car garage that has two cars in it. <laughs> Unless you have too many Coopers, that ain't happening. Um, the, the, the alleyway to make those turns, it's not happening. The triplex that's, that's on the opposite side of the street, like she said, there's a lot of room back there. And there's trees and, and, and poles and fences and big trucks <laughs> and all that's not going through. If you're going to shut down the variance, the garbage truck's not going to get back there. What do you think is going to happen to the garbage cans? They're going to be in front of the house. Always. So now you've got your mailbox, your garbage cans, and then the cars that can't park back there in the street. Then they're going to park in front of my mailbox, and I'm not going to get my mail. Uh, people walking in the streets because there's no sidewalks. So now that's going to be uh, pedestrian versus vehicle. If a garbage can't get to the truck into the back alley, fire trucks aren't going to get back there. If you're double parked in the street, fire truck's not going to get through the street. Garbage man's not going to be able to pick up the garbage can with the double parked. Um, this, this continue these projects like this need, need to stop. So it's just big builders trying to take up the advantage of the people getting money. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to speak? All right, Mr. Michelini, if you have a rebuttal. Um, Council, you've heard a lot of speculation about what could happen. And as I said to you, we, we, had, a, we had the choice of meeting the West Tampa overlay, which requires access from the alley. I can't, I can't change that. I can't change the 12-foot platted alley. Um, one thing that I can tell you about is that the West Tampa, the West Tampa CRA just committed $250,000 to study the alleys and determine which ones can be effectively used with an entire inventory. And that will go a long way toward eliminating these kind of confusing situations where we, we don't know, I mean, I don't want to come to you and say waive the West Tampa overlay for access and driveways and garages in the front. So we're being penalized and criticized because we're using the alley that's, that's mandated by the West Tampa overlay. Um, we've committed to making the changes between first and second reading that are on the revision sheet. We don't have the, the only remaining revision, uh, I mean, the only remaining waiver that we have is reducing the alley width from 24 to 20 to 12 feet. We have 21 feet from the back of the garage to the edge of the property line. Uh, that's that's this dimension here from here to there is 21 feet. 
So there's sufficient room there to park at least one car. Um, I appreciate the fact that others believe that we don't have to repave the alley, but that is a requirement. It's on the site plan. We are required to bring that entire alley up to City of Tampa code regarding paving. Um, we were found consistent with the exception of you know, making those revisions between first and second reading. We've committed to that. The only thing I can't control is the width of the alley. I'm respectfully requesting your approval. Um, this is a compatible project. You even heard the neighbors say directly across the street is a triplex. It was built at a time when the West Tampa overlay <coughs> didn't require that kind of access. So the garages are in the front. Um, so anyway, we respectfully request your approval. Councilwoman Hurtag. Um, actually, I have a question for staff. <clears throat> what is the average front um, setback? Setback. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're all just helping each other I today. I was thinking the same. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Uh, what is the average setback on that block? Front setback. The average on the block. Yeah, isn't that generally how we go by average? Uh, not for the West Temp overlay for the. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so can you refresh my memory on the rules for the West Tampa overlay frontage? Oh, gosh. Um, I, uh, that's urban design. Uh, I would I would not know that it's, it's an averaging uh, system. It is an averaging. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. The block it's, it's an average of the entire block face, not... That's what I thought. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I would not know the calculation, though. So <laughs> when we went to Urban Design, they did the analysis and found that we were compatible and okay. consistent. No, I just wanted to ask. Thank you. And I would put that on the record just so you know. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? No? Any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Motion to close from Councilmember Vieira. Second from? Don't take all of them now. Some of these are mine. Second, second from Councilmember Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No, those are yours. Uh, Councilmember Miranda, would you like to read item 13? I'll read it. Item number 13, file number REZ 23-31. Orange being presented for first reading. Orange rezoning properties in the vicinity 2709 West North B Street in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section 1 from Zoning District Classification RM16 Residential Multifamily to PD Planning Town Residential Single Family Tent providing an effective date. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Councilmember Henderson. Roll call. Vieira? No. Miranda? Yes, I have to say yes because I read it. <laughs> Carlson? No. Hertek? No. Clindenden? No. Henderson? No. Maniscalco? No. Motion did not pass. Oh, okay. Um, motion did not pass with um, Miranda voting yes. Thank you. <coughs> Another motion is in order, please. Do we have a, uh, a follow-up motion? You gotta deny it. A motion to deny. Maybe. Go ahead, sir. How can I get my get my ducks in order? So I move deny resolution. What's that? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. That's what I was getting to. It's it's almost what two o'clock in the morning. So I move to deny REZ twenty three. 31, due to the failure of the applicant to meet its burden of proof to provide competent substantial evidence that the development as conditioned and shown on the site plan is consistent with the comprehensive plan and city code and the applicant's failure to meet its burden of proof with respect to the requested waivers. I also adopt the findings and reasonings of this uh, city staff transportation report. Um, there's failure to comply with applicable goals, objectives, and policies in the comprehensive plan. While the proposed rezoning may be allowed for consideration under the residential, um, what was this one? 
the zoning on this side. I got this one right. RM16, RM16 designation, and the Planning Commission uh, staff concluded that the proposed overall density is, cons is consistent with the development pattern anticipated under this land use category. I find that the proposed rezoning coupled with the requested waivers, including but not limited to a 50% reduction in drive aisle width and more than a 50% reduction in front yard setback, results in a pattern of development that is not compatible with the surrounding area. You said something else? Yeah. I said that the failure to comply with land development code uh, section 27136. The proposed development is shown on the site plan does not promote or encourage development that is appropriate in location, character, and compatibility with the surrounding single family residential uses. And the waivers uh, are, uh, are requested to fail, is our failure to comply with sections 27 139.4, such as the desire of or need for waivers, necessarily support the fact that the proposed development is not appropriate for the site and does not comply with the land use code. The applicant did not provide evidence that his proposed design is unique in order to justify the waivers. So. Move a second. Second. Second from Councilmember Vieira. Roll call. No, yeah, just uh, very quick. Um, if that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> This feels like a shoehorn. Um, it's not quite the 50 pounds of potatoes in a five pound bag, but um, it seems like a duplex uh, would allow what needs to happen to, to give that more movement. It just seems like just, just a bit too much on the lot, and that's why I'm uh, voting to deny, or yeah, voting in favor of denial. We have a motion from Councilmember Clendenin with the second from Councilmember Vieira. Roll call. Okay. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Hertak? Yes. Meniscalco? Yes. <coughs> motion to deny carried. Unanimous. Thank you, Council. Zane Hussein Development Coordination. Uh, agenda item number 14, case REZ 23-44. This is for the location 305 South Boulevard. Proposed rezoning from PD to PD Medical and Business Professional Office. I'll now pass it to our Planning Commission. Yes, yes, ma'am. All right, uh, Emily Phelan, Planning Commission yes. staff. We're uh, slap happy, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, the subject site is located within the Central Tampa Planning District in the Hyde Park, Spanish Town Creek neighborhood. The closest transit stop is located approximately 350 feet northeast along West Platte Street. Spanish Town Creek Park is the closest recreational facility located approximately 0.32 miles southeast of the subject site, and the site is located within evacuation zone B. The subject site is here outlined in purple and there are other uh, commercial uses along West Platte Street and it transitions to residential. This is the future land use map. The subject site's here. It's represented by the community mixed use 35 designation that you can see runs along West Platte Street and for and to the south and east and west of the subject site is the residential 35 designation. Planning Commission staff has determined that the proposed plan development is comparable and compatible with the surrounding development pattern. The existing square, uh, the existing building has an FAR of 0 0.47, which is consistent with the, in, the intensity anticipated under the CMU 35 designation. The comprehensive plan promotes development that is sensitive to the surrounding area by providing a buffer on the west towards the residential uses. The comprehensive plan also encourages the use of the alley to the west, which will continue to be utilized. 
The proposed plan development is consistent with several of the policies of the comprehensive plan as it relates to development and mixed use corridors. The building is oriented towards the South Boulevard as, and, pri and parking is provided under the building and to the rear of the building. The proposal is to retain the existing six foot sidewalk along South Boulevard meeting the intent of the mixed use corridor policies. And the, the proposed PD is comparable and compatible with the surrounding neighborhood and the request is consistent with the intensity and anticipated under the CMU 35 designation. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Mr. Zane. Zane Hussein, Development Coordination. I'll first go ahead and show the aerial view of the property. As you see, the property right here outlined in red. To the north, you'll have West Platte Street running east to south. I'm oh, sorry, east to west. Uh, you'll have South Edison Avenue to the west. Uh, this is along South Boulevard. Uh, and to the south, you'll have West Horatio Street. Uh, in the area, from the, to the north, south, and east are all office uses. And these are all zoned. R01, and to the west you'll have RM24, and that is residential uh, multifamily townhomes. I will now show the site plan provided by the applicant. All right, as you see. South Boulevard right here, the subject site. Who's calling it this time? <laughs> yeah. All right. The proposed, since 8 o'clock this morning. <laughs> the proposed PD uh, is to allow for business professional office and medical office uses on the site. The subject site is currently developed with a 2004 PD approval for a business professional office, and this zoning request would allow the addition for a medical office use. The site is located one lot south of southwest intersection of West Platte Street and South Boulevard. The site plan identifies a two-story structure, right here, two-story structure, uh, comprised of 3,995 square feet, which fronts South Boulevard to the east, the structure is oriented east to west on site with pedestrian entry to the building on the north side at ground level, as I'll show you in pictures to come. Uh, the building contains an open area on the ground level, as I'll show you in pictures to come, uh, and this is utilized for surface parking. There's additional parking uh, to the rear of the building, and the center drive aisle provides allowance for two-way vehicular travel for access from South Boulevard and the adjoining alley to the west. The existing structure will remain and no new construction is being proposed. The site is currently approved with a business professional office. Uh, adding a medical office is consistent to the surrounding area which contains a mixture of business professional office and medical uses in the surrounding area. Um, I will now show you the elevations provided by the applicant. The elevation to the east, west, north, and south. As I went out to the site, I took pictures. That looks like Dave Mechanics. Office. It does. Wow. Uh, one of the signs fronting the site. A doorway accessing to the building of the site. Oh boy.
on site, you have surface parking below the two-story structure. And you also have on the site uh, surface parking to the north. To the northeast, you'll have uh, Seneco Gas Station and also West Platte. And there is, um, let's see, there's an ice cream shop. I think there's a sushi shop. And a little bit farther north, there is um, University of Tampa. Sushi shop's closed. No. It's closed? It's closed. That, isn't that the place that just got the Michelin star? They moved. It's uh, Koya. They moved? Uh oh. I thought they moved. Oh. I don't know. I don't know. It's all papered up. I drive by it like 10 times a day. To the south of the site, you'll have residential and also office uses. To the east of the site, you'll have office uses. And to the south of the site, you'll have office uses. I'll provide the site plan one more time for you to see. Show the site plan. It's good. All right. Uh, the applicant is requesting two waivers uh, to request to reduce the required number of parking spaces from 24 spaces to 20, which is a 17% reduction, and also to reduce the required 8 foot VUA buffer uh, to 4 feet along the northwest property boundary. Development review and compliance staff has reviewed the petition and finds the request to be inconsistent with the applicable. City of Tampa development regulations. Please see transportation findings uh, regarding the parking waiver as to the reasoning. Now, all other departments are found to be consistent. Uh, there is no revision sheet, and site plan changes uh, or site plan changes. Um, and if you need to see the consistencies from all the other departments, page five of your staff report will show. I'm here for any questions if needed. Any questions? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Mr. Chairman, Council members. My name is David Mechanic. Um, 305 South Boulevard, Tampa, Florida. My office is, in fact, the subject of the rezoning application this morning. And I was sworn in, although that was yesterday at some point. But um, yes. with me is uh, Randy Cohen, a uh, transportation planner and uh, a consultant who does a number of parking demand studies. And I will ask him to speak in a moment about the, the parking waiver. As uh, Zane has mentioned, um, the report was, or our, I'm sorry, our application was found to be consistent with uh, by nine out of ten of the departments. In fact, there were favorable comments from development coordination, uh, historic preservation, <coughs> and the planning commission. And uh, to that end, I would also, uh, in the effort of brevity here, I would point out that the development coordination analysis of compliance with 27 136 is uh, we would endorse that analysis and not bother to repeat that. Uh, we do meet the criteria of Chapter 27 136. Uh, as indicated, the, the two waivers are really related to the same thing. Uh, because we are adding a medical office, which is now becoming a, a, a very common use in this particular neighborhood, the parking requirement goes up. We have surplus parking for professional business office, but not for medical office. But we, uh, and Mr. Cohen will speak to the fact that the emerging national standard for medical office requires five spaces per thousand, whereas the city code is six spaces per thousand. And he will uh, discuss how he determined the five per thousand. 
but we also, in order to uh, have the uh, parking provided at five per thousand, we are asking for a small reduction in the buffer along the alley, so as to our being able to add a, a parking space. So with that in mind, I will ask Mr. Cohen to uh, address council, and I have uh, Mr. Cohen's resume, which I will pass out. There are 10 copies here, city council and one for the clerk. I hate to say good morning, council, but good morning, council. I have been sworn. I'm sure I was sworn at some time yesterday. My name is Randy Cohen, 4121 West Cypress Street. I'm here to talk about Mr. Mechanic's office and the potential change to medical office at some time in the future. The issue here is parking. This is the front of the building. I think we're all familiar with it. This is the site plan, which I'll explain what's going on with that. Uh, Mr. Mechanic's office currently has 19 parking spaces. We need to have 20 spaces, so we have a parking ratio of just over five spaces per thousand square feet. We achieve that by reducing this one alley buffer by four feet, restriping this area so we create an additional parking space. That gives us five parking spaces for a parking ratio of slightly over five spaces per thousand square feet, which is actually what the industry standard is today for med medical office. Uh, and going over that, first thing we always do is determine what's going on in the literature, what's going on in the practice, what are best uses. Um, heard some talk about parking generation by ITE earlier tonight. We did use that source. Only one of the sources. Uh, they recommend 4.3 spaces per thousand square feet. Medical Office Journal, 4.5. Investor Management Services recommends 4.5. That's an entity that looks at people who invest in offices, assuring that they have adequate infrastructure to be a successful medical office. These particular ones here, MGMA, AAF, Medescape, those are publications that work with doctor's offices, assisting them in establishing what they need for a doctor's office, what they need for parking, space for patient, et cetera. We've had a good deal of change in medical use and practice over the last 10 years. The 10 years ago, no one had a telehealth visit. No one basically had doctors that had two and three offices. They typically had the one large office and everybody came there and waited all day. That's not the case today. It has changed in the industry. That has changed the parking. And to even point that out further, the city of Tampa actually came up with their parking code for medical office. They revised it about 20 years ago. They did it on a cohort study. This is actually the city of Tampa study that was done. Jonathan and Melanie were nice enough to provide me with a copy of it. As you can see, when they did that study, they came down to an average of 5.6 spaces per thousand square feet based upon 14 cohort communities that they looked at their parking standards. We updated it, and lo and behold, in 20 years, that ratio has gone down to 4.6. Well, city's practice is to get to a number and then to round it up, 5 zero spaces per thousand square feet medical. That would be the standard today if the city redid their traffic study or their parking study, I should say, for medical. Uh, last thing I will tell you is that I have also done a number of independent parking accumulation studies of which Jonathan has reviewed many of them over the years. They include medical. And in all of those cases where medical was involved, five, per, five spaces per thousand square feet was more than adequate for parking. So. That's our justification for the waiver, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? No, nope. thank you very much. Yes, sir? Uh, just to wrap up, I'll try to be as brief as possible. The, um, the parking analysis that Mr. Cohen presented uh, justifies the, the waiver, the request, and in fact, we're slightly more than what he actually calculated the medical office would be. And there will, of course, be no adverse impact to surrounding properties, being that we are supplying the demand for five spaces per thousand. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Motion to close. No, we need public comment. Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this item? 
Motion to close second. from Council Member Clendenin, second from Council Member Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, Council Member Vieira, would you mind reading this item? This is item 14. Move an ordinance being presented for first reading consideration ordinance rezoning property general vicinity of 305 South Boulevard, City of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section one for zoning district classification PD plan development, the PD plan development business professional medical office providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion from Council Member Vieira, second from Council Member uh, Miranda, roll call. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Hertek? Yes. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Menscaco? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on July 13th, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. located at the Old City Hall building at 315 East Kennedy Boulevard, Tampa, Florida, 33602. Organized July 15th, 18th. <laughs> Agenda item number 15. Case REZ 23-46. This is for the location 7702 South O'Brien Street. Proposed rezoning from IG to RS50. I'll now pass along to our planning commission. Our final case is located yes. within the South Tampa Planning District in the Port Tampa City neighborhood. The closest transit stop is located approximately a quarter mile north at South O'Brien Street and West Idaho Street. Uh, the community center is the closest recreational facility located three blocks southwest of the subject site and the site is located within evacuation zone A and the coastal high hazard area. Uh, the subject site is located here. The aerial is a, a little outdated. Some of these parcels have been developed as single family detached homes and that is the pattern in the area. Um, this is McDill Air Force Base. Now, this was heard as Tampa Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment 2302 to change the future land use from the light industrial to residential 10, which was approved on first reading and it does go to second reading, I think next month. Um, so this site would be represented by the residential 10 zoning, uh, residential 10 future land use category, which is in the area with pockets of light industrial. The request would allow for a single family detached residential unit at an overall density of 9.09 .09 units per acre. This portion of South O'Brien Street between West Tarpon Street and the northern boundary of McDill Air Force Base has an existing density of 8.75 units per acre or 79% of the density anticipated in this area. Planning Commission staff finds the request will promote infill development on a vacant parcel and will help ensure an adequate supply of housing for Tampa's growing population. Um, additionally, the request would allow for development similar in form, height, and scale to the surrounding residential uses on this portion of South O'Brien Stream. The proposed PD is comparable and compatible with the development pattern along this <coughs> portion of South O'Brien Street and is consistent with the long range development pattern encouraged under the residential 10 uh, future land use designation and that in concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? No? Zane? Yes, sir. I'll first show the aerial view of the property here. As you see the property right here outlined in red. <coughs> to the north, south, east, and west are residential single family detached uh, homes. The property is uh, a total of 5,000 square feet. The lot is 50 feet wide and 100 feet in depth. It's located on South O'Brien Street as you have right here running north and south. West Tarpon to the north. You have a uh, North Boundary Boulevard to the south. Also McDill to the south. Uh, McDill Air Force Base. Uh, to the west you'll have uh, South uh, Jermare Street and also to the east you'll have South uh, mm. Kissimmee Street. The lot is currently vacant at this time as I'll show you in pictures to come. Um, 
The rezoning is consistent with the existing development pattern of the neighborhood and surrounding area. And I will show you the elevate. I'm sorry. I'll show you the pictures as I took on the site. The site is currently vacant at this time. The public notice sign is before you. Another view of the site. To the west, you have residential single-family homes. To the north, you have residential single-family homes. And to the south, you have residential single-family homes. Development Review and Compliance staff has reviewed the application and finds the overall request to be consistent with the Land Development Code. I'm here for any questions. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Applicant? Good morning, council members. I'm happy to finally be here to speak with you guys. Uh, my name is Diana Ponte. I'm here representing my company, Ohio Real Estate Group, LLC. Uh, they are the, prop the owners of the subject property, 7702 South O'Brien Street. And I'm here today because our goal is to rezone this property from IG to RS50 so that we may have the capability of building a single family detached residential home there. Along with the rezoning, as previously stated, we have also applied for a change in the future land use from light industrial to residential 10. Um, and at al although this lot is located in a high coastal hazard area, um, you can notice that the lot is surrounded by other residential homes and this being a non-residential lot seems a little out of place. Uh, the plan is to build a two-story home with a living space of about 3,371 square feet and a total area, including garages, et cetera, of about 4,284 square feet, and that's out of the 5,000 that is a lot. Um, so our hope today is that we receive your approval. Thank you. Any questions? Anybody in the public have any comment? Yes, sir. Bob Whitmore, City Tree, let's do that more often. That's a heck of a project. 3,000 square feet and a little going from industrial to residential, that's what we need more of. You got the Bob Whitmore seal of approval. Motion to close. All right, do you have any rebuttal, any response? No. No, all right, motion to close from Council Member Clendenin, thank you, Council Member Vieira, all in favor? Aye. Aye, Council Member Henderson, would you like to read I on to 15? Foul, final, foul, number. REC 23-46 ordinance being presented for first reading consideration an ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 7702 South O'Brien Street in the city of Tampa, Florida and more particularly described in section 1 from zoning district classification IG industrial general to RS50 residential single family providing an effective date. We have a motion from Councilmember Henderson, second Councilmember Miranda, roll call. Carlson? Yes. Hertek? Yes. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on July 13th, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. in the Old City Hall building located at 315 East Kennedy Boulevard, Tampa, Florida, 33602. Thank you. Councilmember Miranda, do you have any uh, new business? Councilmember Vieira? No, I, I don't, but I do want to say, I mean, it's too, it just with uh, the CRA this morning, uh, that we have to make sure that next time we do this thing in August, that it's um, more tailored. And uh, cause we had 15 land use hearings tonight, and nobody served well by that, including the public, in my opinion. Thank you. <coughs> Second. Second. Yeah, third. Councilmember Henderson. Councilmember Clendenin. Yes, I do. I have uh, six motions, actually. Uh, I know. I, I, I apologize. The mo the four, five of them. Five of them are like housekeeping type of things, and one of them. Let me let me start with the exciting one first. I'm going to make a motion to ask staff to uh, report back to City Council on September 7th on proposals and options to tax surface parking lots located in the Central Business District, the Channelside District, and Ybor City. We have a motion from Councilmember Clendenin, second from Councilmember Vieira, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, next one. 
I request by the Planning Commission setting a transmittal hearing for TACPA 2301, TACPA 2310, TACPA 2311, and TACPA 2315 on August 31st, 2023 at 5.01 and direct the legal department to provide the city clerk with the form of notice for advertising the public hearings. Second. Motion from Council Member Clendenin, second from Council Member Miranda, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, yes sir. A request by the Planning Commission setting an adoption hearing for TACPA 2303 on August 31st, 2023 at 501 and direct the legal department to provide the city clerk with a form of the notice for advertising the public hearings. We have a motion from Council Member Clendenin, second from Council Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? A request by the Planning Commission setting an adoption hearing for TACPA 2307, TACPA 2308, TACPA 2309, TACPA 2312, TACPA 2313, TACPA 2314, and TACPA 2316 on September 28th, 2023 at 501 and direct the legal department to provide the city clerk with the form of notice for advertising in the, pub the public hearings. Motion from Council Member Clendenin, second from Council Member Moran, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? A request by the Planning Commission setting an adoption hearings for the City of Tampa tw FY24 uh, to <laughs> FY28 Capital Improvement Section CIS schedule of projects update on September 28th, 2023 at 5.01 p.m. and direct the legal department to provide the city clerk with a form of notice for advertising the public hearings. We have a motion from Council Member Clendenin, and second from Council Member Miranda, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? A request by the Planning Commission setting an adoption hearing for TACPA 2301, TACPA 2310, TACPA 2311, and TACPA 2315 on October 26, 2023 at 501 and direct the legal department to provide the city clerk with a form of notice for advertising the public hearings. We have a motion from Council Member Clendon and second from Council Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? She already stopped. Anything else? Yes, ma'am? Uh, I don't have anything. I'm keeping mine until next week. Can I just make one real fast? Um, there, there's another article today out about the Jackson House. We talked about it a little bit this morning. Many of you know I've been involved in it since 2012 or 2013. And um, we've got the money lined up. USF is involved. Tampa History Center is involved. The, the issue is um, getting being able to put up a ladder or anything we need to repair. I like I, 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 I made a similar motion to the CRA a few months ago, and it didn't go anywhere. But... Um, meaning that the staff didn't find a solution but i'd like to make a motion to have staff return on july 27th um, to discuss the possibility of um, the city buying the jackson house and thereafter filing eminent domain for the adjacent property we have second from council member carlson second from council member clendenin all in favor aye. Aye. aye any opposed the problem is we can't we can't file eminent domain without owning it all right, and I have a quick motion, sir. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to present a commendation to the Department of Code Enforcement for the dedication and hard work of their staff in protecting the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens. I would like to present this on June 15th at our regular session meeting. We only have one other commendation, which is this high school, Jefferson High School. So we have a motion uh, from motion Con to Councilman Maniscalco, second from now. Councilman Charlie Miranda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion passes. Motion, Councilmember Henderson, second from Councilmember Moran. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you. Oh my God. Everybody, everybody, everybody get home safely, please.